and welcome in. It is National Signing Day. The stars of tomorrow are putting pen to paper and making things official. We're glad to have you here. We got a ton to unpack. We had some news that actually just broke with a big time wide receiver flipping his commitment from Ohio State, taking his talents to Eugene. Jeremiah McClellan is, of course, committed to Oregon. Flipped happened just moments ago. Going to get to all that here in just a second to break it all down throughout the entirety of National Signing Day today. National Recruiting Analyst for us here at On3, Josh Newberg. Josh, let's just get right to it, man. Jeremiah mm -hmm. McClellan flips from Ohio State to Oregon. Not that often you see a big-time wide receiver of this caliber, a four-star guy is McClellan, taking his talents away from Columbus. Usually, the, Brian Hartline's mm -hmm. acquiring wide receiver talent on the like today. What a way to start signing day. We have a big flip. Jeremiah McClellan, he's he's ranked in the right outside the top 50. I believe he's the number 54 prospect overall. And there was rumors that he was going to flip, but it looked like Ohio State was going to hold on to him. But in the end, Justin Hopkins of Scoop Duck, he knew something, Just, or uh, JD. He put in a flip pick about 10 minutes before it went down, and then it happened. Now, Jeremiah... He's not the only Jeremiah that could flip. We're going to yep, talk to him. Yep. We're going to talk about it more. But Jeremiah Smith, the number one wide receiver in America, is also committed to Ohio State. And there's rumors he could be flipping as well. But the Buckeyes are going to try to hold on there. Yeah, kind of a, a deja vu feel to it from the last signing day. Because remember, we were sitting at this very desk right around a year ago, and Oregon just shot right up the recruit rankings on national signing Yeah, day. but Oregon probably hopes it works out a little bit differently with Jeremiah McClellan because last year it was Peyton Bowen that was the big flip, only for him to flip again to Oklahoma. So Mary, Mary flips. Now, this. there's flips and there's signings. Now, we fully expect Jeremiah McClellan to sign, but just saying, Oregon fans have been down this road before when you say deja vu. And just like that, the madness of signing day. In full effect, as we get started here in Nashville, Tennessee, again, keeping you in the know. For all things National Signing Day, we'll have a couple of signings going on throughout the course of the show. We'll let you know when some very important pen meets paper. Giving us a ton of intel throughout the course of the day, the National Director of Recruiting for us here at On3, also in studio, Chad Simmons. Chad, what went into this one? Because this was one that obviously a flip on signing day. What, what, did you have any gauge for this from McClellan ended up picking the Ducks over the Buckeyes? Yeah, uh, they've always been involved, J.D. I mean, he had a great relationship with Dan Lanning, Junior Adams, the staff in Eugene. And when I talked to Jeremiah throughout the process, I mean, he always mentioned it wasn't just one guy. It wasn't two guys. The entire staff at Oregon recruited him. And I think the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle, obviously, Oregon got over at the end was distance. I think the big thing, them going to the Big Ten, not playing in the Pac-12, allows them to come closer to home to play schools mm. in the Midwest where he's from in St. Louis. I know that was a big factor for him. I think from the get-go, he had the best connection, not just him, but his family with the staff, with Lanning, Junior Adams, that, that offensive staff at Oregon. Um, they just kept chipping away and in the end got it done. Yeah, I mean, Jeremiah McClellan, getting things started at National Sign Day. I thought it was going to be a thing, Chad, where we could kind of ease into the show, kind of set the table. <laughs> okay, got a couple signings, and then wouldn't you know it, like a minute before we hit the air, Jeremiah McClellan makes this big flip from Ohio State to Oregon. Sounds like distance was a factor there. So with that sort of setting the table for today, mm -hmm. uh, not the only news that happened here this morning. Dylan Riola, the flip happened earlier in the week, but he officially put pen to paper this morning. He's heading to Nebraska, Josh, and that was obviously a massive flip. Any, anytime you land a five-star quarterback, and much less at a spot like Nebraska. Right. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. absolutely huge for Matt Rule. He gets this guy. I mean, we said this all spring when, unfortunately, they didn't land, and we thought it was a heartbreaker. But they come back around after he commits to Georgia in May. They lay low until a week ago. A week ago, this starts to leak out that, that Dylan Riola and Nebraska are an item once again. He takes that official visit over the weekend. And at that point, it was pretty much written that a flip was going to happen. He waited till Monday to drop that poem. And boy, that was a great poem. But Dylan Riola is signed, sealed, and delivered this morning to Nebraska. Yeah, brought the bars with him with that commitment. Uh I know Nebraska fans were, were uh, happy to see Inc. finally meet paper with that one as they got mm. their quarterback for the future of the Matt Rule era. Now, there was another big flip that went down on Monday as well, and that was Xavier Filsimi. He is the number two ranked safety in America out of the state of Texas, but he was committed to the Florida Gators for about eight months. Well, he flipped his commitment on Monday, coming off an official visit to Texas as well, and that was a, a pretty big stunner about 48 hours from signing day. Yeah, massive flips happening as we get closer and closer to pen meeting paper for a lot of these guys. Dylan Raiola, of course, has already signed. 
Chad, with Dylan Raiola making that flip so close to the actual day of signing day, was that something that we saw coming for a while and it just kind of, you know, f finally popped right before the day? Or was it something that sort of came out of nowhere and happened really quick, fast, in a hurry? You know, maybe talking in recruiting terms or, you know, a mile meaning maybe a week. You know, we, things happen so quickly, very fluid in recruiting. You know, obviously uh, a week's a long time in recruiting. So uh, I, I think we saw this happening – you know, really about a week and a half or so ago thing, I started getting, you know, little heads up that, hey, there are some conversations going on between Rayola, maybe some guys on the Nebraska team, maybe some Nebraska commits. There's still some communication there, maybe a little hesitation in his mind late in the process. He knew at that time he only had one weekend left. If he wanted to take that OV to Lincoln, it had to be that weekend uh, this past weekend. He did so. By the time he took that trip, we had a pretty good idea. We we're just going to wait on the time for him to make that flip to Nebraska. Obviously, he came out of that visit committed to Georgia, but still, based on the intel, we thought it was only a matter of time before he flipped to Nebraska, which he did. A huge get for Matt Rule, Satterfield, that staff at Lincoln. Uh, they can build around Dylan in the years to come. Yeah, setting the tone, getting things rolling there under their first into their, I mean, their first real class when it comes to what Matt Rule's done, having a full season now under his belt in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Josh, just the, the massive impact that is National Signing Day. We have the on three industry team recruiting rankings that you would expect there'll be some movement across that top 25. Uh, let's take a quick look at where the top 10 stand after Jeremiah McClellan making that flip from Ohio State to Oregon. You got Georgia staying uh, holding well, strong. This one, at one is there. not updated. Hold on, we got to get an updated one up here because well, Ohio go. State has slid to the four spot. There we go. At okay. This point. So that was a big change. We saw our we saw four, Ohio State slide from two to four just now with the departure of Jeremiah McClellan to Oregon. Oregon sitting steady in the six spot as we speak. A lot of moves happened today. I promise you that top ten. Take a good look at it. But don't worry about remembering it. Yeah, I was going to say, we're probably going to go through closely. about 10 or 12 editions or versions of this industry ranking top 10 before the show's over. And right now, we got Ohio State at four, followed by Florida. Then you got Oregon at six with the big flip. Mm. Auburn rounding out the top 10 at number 10. So it's there we go. We got some movement happening already, JD. A lot of movement. And it won't just be the top 10. Even that that 15 to 25 range, you'd expect even somewhere you know outside that top 10, that fringe 11 to 15 range, there will be moves throughout the course of the day. And I'll tell you what, man, the eyes of the college football recruiting world have got to be squarely locked on what's going on at Buford in Georgia. You got K.J. Bolden buzz around oh. him maybe going somewhere else outside of where he's committed right now to Florida State. Edrick Houston, some buzz around Alabama and Ohio State. Uh, where do things stand right now for both those cats? Obviously both committed, but what's your feel on what's going on right now at Buford? Buford is buzzing right now, and it's in mainly around K.J. and Edrick. And right now, K.J. Bolden, me and uh, Chad Simmons were talking about this yesterday off air. It seems like deja vu all over again. When K.J. went to go make this decision in August, it was Auburn, Florida State, and Georgia. And the thought was, it's not going to be Florida State. It's going to be it's going to be Georgia or it's going to be Auburn. In the end, it was Florida State. Here we are on signing day once again, and the experts feel that K.J. Bolden is going to flip. And now I'll be honest with you. The, the word is out there. K.J. Bolden, even though he took that official visit to Florida State over the weekend, absolutely nothing is solidified in his recruitment because this is very much still up in the air. Let's go to Chad Simmons. Chad, a little K.J. Bolden talk here he's set to make his decision with the Buford boys at noon at one o'clock Eastern what's the latest Intel on KJ Bolden you know I think over the last 24 hours even last 12 or so hours communication still has been ongoing with Auburn Florida State and Georgia based on what I'm hearing no door out of those three schools have been completely <clears throat> closed I think this will be one that comes down to when he puts that pen to the paper. But going off just based on what I'm hearing, the intel, the sources, the buzz is around Georgia. I think this time last night, maybe it was Auburn and Georgia, I think overnight into this morning early, shifted more towards the in-state school, having a chance to hang on. But obviously he's committed to Florida State. You can't rule out Mike Norvell and that staff hanging on and keeping him a Seminole. But right now, the one school with the most buzz around it is the University of Georgia. Yeah, I saw Jeffrey Lee of Auburn Live put in a new prediction this morning. He's an Auburn insider, and he's predicting a flip to Georgia for K.J. Bolden. Also, let's not leave Buford High School yet. Let's not leave Chad Simmons just yet. 
Edric Houston, yesterday, it was a lot of back and forth. What are you hearing as of this morning with his commitment to Ohio State? You know, as we speak right now live, Josh, I think right now Alabama is in a, a good position to flip Houston from Ohio State. I think if you had asked me around this time yesterday, which maybe you did when I, you and I talked, Josh, yesterday, 24 hours ago, I, I was leaning more towards him staying with the Buckeyes and going with Ohio State today. But talking to people close to this and close to Edrick and close to Buford, um, I like where Alabama's at. Both schools continue to talk to him throughout Tuesday night and into Wednesday morning. Based on what I'm told, he woke up this morning with a clear mind, a good decision, and I think Bama's in a great spot. So there's just big flip vibes going on right now at Buford High School. So you think that there's a good chance that when both of the Buford boys sit down to sign, they end up signing with somebody that they're not committed to right now? Yeah, let's make sure we say as of right now because yeah, things change super quick uh, on the recruiting trail. But, yes, right now, Josh, if I had to say, do I think K.J. Bolden stays with Florida State? No. Do I think mm. Edric Houston stays with Ohio State? No. That's as of right now. We'll see what happens in a couple hours. Amazing. And two quick shout-outs here. We know this, Josh, in recruiting. The last Hayes Fawcett graphic standing – that's what sticks. The one that you get on National Sign Day, that's the Hayes Fawcett graphic you want to have. So one, follow Hayes Fawcett on Twitter. Also, follow Chad Simmons on Twitter. We're lucky enough to have him on the show, giving you intel in real time. We understand it's a long show. So if you got to, you know, get into a work meeting, turn on the notifications for both those individuals. We'll make sure to keep you as dialed in as possible for all things National Signing Day. Now, we talked about Ohio State a little bit there with Edric Houston. Jeremiah Smith, the number one player in the country, five-star plus wide receiver, a lot of buzz all cycle long, really, of schools trying to flip him with him being in the state of Florida and Florida State's in the mix and a lot of other schools. I mean, obviously, uh, after his, uh, his talents, he's committed to the Buckeyes. Chad, where do things stand right now with Jeremiah Smith as we are waiting to get his signature for wherever he's going to play ball next? Yeah, you mentioned, J.D., a lot of buzz around Jeremiah Smith and Ohio State. You know, the scary thing is, I guess, it's been kind of quiet around Jeremiah Smith mm -hmm. for me in my world the last couple of days. You know, is that a good sign? for Ohio State or a bad sign. You know, obviously I know I've confirmed that there's been some type of communication, uh, whether it's directly with Jeremiah or with people in this camp, you know, with Florida, Florida State, Miami, still working to flip him late. But right now, based on what I've heard and the intel putting pieces together, everything points towards five-star plus wide receiver Jeremiah Smith sticking with his commitment to Ohio State. Mm. All right, That'd there's one more five-star flip I want to ask you about, and that is five-star defensive lineman Armando Blunt committed to FSU, but he took a visit to Miami over the weekend, his last visit. Armando Blunt, I don't think he's expected to make his signing until 6 p.m. this evening. What are you hearing on Armando Blunt and his status with the Seminoles? Yes, yeah, since we broke the news, he was taking that OV to Miami late last week. The buzz has been heavy around the Miami Hurricanes. I mean, he's had consistent, you know, communication there with not just the head coach, but the staff up and down on the field staff, off the field staff members. I think he just feels comfortable around the people at the University of Miami. Obviously, it's a program in his backyard from Miami Central. Uh, you know, committed to him once, then flipped to Florida State, reclassified. I think when all said and done today, he flips back to the Miami Hurricanes and signs those papers with Mario Cristobal. Wow, that would be a huge flip. That would be the second five-star defensive lineman flip in the last six weeks for the Hurricanes. Justin Scott flipped from Ohio State to Miami about five weeks ago now, and that Canes defensive line class is really coming together if they can also land Blunt. Yeah, a lot to unpack here. Auburn also hot on the trail for a number of flip targets today. I mean, LJ McCray, it sounds like he's not signing today, but I promise you that will not stop Auburn from trying to flip more individuals as we get further and further on throughout the day. Uh, like I said, that top 10, that top 25, is going to change quite a bit, but let's kind of take a look at where we stand right now and just sort of get a gauge for the lay of the land. So looking at this top 10 right here, where do you expect the most movement when it comes to these 10? You got Georgia at one. Bama still has a path to be number one. Florida State's at three. Ohio State just dropped down to four. Auburn at 10, but we talked about their potential to flip some teams. Josh, who within this top 10 has the most on the board that you're watching the closest? Well, you got to think, is if Alabama has a shot at the number one spot, 
Edric Houston's a must. They got to find another, you know, whether it be Jaden Ball or Kevin Riley, they got to find some juice from another flip. Florida State, I mean, I know they're sitting there at three right now, but they got that KJ Bolden commitment looming and also Armando Blunt. So if they were to lose two five stars and not flip Jeremiah Smith from Ohio State, I could see Florida State slipping almost out of the top 10 by the end of the day. Ohio State hanging on to dear life in that four spot. Hopefully they can sign Jeremiah Smith and, uh, and and solidify things a little bit in Florida as well. You know, the Gators, they have had some recent decommitments and they are hoping to sign DJ Lagway today and remain in that five spot. Oregon moving up to six, seven, Miami. They are on the march, as is Texas, both with big flips leading up to today. Oklahoma at nine. And then you've got Auburn hanging in there at number 10 with a lot of big dogs just outside the top 10 trying to fit in. You see right there, Notre Dame, LSU, Tennessee, Texas A&M, I think they all have a chance to battle for a spot in the top 10 before it's all said and done. Texas A&M is really slid. I mean, just about five or six weeks ago with the firing of Jimbo Fisher, they were at the five or six spot. They are currently at 14. Michigan moves up nicely into 16. Then you got South Carolina at 20. Nebraska up to 21 with the flip of Dylan Riola. And Kentucky sitting there rounding out your top 25. Very, very important now. There's a lot of those... You know, l logos and numbers next to them. That number at the very bottom, we can pull that up one more time. There's a number at the bottom there, updated at 10 a.m. Central. Yeah, Keep attention. an eye on that now, because that is going to change throughout the course of this show, and I promise you that will be our landmark as we move on throughout the rest of National Signing Day. Josh, you mentioned it, but I want to go back to that. Outside of the top 10 right now, mm -hmm. still some meat on the bone, still a lot of these guys that are, that are yet to put their signature down. Who are you looking at most closely that could jump into that top 10 and kind of be last year's Oregon? Well, it, you know, some of these teams might fall out. I mean, I'm looking at Tennessee. Look, if they can pull something massive, I'm not trying to start anything, but let's say a flip of uh, Jordan Seaton. You know, there's going to be some unexpected things that go on. I'm just saying keep an eye on LSU. Keep an eye on Tennessee. There's still some firepower out left on the board for them. Uh, Notre Dame obviously would like to finish with the top 10 class. I'm not sure. They've kind of been sliding. They've been up as high as number seven. Seven recently they're currently at number 11 but I wouldn't count them out either well today is a massive day when it comes to you know trying to gauge where these guys are eventually going to sign especially guys that are uncommitted and a great tool to try and gauge that is the recruiting prediction machine for us here at on three Josh why don't you tell the people at home a little bit how to utilize that tool when trying to guess where these guys are going to be headed. Yeah, I love it as an indicator. Look, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it takes into account machine learning, expert prediction, social sentiment, visits, but more importantly, it's those expert predictions that I look for. I want to see where is Chad Simmons predicting him to go. Hey, where is where am I predicting him to go? JD, I went 19 for 20 on my crystal ball Ooh. picks this cycle. So, you know, pay attention also to the experts. But I think the RPM, the recruiting prediction machine, is a huge asset for on three. And it's one of the tools that I go to all the time. One of those things that where there's smoke, there's fire, and you can best tell where the smoke is by using the RPM. Now a lot of people watching that RPM very closely and looking at that little graphic in the middle between two logos that is saying, hey, this, this guy might be flipping. He might be might on flip be. watch. Uh, some guys that already flipped that we talked about. Let's take a look at some of these decommitments that shaped Oof. the class of 2024. Just off the top, Josh, one of the most impactful ones, Justin Scott from Miami to Ohio State. That was a massive get. Or, not, excuse me, from uh, Ohio State to Miami. I spoke out of turn there. I would Going say from the Buckeyes it to the was Gables. one of the most important flips of the cycle. I think Miami, who was looking to put together a dominant defensive line class, at the time that Justin Scott flipped, it looked like they missed on six, seven, eight defensive linemen that are all elite. And then it starts to shift. You saw the Justin Scott. Now we're talking Armando Blunt, another five-star defensive line. They landed Marquise Lightfoot. He's more of an edge, but he's on that defensive line. They have a really outstanding class, and it really started with the flip of Justin Scott. It kind of rounded it out. I mean, Miami had a good D-line class before Justin Scott jumped in, but it's the difference of moving it from good to elite, and that Miami defensive line class is now elite. Chad, as a man who is never surprised when it comes to the recruiting landscape nationally, which one of these flips came as maybe the most out of left field for you when it comes to this, you know, 2024 class? You know, I'd probably say 
Justin Scott, you know, after, you know, once he was kind of locked in quietly with Ohio State, I remember he committed on my wife's birthday, July 2nd, we're out there on a date, and I get the, the heads up, hey, break the news, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, wife, time out, I mean, hit a few buttons here on my phone, but I think, I think Justin, I thought once he was settled in with Ohio State, he loved Larry Johnson, all about that D-line development, his resume, uh, the way he broke down his commitment to Ohio State, to me, how deep it was, and the connection with Johnson, and being the Midwest, he's from Chicago, Chicago. Um, I thought a little bit when I got the heads up that, hey, this is going to be a flip to Miami, which at the time he told me about Ohio State, I actually thought Miami was the favorite. So <laughs> when I, when he locked in with Ohio State and then flipped to Miami, uh, that definitely kind of caught me by surprise because he hadn't been talking a whole lot to Miami leading up to that flip to the Hurricanes. Uh, that picked up pretty quickly. <laughs> A lot of buzz. A lot of buzz when it comes to the recruiting trail. That's very kind of Justin Scott to wait till your anniversary just to make sure that it was a special day for the both of y'all when he made his commitment to the Hurricanes. Uh, Peyton Woodyard from Southern California, St. John Bosco, flipping from Georgia to Bama during this cycle. I mean, that, that was a massive flip. And one from, uh, from, you know, the former employee of Nick Saban from Kirby Smart back to Coach Saban. I mean, that was one that to me was, I don't know if surprising is the right word, but anytime you see a, a guy flip from Georgia to Bama, kind of makes you think just a little bit like, okay, hey, what's, what's going on there? What's that conversation like after the fact between Nick Saban and Kirby Smart in the text messages? And he's from California, so it tells me one thing. Peyton Woodyard really wanted to play football in the South. Yeah. That is one thing that he was going to do. He made sure he was going to play football in the South, but that's a huge flip. Anytime you go from Georgia to Alabama or Alabama to Georgia, those are always monster newsmakers. How about Elijah Rushing, too? Yeah. Defensive lineman from Arizona. Commits to Arizona originally, flips to the Ducks. I'm sensing a theme here with Dan Lanning and company. Yeah, they, Dan they, Lanning. Pretty he, lead at the flip. He did an unbelievable job because Elijah Rushing's brother plays for Arizona. So this was, he's not just a legacy recruit, but his brother is on the current roster at Arizona. I don't think it was very easy for Elijah Rushing to do that. We had him, we interviewed him after his decommitment from Arizona. I know that was tough on him, but Dan Lanning never wavered. He was on him from the jump. And that's what SEC style recruiters do. I know we've mentioned this with Oregon before, but Dan Lanning brings that SEC mentality mm. all the way out west to Eugene. He's not given up on five star well elijah rushing was a five star at the time he's a four star now he's not giving up on guys he wants he's going to circle back you saw that today with elijah Mc oh, jeremiah mcclellan and they might not be done yet but dan lanning is recruiting like an sec caliber program absolutely recruiting like an sec caliber program and they're going to join the big 10 here very very soon actually the next time they play football in the regular season it'll be in the big 10 yeah. conference so good thing they got their recruiting shoes on chad when you, when you talk to so many of these kids what goes into the flips that happen for them? Because it's one of those things where you can commit somewhere, but you have to imagine the phone, the phone doesn't stop ringing just because you put out the Hayes Fawcett graphic and said, I'm going one place. Uh, what, what are those conversations like with those guys when they're considering making a flip? You know, I think they all know that nothing's final until today, until the pen puts, uh, you know, hits the paper, and I think until signing day. Obviously, verbals, I think a lot of guys look at it, hey, that's my favorite school right now. Hmm. Um, they know they're not locked in. It's a two-way street. Coaches leave all the time. They change jobs. They come here, go there. I think, I think kids obviously feel good about that decision at the time. They feel they're in a good spot with that commitment. They like their relationships. They like the location, the academics. Of course, NIL is a factor now as well. But I think when it comes down to the flips, they have more time to sit back and kind of rethink things. Who – who stayed with me? How was the school recruiting me uh, after I committed to them? Where's my relationships at? Did this coaching change happen? Could one happen after I signed? I think a lot of things factor in to when these guys make that flip decision, whether it's early or coming today on signing day. Josh, we got a commitment coming here in the next 30 minutes. Say commitment. A signing. We got a signing. We a got, signing. We've had a commitment for a while now, but we have an official, like you said, Chad, nothing final till pen meets paper. Penn is set to meet paper here for the number one player in America, Jeremiah Smith. Josh, we got a lot of schools in the hunt right now for yeah. Jeremiah Smith, and, and deservedly so with his talents. Yeah. Give me just the overall lay of the land for him right now. Yeah, the breakdown is he's from Shamada Madonna Prep down in South Florida. He's been committed to Ohio State for almost a year, just over a year at this point. And 
the in-state Florida schools aren't giving up. Georgia was involved at one point, but they've kind of faded. But the in-state Florida schools are trying desperately to keep the number one player in the state of Florida. That's Miami, that's Florida, that's Florida State. Now, the last visit he took was to FSU. That was two weeks ago. He decided to sit home the final weekend, talk it over with pops and family, and then make a decision on National Signing Day. And we're coming down to it. It's about a half hour out, and right now, it's buzzing. Josh, with one of those things where like this commitment has stuck for so long, I think back to even the summer and the springtime where he came to Nashville for the On3 NIL Elite Series, and he's got the Ohio State backpack, and he's got another bag that has the Georgia logo on it. Like Georgia was pushing hard from at one point too, but the fact that Ohio State has stuck to this point in the process, should Ohio State feel more confident that they've stood the test of time and they're on the one yard line here? Or is it one of those things where it's like, all right, hang on for dear life. You got to fend off the in-state Sharks. I mean, I thought heading into today that Ohio State was going to sign both their Jeremiah wide receivers, mm-hmm. Jeremiah McClellan and Jeremiah Smith. Jeremiah McClellan has already flipped. Now, Jeremiah Smith is on the clock. We're about a half hour out. And, you know, hey, it seemed like Florida State was the most likely landing destination. But right now, I don't think I would count out any of the Florida schools as we're just about 30 minutes away from this thing. A lot to unpack there. Obviously, we will keep you in the know up to the very minute. As soon as we get just in in a drop of ink from Jeremiah Smith's pen onto that paper. We'll be talking about it and giving you the latest for where he ends up signing. Uh, let's take a look at some other schools, though, Josh. We, we talked about Miami being great yeah. in the flip department. How about Auburn? How I about mean, Auburn? They have had a tremendous inventory of spatulas for the entirety of this recruiting cycle. Uh, let's take a look at them right now. Why is Hugh Freeze able to flip as many guys as he's been able to to this point in the cycle? Okay, look at this graphic. This isn't just their top flips. This is literally a cross-section of their commit. This is the top four commits on their list. These are the highest-ranked commits on their list. All of them were flips. Cam Coleman from A&M, Perry Thompson from Bama, Demarcus Riddick from Georgia, Jamonte Waller from Florida. They're not flipping guys from Kentucky and Northwestern. I mean, these are major flips in a season where, hey, Auburn really wasn't all that good on the field, but it seems like Hugh Freeze has this program in his first cycle heading in the right right direction. And Chad, you're there on the ground. Oh, no Chad yet. Okay, so what we're going to see today, though, is potentially more flips. Now, Auburn, Hugh Freeze is just getting busy. We've seen it. LJ McCray still on the board. KJ Bolden still on the board. Uh, Amaris Williams, another defensive lineman. He's committed to Florida. He's out of the state of North Carolina, and he could be a potential flip. Hugh Freeze just isn't done. He is causing chaos. I don't think of all the coaches in the SEC, I don't think Hugh Freeze was the one. Well, maybe he was. Maybe all along it was going to be Hugh Freeze that creates all the chaos and drama. But so far, Hugh has it going on, and he has some other coaches really nervous right now. It's one of those things, too, Josh, where, like, just like you said, there's there's still some more targets for them on the board. But you look at Auburn, currently a top-10 class in the 2024 cycle, and they only have 19 commits. That's tied for the least amount of commitments in that top 10 what does that say about their direction and maybe what they have planned for signing day i mean more than anything yes there is room for a couple more flips more than anything jd it tells me they're going to attack the portal Mm. because i think there are recruits out there that if they wanted them they could land them but instead they're after a select few most of them flip targets and i wanted to ask chad real quick chad what is on the ground you talk to these recruits what's the buzz what's the intrigue right now when it comes to the auburn tigers you know, a new energy. I'll say that's probably been the biggest thing from Brian Harson to Hugh Freeze coming in, just the way he recruits, the way his staff, uh, the, the energy, the vibe, the culture, the family. I think people have really just bought into what Hugh Freeze is doing, what he's building. I know about he has success at Ole Miss, at Liberty, and kind of what he's done from draft picks to he's selling guys like, you know, Perry Thompson, Cam Coleman to, you know, A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf. I mean, he's trying – you mentioned guys trying to flip like L.J. McRae, Amaris Williams. Don't forget about Ryan Williams, who just reclassified, a five-star yeah. plus wide receiver <laughs> from Saraland, longtime Alabama commit. He won't sign until February 9th, his birthday, 
after the next signing day, giving Auburn plenty of time to get him back on campus. He's an Auburn legacy. His father played there as well. So uh, a lot of, I think, some worried Bama fans about Ryan Williams, you know, reclassifying. But uh, I think the biggest thing that I've heard different from these kids is just the energy level that that staff has all the time when they're around them, whether it be game day, junior day, camp setting, whatever it may be. Uh, Hugh Freeze is pushing the right buttons on the planes. And Chad, you were outside, I think, getting a little bit of the, the intel via the, the Chad Simmons bat phone as we were uh, moving on throughout signing day. But Josh said something that I 100% agree with and want to get your thoughts on here. They're not just flipping these guys from like FCS schools. Right. I mean, they're not just you know coming out of the woodwork and, and landing a guy that nobody knows about. They're flipping these schools from schools like Alabama, from schools like Georgia. You mentioned the energy with Hugh Freeze and this staff. Like, is that the messaging? Like, hey, we're on the come up here, come be a part of something on the ground floor and get it back to where it wants to be? I mean, because I have to imagine flipping a guy away from a Kirby Smart and Nick Saban uh, has to be a very, very tall task, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good example of, you know, come play right away, make a difference, bring Auburn back. You know, I think he's preaching that. Hey, you can be a piece of the foundation to put Auburn back on the map in the SEC and the national picture. You talk about flipping a guy like from Kirby Smarter, Nick Saban. I mean, that's Demarcus Riddick, you know, an elite linebacker yep. uh, from right there in central Alabama. When he was committed to Georgia, the team with the most buzz around it was Alabama. But Bama's built a lot like Georgia right now, where you have to fight for your position. You have to, not saying Auburn's any different, but he definitely sees, you know, a, a path to playing time right away and being that leader early on the playing field. I think that's a big thing that he's pushing is, hey, come be a difference maker right away. Don't go sit and wait. Be that guy right now for Auburn. Help be a big piece of us bringing Auburn back today, not two or three years from now at Alabama or Georgia. Yeah, and I know a lot of people are going to sit here and say, well, Auburn had the season that they had. How can they recruit this way? You can recruit this way in year one without winning. You get the hope. You get the excitement. Everybody wants to come. You got Hugh Freeze is clearing out the depth charts. There's plenty of playing time. Well, they're going to bring in a really elite class this year. Next year, though, they're going to have to win some ball games to recruit at this level because the depth charts are going to be a little bit more clogged up. The, there's not as much playing time. Hugh already got his guys in in that first class. So I think that Auburn, in order for them to sustain this, and I, and I still think that they're going to recruit really well, but they're going to have to start winning some ball games on the field next year. Well, Josh, I think to, that point is, is a great one with it being, yeah, all right, Chad. Hey, this, is what, this is what we're here for now. This is the luxury of having Chad Simmons in studio. Chad, through the hand up we got some intel what's going on no just a couple quick things you mentioned I was out there on the bat phone as you say JD about checking a few things so one thing I reported this morning was Jonathan Daniels FSU yeah. commit likely not going to sign today I've gotten word he does now plan to sign with Florida State today so obviously some big you know communication there with the Florida State staff this morning also Ryan Wingo there's been buzz there about Missouri maybe Nebraska uh, trying to get him to hold off, not sign, give him time uh, to flip. Based on what I was just told, he's likely to sign with Texas today. So, Chad, when we, these aren't the only guys we're hearing it with. There's rumors that it could be Jordan Seaton. When guys are deciding to, hey, maybe I'm going to sign on Friday, maybe I'm going to sign today, is it the coaching staffs that's convincing them to put pen to paper? Like, did Jonathan Daniels – hear from Alex Atkins, FSU's offensive line coach, in order for this to happen? Or is it a family decision? What's going on behind the scenes with some of this? Yeah, I think it's both ways, Josh. I think they both talk to each other. I think, obviously, I think it starts at home. For somebody like Jonathan Daniels, I know he has some conversations. And one thing he was thinking about was, and it wasn't anything against Florida State. Yes, there was some Kentucky chatter there. Uh, they got an OV from Jonathan back in the summer. Uh, but the real thing with Jonathan was his teammates are likely going to wait and sign in February. Maybe not quite high as profile as he is signing with Florida State. Their offers will come later in January. They'll sign the mm -hmm. February signing day. He was thinking about being a part of that celebration with his team, more so than looking around and exploring his options. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a two-way street. But you know when that gets out that Alex Atkins, Mike Norvell, or somebody on that FSU staff is calling him saying, hey, man, come on, let's go ahead and get it done today. Let's lock you in. Don't give Kentucky or anybody right. else any more time to get in your head about changing your mind. So I, mm. I do think it's a two-way street there, Josh. Chad, yeah. you mentioned Ryan Wingo, big-time wide receiver out of the state of Missouri. You said Mizzou is kind of pushing there towards the end, and also Nebraska. Is that the Riola effect? I mean, I'd have to assume. 
probably using all they can, Nebraska is right now, to, to build on that Rayola momentum. They sent a lot of offers out yesterday. I think when Rayola came back from Nebraska, I think Nebraska offered about 50 kids at Buford High School that day. I mean, they're going to try to build off that name Absolutely. and what Rayola is about. He's a national recruit. He, he's a well-known young man. Uh, he's a guy they want to build their program around. So any advantage they can use with getting Rayola in this class, they're going to try to get, take advantage of. Yeah, we appreciate you staying uh, as doubted as possible. So anytime we, th we throw to Chad, it's an empty chair over there. He's getting the intel to bring back to this show, all right? So yeah, Josh, I, I already missed him once. For you. I, went, I went to throw it to Chad, and he was outside on the bat phone. So it's just something we got to monitor here as well. There we go, man. The luxury of having the man, the myth, the legend, Chad Simmons in studio. Again, y'all, make sure you do two things. Follow Chad Simmons on Twitter. Subscribe to the On3 Recruits channel. Third thing, make sure you follow Hayes Fawcett on Twitter as well. They'll keep you in the know for all things National Signing Day. On a day like today, Josh, can't afford to be caught slipping. Can, can't, can't afford to not be on your P's and Q's. So we just talked a lot about Auburn. Uh, you know, let's take a look at some of the other flips that we're watching here today. We mentioned Ryan Wingo and, and the, maybe not flip watch so much, but just the push to maybe delay the signing. Well, uh, Kevin Riley. One's already off the board. That Jeremiah McClellan has already happened, flipping from Ohio State to Oregon. Then we're going to keep an eye on Kevin Riley. Now he's from Tuscaloosa, and Alabama is... Well, they're coming after him really hard right now, and there's all they, they don't have any running back commitment. So, Chad, when it comes to Kevin Riley committed to Miami, we see Miami out here doing all this damage on the recruiting trail, flipping guys, but do they need to be on the defensive when it comes to Alabama and Kevin Riley? Yeah, to start with Miami, Josh, man, they've already been on the offense of flipping Jordan Lau yeah. this week from Ohio State. So they've, they've obviously gotten that one running back. Now, right now on paper, they have two. They're trying to hold on to that second guy in Kevin Riley. But, you know, this time a week ago, Riley was really kind of torn between taking that OV to Alabama last weekend or just locking it down, staying with the Miami Hurricanes. Whatever Bama did, they convinced him to take that OV and I think it looks like it could pay off today for the Crimson Tide. Like you said, Josh, they are in big need of a running back or running backs in this class. They don't have one yet. They like to land two before all is said and done. Uh, and I think Raleigh may, could, may give them some good news today. They did a good job over the weekend with Robert Gillespie, Nick yeah. Saban, uh, Tommy Reese as well, kind of showing him the plan and trying to say, hey, you could be that Jameer Gibbs type guy if you come here, uh, versatile running back. And I think he really took it home and uh, talked with his family. And right now it's been trending towards Alabama in the last few days. Hmm. So you said Alabama wants to sign two running backs. Would the other one potentially be Jaden Ball? He decommitted from Arkansas in the last 48 hours but what's the competition for him and is that could that be Alabama's second back in this class yeah it definitely could I think you're watching obviously Jaden Ball and then longtime Alabama you know recruit Daniel Hill from Meridian Mississippi yeah. he at one time was thought to be you know maybe a lock in this class a couple of months ago and uh, people thought he would commit way before now he's not going to announce until January 6th but he will sign today or this week with a school uh, but going back to Jaden Ball, just recently decommitted from Arkansas. We know Arkansas is out of the mix. He'll go to either Florida or Alabama. Uh, I think they're both definitely being considered late. This one has gone back and forth uh, a couple of times over the last 24 to 36 hours. I think right now, speaking on signing day morning, I give the edge to the Florida Gators with Jaden Ball. Okay. But Bama's still in that conversation as well. Chad, we're just, we're just talking all flips right now. We're talking all about the flips and where guys are going. And one guy who's maybe not being discussed quite as heavily on, on the Intel side of things, uh, Jordan Seaton, because he committed to Colorado, five-star plus offensive tackle. But even so, like I'm, I'm a big social media guy when it comes to reading the tea leaves <laughs> and trying to figure out what's going on with these commitments. Uh, a little bit of some cryptic social media activity from Jordan Seaton. Uh, what's the latest you're hearing from him, if anything at all? Yeah, good luck in figuring that how to read those tea leaves. And maybe you can teach me a little bit about that, JD. But uh, it's pretty difficult, these cryptic messages and tweets and stuff like that on social media from these guys. Look, you know, there's been some, some definitely talk behind the scenes about Jordan seat in the last day or two. Uh, there's been communication, I can say, with multiple staffs. Um, you know, NIL factors here as well, obviously, and him committing to Colorado. Uh, there's been talk about Maryland. There's been talk about Tennessee. Um, you know, at one time, Bama was thought to be the favorite there as well for Jordan Seaton. But uh, I don't know if this one is completely a done deal Whoa. for Deion Sanders in Colorado with Jordan Seaton. And I'm not sure it's a done deal that he will sign today, day one of the early signing period with any school. So I think those are two things that we're chasing right now on the Jordan Seaton front. Number one, 
does he sign today? Number two, if he does, is it with Colorado? Mm. Who do you think the main players could be if it's not Colorado? You know, the schools I've heard the most, man, has been Maryland and Tennessee. Those have been the two uh, that I've heard the most. Now, you know, when he committed to Colorado, uh, I've confirmed that Tennessee was right there mm -hmm. finishing number two on that list. Does that mean if he doesn't go to Colorado today, they're number one? Not necessarily. There's been talks with multiple coaching staff since he committed to Colorado. But the two schools right now outside of Colorado that I'm hearing the most about are, are Tennessee and Maryland. Wow. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, Chad. When Jordan Seaton dropped his top seven, even when Jordan Seaton committed, there was programs that had a really good shot at him. I thought that Oregon had a really good shot. I thought that Tennessee had a really good shot. But when it came to Maryland, I viewed them as a filler on his top seven, just a graphic. Were they really a play? When did, when did they become a serious player for Jordan Seaton? Well, it would be like probably like right now if they get him here late. I mean, I, I think honestly they were on the list just to be on the list yeah, at one time. Yeah, that's how I felt. Because he's a DMV guy. He knows the, he knows the staff. He knows Mike Loxley. He's got some yeah. connections up there. He's got family up there, so he knows about Maryland. But the the way it was told to me as this played out the last few months when those lists were made and the, you know, top I think fourteen at one time to top seven to top six. Really, every time it was laid out to me as almost just kind of out of respect. Yeah. You know, I'm going to put Maryland, yeah. that local school in my backyard, on that list. But look, we, we don't, any, none, none of us can even imagine what's going on in Jordan Seaton's head and the reason I sure could. behind he puts anything out there. So it's going to be very interesting how this plays out today or sometime this week. Mm. Well, it's one of those things because we've seen Deion Sanders be on the offensive side of those things where he goes and grabs a Travis Hunter on signing yeah. day or he grabs Cormani McClain after him not signing with Miami last year. We haven't really seen him be on the side where he gets flipped away from with much less a five-star plus offensive tackle flipping away potentially from a place like Colorado and from a, from a coach like Coach Prime. Yeah, this, uh, you know, hey, you got to – if you got great recruits – other teams are going to come after them. That's just a fact of how recruiting goes. So the fact that other teams are threatening to flip Jordan Seaton right now, I don't think that's really an indictment on Coach Prime or Colorado. It just shows that they are recruiting some really good players that other teams want. Yeah, and it's one of those days, too, a national signing day where you got to keep your head on the swivel. Again, Jeremiah Smith is set to sign. He's currently committed to Ohio State. But which school is getting the signature? We will have all the intel for yeah. you here coming up as soon as that pops. Josh, I want to go back to Buford because that really is where I think like the eyes of the college football recruiting world have to be. K.J. Bolden, the pick is in from uh, our own Jeffrey Lee at Auburn Live for him to ultimately flip from Florida State to Georgia. What does that say about Auburn to have someone like a Jeffrey Lee who's, who's as down as it gets to the Auburn you know, community and to the Auburn intel making his pick for him to go to the dogs? To me, it shows that Auburn, not just Jeffrey Lee, but the Auburn sources that he's speaking with inside their facility – one, they don't think he's coming to Auburn. And two, the Auburn coaches at least think that, hey, he's flipping to Georgia. Uh, now, like I said earlier, the speculation was running wild back in August when he committed to Florida State that it was going to be Auburn. It was going to be Georgia. Yeah, Florida State had a shot. I know the Florida State insiders all were calling for Florida State, but nobody outside of Tallahassee really thought K.J. Bolden was heading there. And now on signing day, it's kind of the same sentiment. So... Is everybody just misreading this recruitment? Or does everybody have the inside intel that, that K.J. Bolden is not going to stand on that Florida State commitment? And a guy, too, Josh, where when he was announcing his commitment, it was one of those things where you and I walked into the office and we're both kind of like, hey, where do you think he's going to go? Well, yeah. where, where do you think he's going to go? And and everybody had an We had an idea for where, oh, he's probably going to go here. It was legitimately, it could be any three of these schools feels that same way on his national signing. Day. Yeah, and even the people that thought they knew where he was going, nobody would jump up on the table and say, that's the pick. I'm staying. This is my predict. Like, everybody was like, well, I got him going here, but I, I could understand where you're coming <laughs> from with your take. And, you know, that here we are, it, deja vu all over again. It's unbelievable that K.J. Bolden took an official visit to FSU last weekend, the final weekend that you could have face-to-face -face contact before the dead period. And the thought was, hey, Okay, Florida State's going to let K.J. Bolden take all these trips. He's going to go, he's going to, even after he committed, they knew he was going to go visit Georgia. They knew he would pop up on the planes, but they knew that they had that final 
official visit in their back pocket that they were going to use the weekend before signing day to solidify this thing. And here we are on signing day, and it is the furthest thing from solidified. I mean, we're the top safety in America. you got a lot of people calling your phone and a lot of people wanting your services, and who can blame them? Josh, we're going to talk flips probably for throughout the entire duration of this show by nature of what national you, signing day is. Do you is. think if one prospect flips at Buford, they both flip? You know what I mean? Like, hmm. if one Do sticks, like they both deal? stick. Yeah, because mm. it would be a lot easier if your teammate made a big flip as well and you weren't the only one. Although, I, these kids probably want to be the only one. I see in where the you're spotlight. coming from with that. But yeah, like, what if they just teamed up and Edric said, hey, KJ? We're going to do this. Today. Yeah, I mean, it could be one of those things where just at, just from a human being standpoint, if one person makes the jump and, and you know, flips yeah. their commitment. And it's funny because not even going to, the, you know, the same school in theory in, in that sense. But anyway, we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, Josh, we talked a lot about flips. Like I said, we'll talk a lot about flips throughout the rest of signing day because that's pretty big storyline throughout signing day when it comes it's to at what least one is. of the most exciting storylines. Well, question. it depends what side of your team's on the flip, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Some, I mean, the, the interest level obviously varies based on uh <laughs> your team and which recruit it is, but uh, any names that we maybe glossed over there that you want to go circle back to and make sure we get a, a thought on record. For. Yeah, I think there's a lot of buzz going on right now around Arian Hampton, four-star quarterback that has been committed to Texas, but the buzz has been rising around Alabama. And I mean, hey, if you're a DB and you're committing between Texas and Alabama, I don't think you can go wrong, but obviously Texas fans want to see Arian Hampton stick, but the buzz right now is around a potential flip to Alabama there. I mean, we got, what else? We got Amaris Williams. We kind of hit on that one. Amaris Williams has been, he's out of the state of North Carolina. This is a really intriguing one. It seems like he's, he wants to end up anywhere but Florida. Now he's, he remains committed, but at one time, three weeks ago, it looked like he was trending to Ohio state. Keith Niebuhr went to North Carolina, uh, Keith Niebuhr of Gators Online, went to North Carolina, interviewed him. And at the time he mentioned Ohio state was the favorite, but said, there's a mystery team involved. Hmm. Well, that mystery team has reared its head, and it is Auburn. So down the stretch, another potential flip from the Florida Gators to Auburn Tigers. They already landed edge Jamonte Waller. Now they're trying to flip Amaris Williams. They're also after Gator defensive lineman LJ McCray. And now that Chad's back in the booth, I wanted to talk to Chad. We were talking flips here. Chad. Daytona Beach mainland on my little cheat sheet over here I got that they were going to do their signing day ceremony at 10 a.m eastern we've gone through that time what's the deal with LJ McCray now we know Zay Mincy is four-star safety teammate top 50 player was not going to sign today he's going to or he was going to sign today but he was going to announce his commitment at the January 6 all-american game but when it came to LJ McCray he was expected to sign today what's going on there yeah, it's funny you ask, because out there on the bat phone with somebody about those two Perfect. guys. So, um, you know, obviously we'll start with McCray, being he's already committed to Florida. Uh, Five-star kid from Daytona, mainland. Um, the buzz right now is he's still trying to figure out, does he sign today or not? Does he sign tomorrow? Does he sign Friday? Uh, obviously he signs early. That's the plan. It could right. still be, I'm told, today. Uh, that's not 100% out of the question just yet uh, but from what I'm hearing the biggest competition is Auburn right now late for the University of Florida I think Florida State's trying to hang around I think Miami's kind of been ruled out for LJ McCray uh, but nothing final there based on what I'm hearing from a source then going over to Zay yeah. Mincy um, obviously he won't announce until January but he will sign this week likely today uh, with either Alabama Florida, Florida State, or Miami. Uh, I'm hearing the most buzz this morning around the University of Alabama. Oh. Uh, people have been talking about, including myself, Miami maybe being, being the front runner uh, the last couple of weeks, but Bama stayed pretty consistent. They had Nick Saban in last week for an in-home visit with Mincy, uh, as every other staff did as well with the head coaches. But uh, I think it's coming down based on what I'm hearing this morning with Alabama in Miami, uh, but the most confidence this morning with the mm. University of Alabama was mm. Zay Mincy. So is this one of those deals that with LJ McCray that we just talked about? Is the Gator staff behind the scenes trying to get him to sign today? Is there? Do you think the stumbling block is he just wants to take more time, or is there a specific team 
that's causing this delay? Well, they're trying to get him to sign today if you're Florida, if it's with them. You know, obviously, <laughs> if you feel like you're the that's school, uh, then yes, you uh, want him to sign. Now, if you think you're losing him to Auburn, uh, or somebody else, Florida State or Miami, then you want to hold him off and say, man, just take your time. You have wow. three days in this window. You know, you've been committed to us for so long. We had that relationship here. You know, come back to us. But, yes, if Florida is the school still in the lead and they feel good about that, you're pushing to get him signed as quickly as possible. Uh, so, yes, it's obviously an interesting twist again on – where Florida's coming from is based on how they feel about their chances. If he does sign today, is it with them or with someone else? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you were also, when you were out on the bat phone, we talked a little Arian Hampton in the potential of a flip there from Texas. What are you hearing? What's the latest on Arian Hampton? You know, obviously, Sam Spiegelman has done a great job on this one, going back to last night, mm -hmm. bringing up Alabama, you know, back in this mix. I mean, he, he's been all over the place with these different schools throughout the process. So I think anything that he does is, is not a surprise, but it seems like this morning has kind of con continued from Sam's report last night that Bama's in a good spot to flip him from Texas. And a guy like Hampton, I got to imagine, if you're in the secondary and Nick Saban is recruiting you, and we all know Nick Saban specializes in the secondary, like, how difficult is that to tell a guy like that no? Like, is that sort of the writing on the wall in your mind, Chad, for a guy like Hampton? Yeah, telling Saban no? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's hard for anyone, but you're at the same time, you've been committed to Sark, and he has a good thing going at University of Texas. You're an in-state kid at Texas. I mean, a lot of things play in there, um, you know, as well uh, with the University of Texas. But I think it has to be for a kid – you know, going through high school into college now to look Saban, if you're face-to-face -face with Nick Saban and tell him, no, I'm picking somebody else over you. That's probably a pretty hard discussion or pretty hard statement to make. Yeah, do not think that's a conversation I would like to have right now, much less if I were, oh, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. Don't think that would be one I would be interested in having, but I guess you, know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to do decision what you got to do. Uh, Chad, one more question for you. Any of these flips that maybe we uh, need to, to revisit, we kind of glossed over a few of them. Any that you want to make sure we, we double check on here as we move on throughout the rest of National Signing Day? We'll talk about flips throughout the duration of the show. Any that you want us to uh, make sure we, we double check on here? Uh, I mean, I'm honestly trying to keep up with what you guys. I'm on the phone over here as you guys are talking. I'm talking or texting or typing. Uh, I mean, obviously, I don't know which ones you guys have all hit on just yet. I think, obviously, the big ones, Jeremiah McClellan sure. today, maybe surprised some people. I mean, Dylan Rayola is huge, I think, uh, you know, right now and the long run for the University of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as well, I think you know the fun with the track has always been Armando Blunt going from Florida State, yeah. reclassifying on you know, Miami, and then does he go back to Miami today? But uh, yeah, I think there'll be some more to pop up. We can talk about a whole lot more the rest of the day. There's one on the graphic that we didn't cover, and that's linebacker Darius Hayes out of Largo, Florida, and he's been committed to the Gators for some time now, a top 100 prospect, and. He says all the right things, Chad, if you're a Florida Gator fan. He's been saying that he is solid, that nothing's going to happen, and he's not wavering. But his actions tell a different story. What's the latest on Adarius Hayes? Yeah, his actions, you know, going back to this, this Miami OV over the weekend, uh, if that tells a story, I don't really know what the story is because he's gone <laughs> kind of quiet, you know, on everybody. You know, he didn't do any interviews post-visit to Miami over the weekend. Uh, he hasn't really talked to anyone since. I talked to his coach and people connected to him the last couple of days. And um, him and his family have really shut things down, kept things really quiet. But, again, as J.D. says, reading through the tea leaves, I, I would say that Miami is in the best position. They got him on campus late. Uh, Josh, you said he said all the right things since he's been committed. Yeah. Uh, he was at Miami for the Georgia Tech game back in the fall. There's been consistent communication kind of quietly behind the scenes between Hayes and that Miami staff, specifically Derek Nicholson, the linebackers coach. He sees a chance to come in, be that edge guy at the University of Miami. He can do the same thing at the University of Florida, but coming off that visit, the way he took that visit kind of quietly last minute, sneaking down to Coral Gables and not saying anything since, putting pieces together with people I talked to and his actions, I like where Miami's at right now for Darius Hayes. We'll keep it locked right here. I promise you. Which Chad's going to step outside at some point in time during this show, jump on the bat phone, come back in, and just drop some phenomenal intel on this show. So make sure you're dialed in right here. We'll be going throughout the show to Chad to get that scoop. Uh, let's go take a look at these top 10 rankings as they stand right now. Again, pay very close attention to that last updated uh, text there at the bottom there as of 10 a.m. Central. 
Georgia holding strong at number one. Dogs on top. Dogs still on top. Now, this could change based on what happens with K.J. Bolden and what happens with Alabama sitting there in the two spot. Let's take a look at what the dogs have right now. The Alab or, excuse me, with, with Alabama at two and Georgia still holding strong at one, they got 27 commits, Josh. What stands out to you about this class with Georgia still being the top dog? Uh, just the way they're built right now. Well, I love their secondary class, and that's without K.J. Bolden. I mean, imagine if they land K.J. Bolden. They already have the number one cornerback in America committed to them, the number three prospect overall in Ellis Robinson. They are absolutely loaded in this secondary. DeMello Jones, I like him a lot as well. He's out of the state of Georgia, but they want one more player in the state of Georgia, mm. and that's the number one safety in America. It would kind of round out this class. Not that this class needs to be rounded out. It's already the top class in America. And hey, they're, they're really not in jeopardy of losing that top spot. That's kind of rare in these days where they have such a big lead that there's hardly a, a legit scenario where we can see them getting bumped but you love them going into the state of texas and landing justin williams you love them going into the state of virginia and landing a chris cole they lose landon thomas a great tight end to florida state who do they get they get Jaden riddell a top 100 <laughs> player in his own right i mean they just even when they miss they can't lose so georgia they are recruiting at an elite level even with the i mean hey we've been talking all morning about dylan riola yeah flipping it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference in their number one class. That's how loaded this class is from top to bottom. And it, yes, of course the top is loaded, but the bottom of this class is also loaded. I mean, you don't get to the number one spot by not landing elite players at every level. And that's what we're seeing Georgia do. They're loading up on the D line. They got skill players. They Ryan Puglisi's coming in. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about him later, but you know, I really like what the Georgia class is doing, and it is sustaining itself throughout. You know, a, a little hiccup here and there. It's not going to, they're not going to flinch. They're still number one. Josh, the thing that stands out to me the most looking at this Georgia class of their 27 commits, 12 on either the offensive or defensive line. That is some USDA approved sirloin beef for the dogs. We understand this. At the end of the day in college football, Big people move little people, yeah. and Georgia is stacking up on the big people in droves, especially in this class. Yeah, landing Joseph Jonah Ajanye, he's teammates with Justin Williams, and he is an absolute monster. Six foot four, 275 pounds. He has great burst. He gets off the ball. He is physical. He is a big man in the middle. They also got Nasir Johnson. He's 6'4", 300. Daniel Calhoun, uh, he's an offensive lineman. I'm sorry. Justin Green, 6'3 and a half, 275. They are loaded on that defensive line, and they're still looking to the portal for more help. So Georgia understands the, the need for quality, not just at the starting rotation, but also the depth level for, for what they do. And Georgia's going to be rotating in some really high quality recruits as we come into the 2024 season. Yeah, just the rich getting richer because that's exactly what Georgia needs, right? Yep. More five stars. They don't have enough of them in Athens. You know, you don't, you don't have enough talent necessarily in Athens. Yep. I'm sure what Kirby Smart was saying. So every single year, they just reload, get more five stars, get more beef up front. I mean, they, you mentioned the guys they got in the secondary, Ellis Robinson. They are Dil stacked and in every sense. And to think that you can lose a Dylan Riola and still feel like that you have a great quarterback haul in Ryan Puglisi. Mm -hmm. Ryan Puglisi never flinched. He was committed before Dylan Riola. Dylan Riola commits at the time. I think he was the number one quarterback in America. Ryan Puglisi didn't care. It was one of those things, Josh. We talked about the on three NIL elite yeah. series. Ryan Puglisi, just an adult, carries himself like a pro. And that's not to say anything of anybody else in this class that plays quarterback, but just being able to sit down with him. Like you felt like you were talking to a guy that had been in college for years, not a yeah. guy who was a high school senior about to go play his last yeah. year of high school football. He could understand the bigger picture. After we sat down with Ryan Puglisi, there was no doubt in my mind he was going to end up signing with the dogs. I, I completely understood his take on it. He was just like, hey, it's competition. Yeah. And wherever I go, there's going to be competition. And that was a great mindset. And you don't see that a lot these days. It was one of those things, too, where we sat down with him. And we had no intention of steering the conversation towards the whole thought around oh, he will he stick on. with Georgia. It was like we asked him an NIL question. He's like, I'm going to Georgia. Yeah. We're like, well, that's that's great. Good for Georgia and good for Ryan Puglisi. He, he's he's not ignoring the already. elephant in the room there. He, he took it head on, and I think that's how he's going to uh, – address his career at Georgia. He's going to just going to take all these issues head on. Love Ryan Puglisi pickup if you're Georgia. And another thing, Josh, with this class, 
a lot of national reach. Like you, you look up and down this, you know, recruits list and guys that have already signed or are maybe about to sign. You got California present. You got New Jersey present. We just talked about Ryan Puglisi from the state of Connecticut. You got Texas. Like the, just the overall yeah. national reach is ridiculous. Now we got some intel here. We told you the bat phone stays ringing on a national signing day. Throwing it to Chad Simmons, director of recruiting for On3. Chad, what's the latest buzz? I mean, it seems to work out pretty good here. I mean, I'm on the phone out there, you guys were talking about Georgia's class. I had another call from a great source here tied in to K.J. Bolden. Georgia's still looking good there. Another source tells me that things are, you know, nothing's ever done, but things are looking really good for Georgia just here, what, a couple hours out or what, one hour out uh, from K.J. Bolden's decision. So I think Georgia's in a good place to maybe – keep K.J. Bolden home, and I did get confirmation that Zay Mincy will not sign today. His plan is to take more time. They said, mm. I was told he's still talking about his decision. I wasn't told exactly what school or schools, maybe that final two or three, but I'm hearing more about Alabama and Miami still. Uh, but, he, but Zay Mincy will not sign today, but he'll, he'll sign. his plan is to sign tomorrow uh, on day two of the early signing period. So uh, just to explain what we're talking about, Zay Mincy, he's not talking about taking his recruitment into February. He's talking about making a decision in the next three days, silently signing with the team and then announcing at the January 6th All-Star game. Is that correct? Yeah, out in San Antonio, All-American Bowl. Uh, he'll announce his decision with the hats on the table at some point, you know, before the game, during the game, and kind of have that moment with his family uh, to make that lifelong memory. But uh, the plan is he will sign and, Look, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, yeah. and with this early signing period, when guys announce that way, it's hard for stuff not to leak out when you have to send that letter of oh, intent, yeah. intent in, and it has to sit there for a week and a half, you know, when nobody knowing what's going on. So uh, they try to keep it quiet. We'll see what happens with Mincy. But, uh, yeah, he will sign, it sounds like, on Thursday, but obviously not announce that decision until January 6th. So are you telling me, that both L.J. McCray and Zay Mincy could defer their signings to Friday? Well, it sounds like Thursday for Zay. I didn't have anyone tell me specifically yet on L.J. if it's definitely not going to happen today or definitely will happen tomorrow or Friday. But, yeah, that's obviously the one of them hmm. has signed yet. The plan for Zay right now, Zay specifically, is to sign on day two tomorrow. Jeez. Chad, let's go back to K.J. Bolden. You said things are looking good for Georgia, and obviously he's still committed to Florida State. With his recruitment, we were talking, I think, when you walked out of the room, when it came to him making his commitment, it was one of those things where you felt pretty good if you were an Auburn fan or a Florida State fan or a Georgia fan when he actually made his verbal commitment. Uh, is it that same kind of vibe today, or is it like, hey, Georgia's kind of starting to catch some momentum and Florida State's not feeling as confident going into the signing? Or where do you think stand when it comes to those three camps between Florida State, Georgia, and Auburn? Yeah, I think if you rewind you know, 24 hours ago, mm -hmm. I, I would say – Maybe a little bit more like deja vu, where leading up to that announcement on August 5th when he chose Florida State, I think really up until, you know, maybe 30, 45 minutes before that decision, um, I didn't start to feel confident about Florida State that day. And even at that point, I wasn't sure he was going to Florida State. I don't think anybody was, you know. But then today, it seems to. Things, start, things are starting to line up, mm -hmm. it seems like, according to not just one source, two source, three sources, but multiple sources that are tied in on both sides, whether it's an Auburn source, a Georgia source, a Bolden source, a Buford source, all starting to come together that Georgia is the clear team to beat today. So I think that's the biggest difference. I think starting this week off, people thought Auburn, Florida State, Georgia could go any of three ways. Up to yesterday, maybe more Auburn versus Georgia. Pretty, maybe Auburn had the edge. But now as we get down to the final moments, like I said, an hour or so away from his announcement, things seem to be lining up the right way for Georgia. Again, we don't ever know until he puts that pen to the paper. But right now, everything's leaning towards the University of Georgia. And Chad, is it the familiarity there? Is it the pedigree of what Georgia brings to the table? Like, What would be the reasons as to why Georgia's closing so strong here for K.J. Bolden? You know, I've always said about K.J. from covering him from day one, coming out of middle school, not all guys live up to the hype that they hear. I get calls all the time, emails about, hey, this middle school kid, seventh grade kid. Um, but there hasn't been many of those guys that have lived up to what I heard about them at that young age. I mean, ones like Trevor Lawrence obviously did that. K.J. is another one uh, that I heard about coming out of middle school. Uh, and here he is now, an elite safety, a five-star player, 
coveted by every school in the country. Um, but Georgia, I think he's always just spoken about that term home. You know, he feels at home at Georgia. He's been there more than any other school. He's visited Georgia 20 plus times throughout the process. He knows people on that team. He knows that staff extremely well. I think it helps. Kirby Smart's background in the secondary, a defensive minded coach. You have Will Muschamp in there, who's been a head coach, a defensive guy, played safety. I think a lot of things factor in, of course, NFL production, the way Georgia wins. Uh, I think all those things factor in, but I think if Georgia does get K.J. Bolden today, I think it comes down to just that feeling he has when he's on campus, feeling at home at Georgia. Now, the team he's committed to, Florida State, they got him on campus last weekend right as the dead period was setting in. They were thinking that they were going to get the last face-to-face -face and just kind of lock this thing down. Is this a case of Florida State slipping or just the other teams not giving up? Yeah, I don't ever say think you say, say maybe slipping. I mean, FSU's done a great job. They've got him on campus as much as possible this season. They've stayed in communication with him, his family, the people within his circle. Uh, I don't think FSU ever let up or slipped in any way. Uh, it's just a matter of where KJ in the end committing's one thing. Signing's totally different. You're, you're committing yourself in a different way when you sign that paper. A commitment's a verbal commitment. doesn't lock you into anything. Yeah. That, that the time he committed, he felt best about Florida State. Let's see if that stays true today. When he signs the paper, he says, really, where my heart's at is with the University of Georgia. Mm. Chad, wow. is, is it one of those things, too, where, like, the Georgia brand, it feels like in the last five years is really starting to carry, like, a little bit more weight even than it did before with the national championships and where Kirby's pushed that thing. Like, I think before it was Bama's this enormous brand and that brand carries a ton of weight. Now it feels like Georgia's maybe in that same territory. Is that true when it comes to talking to these kids on the recruiting trail? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, obviously, a little bit when Kirby first came in, me living in Georgia, uh, he took a little heat for not maybe recruiting the home state guys you know, maybe as hard as Mark Rick did in his time yeah. when he was the head coach and kind of, yeah, he wants to lock a fence down around the state of Georgia to keep the best players there. But Kirby's going to know, now go get, like he did at Alabama under Nick Saban, what Saban does at Bama, you're going to go get the best players in America that you think can help you win a championship. You know, Georgia has built that brand, that national brand, national reputation where kids call them from California, <laughs> kids call them from Ohio. Kids called them from Miami, wanting to be a part of what Kirby Smart's built. Yes, he wants to keep the home state kids home, like KJ Bolden, for example. Uh, but in the end, he has built that national brand, and that helps them recruit at a national level. Mm. Josh, if Georgia lands KJ Bolden, does that just slam the door and kind of drive the cement on a number one class in this cycle? Yeah, you know, honestly, I think Florida State, well, number one DB class, I'll take it even a step further. Yeah, I think it. Florida State was battling for the number one DB class in America with Charles Lester, Kai Bates, Jamari Howard, and a KJ Bolden. But if you take KJ Bolden out of that commit list, yeah, it's still a very good DB class, but I don't think it's competing for the top class in America. But I think obviously, you got Ellis Robinson, the number one corner, and you got KJ Bolden, the number one safety, DeMello Jones. I mean, this is a really top to bottom, not just a great class, but a elite secondary class. And I think they, they take the cake with the number one DB class in America, no doubt. Well, if, if you are watching the live feed, I'm peering over at Josh's computer screen because he has the list of times for the time these guys are going to sign. And Jeremiah Smith, I mean, we are just... Hey, keep it our head we're in the swivel. Zone. We're, we're, like, we're right in that the, sweet spot. For it, we could be, I'm just waiting for Chad to put a hand up here with, with the, some Jeremiah Smith news. We are about, it's said 11 a.m. Central time for his signing. So we are in that zone right now for the number one player in America, the number one wide receiver in America. Now he's committed to Ohio State, but those in-state schools, Florida, Florida State and Miami are all trying to keep him in state. We've heard a lot of buzz about Florida State because they were the last team that hosted him on a visit. But I wouldn't count out Miami, and I wouldn't count out Florida. A lot of folks in both Ohio, Columbus specifically, and the good folks in the state of Florida holding their breath, waiting to see who lands the signature from the number one player in America. And Jeremiah Smith, obviously, as soon as ink touches paper, We'll have a full reaction for you right here on this show. So but don't let us go know, anywhere. comment section. I mean, hey, yeah, you, guys, you guys are the real recruiting experts, so let us know, comment section below, where's Jeremiah Smith going? Let us know. We'll talk about all that, obviously, as soon as that pops. Uh, Josh, Jeremiah Smith going to be a huge talking point today, wherever he ends up signing, but a, a continual talking point throughout every single national signing day. 
It's the quarterbacks. Yeah. All right, it's the quarterback. If you, if you got a quarterback, you got a chance. Let's take a look at some of the quarterback superlatives from this 2024 cycle from our own director of scouting, Charles Power. Uh, Julian saying most accurate quarterback in the class per Charles Power, DJ Lagway. Florida commit the best senior season of this yeah, class. I woke up every Saturday morning to watch DJ Lagway's seven touchdown performance. It seemed like <laughs> every weekend he was th closing in on double digit touchdown passes. Unbelievable season for D DJ Lagway. Just unbelievable. My man did numbers like Goodwill Hunting. Uh, best deep ball, Dylan Raiola, the former Georgia commit, obviously flipped to Nebraska, signed with the Cornhuskers this morning. I still can't believe They're going to stretch the field I still, with I still, stretch I still the field can't now. believe that Dylan Raiola is a Cornhusker. I just can't. It, it doesn't feel real. And I don't think it's going to feel real for the good folks in Lincoln until they finally get to see him out there for spring ball, throwing it around in a, in a I, I was going to say non-contact jersey, but based on last year's spring game, maybe Matt Rule will go no, yeah. no contact jersey again for the QBs. Regardless, uh, it is real. Cornhusker fans, embrace that. You got the quarterback with the best deep ball in the class per Charles Power. Biggest gunslinger, Ryan Puglisi. Guy from the state of Connecticut, committed to the dogs. And uh, I think that matches with what we uh, were able to glean from just talking to him during that on three and all elite series yeah. here in Nashville, Josh. Now, Chad, you were able to make it out to California to see Julian saying our number one quarterback in person. What is it about Julian saying that solidifies him as number one overall? You know, things for me that stand out, I saw him uh, at multiple events from, you know, things in pads to seven on sevens to elite 11. And uh, I think one thing that jumps out is just poise, man. His mentality, his leadership, just the composure. Mm -hmm. uh, always just really super smooth, man. A lot like, you know, just that Bryce Young, just the way he carries himself. I mean, never gets too high, never gets too low. Uh, when it comes to, I think, quarterback, you know, intangibles as far as his on-the-field play, uh, the deep ball, I think he throws a beautiful deep ball, uh, accuracy, very catchable pass. Um, you know, he's a smart kid from out in uh, the San Diego area at Carlsbad. And uh, he's a guy I think that, you know, guys want to play with and guys want to play for just the mm -hmm. way he goes about his business. You know, he's a, the guy that's going to command a huddle, uh, super smart. And again, I think he just throws one of the best deep balls in the country. Another guy you got to see in person, Chad, Aaron Noland. Quarterback commit to Ohio State. He got the field general superlative for Charles Power. Uh, some things that stick out to you about him when you got to see him up close and personal. You know, I think when I think about Air covering him since ninth grade, you know, obviously we're from the same state and he won a state championship at Langston Hughes after losing one, mm -hmm. um, you know, early in his high school career. But he's a winner, man. Yeah. I think grit, I think toughness. Uh, he's a guy that will run. He'll sacrifice his body for his team. Uh, he just wants to do whatever it takes to win that game. You know, he's not going to be a guy that's when it's third and three, he'll slide one yard short. He will lower <laughs> that shoulder and go get that. And, and guys rally around guy, 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 that. Guys want to play with guys like him. You know, I think the interesting thing, he's a lefty quarterback. You don't yeah. have a whole lot of those guys that spin it differently. And uh, he throws a beautiful ball. He spins the ball well. Uh, but I think when I think about Air, obviously number one winner, but just that grit, toughness factor as a quarterback, kind of that old school guy that doesn't care about getting dirty and being pretty all the time. End of the day, he just wants his team to be one point higher than the opposing team. One of the good folks in Ohio, you, with you saying that, it was just music to their ears saying, okay, we got a guy who's not from the state of Ohio, but kind of is about what we're about a here, blue collar, collar operation. Him, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they were very uh, encouraged to hear you say those things about Aaron Nolan because I know they can't wait to get him on campus. Uh, most developmental upside, Luke Cromenhoke, Florida State commit. Yeah, that thoughts, makes a lot of sense. Thoughts on him. Thoughts on him there, Josh. He didn't, he he com get this. He committed a Florida State before he started a high school game. So Florida State got him in on camp, threw for them. They really liked what they saw. They offered him. He commits shortly thereafter, and everybody's like, "Who?" But he goes out. He has a great senior year think that Luke Croman Hawk has a huge future. He's got a great arm, great size, great ability. Chad, you've seen Luke Croman Hawk in action, and there was some late buzz that, hey, maybe Georgia was even going to get involved there. What do you like about Luke Croman Hawk at Florida State? Well, I have seen him in action win the state championship playing safety, of all things. So, I mean, that, that tells you about yeah, his toughness and athleticism that. and what he'll do to get on the field to help his team win, team win a football game in a rainstorm for a state championship. Um, look, Luke's a good athlete. You know, I think the biggest thing about Luke, you talk about like what Charles says, biggest upside. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much for Mike Norvell and that staff to work with and to develop in Tallahassee. Yeah. I think, you know, the offense he plays in in Benedictine, 
they don't throw the ball a lot. So they're, they're a run-heavy team. They control the clock. Uh, and when he does throw, he flashes. But I think the biggest thing is probably going to be the learning curve when he gets to Florida State as far as reading progressions, play action, different things that he hasn't done a whole lot of in high school. But the tools are there, the size, the athleticism, the football IQ, the arm strength. There's a lot for Mike Norvell and that staff to work with. Tell you what, man, I'm excited to see DJ Lagway hit the field. Whenever that is, whether it's next year, whether it's in a couple of years, like just the numbers he put up throughout the course of this season. You mentioned it, Josh. It felt like he was just playing road to glory all season mm -hmm. long on the NCAA football video game. He lived that as a high school senior. When it comes to recruiting the quarterback position with, you know, the day and age of NIL and then the transfer portal with the way coaches are trying to shuffle these rosters, especially in that quarterback room, uh, what goes into recruiting the quarterback position that maybe didn't necessarily a couple years ago? Man, they really identified him early. This it, quarterback recruiting comes earlier and earlier. I remember talking with Sam Spiegelman about last October and he told me hey get ready DJ Lagway is going to be making a decision soon now we see as it goes right now we see all these 2025 QBs they're going to be coming off the board come January February but DJ Lagway made that decision early you gotta identify your guy early especially if you're a program like a Florida where you're trying to build and you're trying to build around a guy like DJ Lagway and I really love we were showing his highlights a second ago if you look at his build I mean we talk Air Nolan Air Nolan still has some weight to put on but dj lagway boy look at, he's running through guys here he he has he doesn't need time in the weight room he's gonna put it in but he to me is one of the most physically ready to go quarterbacks and you know hey the gators have graham mertz coming back but if DJ Lagway gets called up, I'd love to see him in action next and year. Another guy who just carries himself like a pro. Like we sat down yeah. with him and talked to him at the On3 NLI Elite Series event. And I mean, he was just very well put together, extremely articulate, knew all the right things to say. I mean, very complimentary whenever he was given praise. He deflected it. So, I mean, they got themselves a, a real professional and DJ Lagway. And you see him stay above the BS. I mean, there's it's easy to fall into that. It's easy to get onto Twitter and throw up the emojis and make people think that you might not be stable. So you get all this attention and you get all this love to come back and be solid. DJ Lagway didn't need that. You know, he was there for a reason. He wanted to build a class around him. I said this throughout the uh, cycle. DJ Lagway was the best recruit recruiter in the 2024 cycle. Now, I know the Gators didn't play all that well on the field, but he was relentless. I mean, his ability to get from Texas to Gainesville for any big recruiting weekend paid dividends. I mean, the, the reason some of these guys are committed to the Florida Gators is because of DJ Lagway. I mean, hey, Billy Napier did a great job getting them, but DJ Lagway is one of the reasons why so many great players lined up to play. Talk Florida. about a guy who, who gets the big picture, who understands the overarching yeah. thing of like, hey, if we want to be successful here, it's big that you got me in this class. We got to get some other pieces to get where we yeah, want to go. And I think his dad is a big help in that. For sure. You know, his dad is very level headed and keeps him grounded. And, you know, you need all that when you're a DJ Lagway. You play at a very high level in Texas. You're going to the Florida Gators. You need somebody there in your corner that's responsible, that understands the process. And I think his dad's helped him out a ton. So I'm fired up about DJ Lagway. Josh, any guy specifically from this superlatives list? that you're extra excited to see well, once they finally I'm really do hit the field of the collegiate ranks. I'm really excited to see Ryan Puglisi, as we said. Mm -hmm. I really want to see how that works out. But my guy's Dylan Raiola. Sure. I mean, hey, just because this he's on his third commitment, I know there's people saying that, well, hey, he's going to hit the transfer portal sometime soon. No. Dylan Raiola, I think, is the guy at Nebraska. Him and Matt Rule have an excellent relationship. And wouldn't it be a great story? Wouldn't it just be a great story <laughs> yeah. for Matt Rule to get his guy in Raiola, for him to lead Nebraska back to where they're supposed to be and, and get back to being a respectable team in college football? I mean, hey, you got to have an elite quarterback to do that. Nebraska shuffled through quite a few of them this season, weren't able to find him. Well, he might be on campus soon. And I know the Big Ten is changing around with no more Big Ten West, and they're adding you know those teams from the West Coast and UCLA, USC, Oregon, and Washington. So it's going to get more brutal. But you look at what Nebraska was last year, and I know it feels like the same song, third or fourth verse now for the folks in Lincoln. Josh, five and seven, but five losses by one score. They gave it away almost as much as anybody else in the country, and they scored 18 points a game and still narrowly missed a bowl game. You plug in a guy that's a five-star arm like yeah, Dylan Ryola. start Raiola, scoring some points. It changes hey, the game tremendously. changes everything. Is he know? a guy that you're watching? And I know we're completely speculating here. He just signed his letter of intent to go to Nebraska. Is he someone that you're watching like, hey, Day one on campus, he's going to be the most talented guy in that room. Is he someone you think competes early for playing time? 
I wouldn't normally pay too much attention to what sure. happens in Nebraska spring football, but because <laughs> Dylan Raiola will be there, I'm going to pay attention. Yeah, I absolutely expect him to compete for a starting job. Now, does he go in and win a starting job as a true freshman? I mean, that's a tall ask, even if it's a guy like a caliber Dylan Raiola. But I do think that he, because he's an early enrollee, hey, I think he goes into spring football. I think he competes. I think he gets his bearings. Then you head into fall camp, and yeah, Dylan Raiola might have a legitimate shot at battling for that. But hey, one step at a time. He's gonna. He's already signed. Next step is to get him on campus. That'll happen soon. Next step is we see him in the in spring practice. We see how he develops in those three weeks, and then we see how he looks in fall camp. And I think all those things together. I think it's too early to put that on the young man that he's gonna go in there and should earn a starting spot right when he gets there. But he'll make an early impact in his career at Nebraska. I'm certain. And without a doubt, there will be some uh, some number 15 jerseys. If that's what he ends up wearing, like he did in that commitment video, there will be a, a shortage of those when it comes to the stores in Lincoln selling them. Uh, Chad. Talking about Dylan Raiola, a guy that you got to see up close in your backyard playing at Buford High School, a thing you hear a lot with him is the intangibles and just the maturity and just the way that he carries himself kind of like a pro right now. Speak to that a little bit and how it's going to correlate or translate rather when he gets to campus uh, and ends up playing, uh, playing some ball there in Lincoln. Yeah, I think it kind of lines up with kind of where he comes from. You know, obviously his dad played in the league for 10 plus years and obviously he grew up around the game and uh, friends with guys like Matthew Stafford and, and Dan Orzlowski and, and guys that, that played at that level that um, he used to play catch with in the Silverdome, you know, and guys, I think from it started there. I think with Dylan, nobody's going to outwork Dylan Rayola. He's going to go get the best training. He's going to do whatever he has to do to feel like he puts himself in the best position to be successful at that moment, you know, and not just them, but for the future as well. So I think the intangibles, I think, is what has made Dylan, you know, one of the best, if not the best quarterback in the country for this cycle, just because uh, of where he's come from and, and how he's bought into that. He, he wants to work. He's not about social media. He's not about the girlfriends in high school. <laughs> he's not about this and that. What he's about is football and improving his game in every opportunity. He'll fly to L.A. because he can to work with the best quarterback coaches. He'll fly to Texas to work with Patrick Mahomes, quarterback coach, in the offseason. That's what he does to set him up for success. And I think that, that's the key to success. It's the little things. All guys are equal when they get to Nebraska or Georgia or Florida State. They're all great players on the 85-man roster. The little things set guys apart. And to me, that's what Dylan is. He has the big arm. He has a great, I kind of almost call him like the Ben Roethlisberger frame where he's hard hmm. to tackle. He's got a thick lower body, very sturdy, very strong. He was a great high school baseball catcher. Would have had offers there to play in baseball as well. Uh, and he has that build to him, so he's thick, he can run, uh, he can get outside the pocket when needed and throw on the uh, different platforms. And to me, the little intangible things set him apart, but it starts with that work ethic and that mentality just to get better every day. What did you make of his senior year at Buford High School? I mean, I know there was a lot of people waiting to jump on Dylan Raiola if he had a bad year, but what did you make of his year at Buford? I mean, you look at the numbers. It's hard to say it's a bad year. I mean, obviously <laughs> the they, numbers were through the you know, roof. Obviously, they fell short in the state championship. Yeah. Game. That's kind of what Buford is measured on. Um, when you're where from I, where I'm from in Georgia, is that they've won so many state championships, and basically it's kind of that or a bust. And people want to call it, you know, for a program that has that kind of pressure to win at that level. But I think anyone that can come in and move into a program like that, that is full of alpha dogs on that mm -hmm. roster, that can come in in the basically early midsummer, learn that playbook, take command of that huddle get the respect from your teammates and your coaching staff, and then still win, uh, lead them to a very successful season and put up those kind of numbers, to me, that's a check. That's a success. What's going on at Buford, though, with all these Buford boys flipping? I mean, you got Dylan Raiola flipping. You got K.J. Bolton and Edric Houston on the clock. Is this just an outlier year? Is this something that happens at Buford High School? It's a new age of recruiting, man. It never stops. You know, like these schools, they, they grind till the end. These guys keep that one ear open. And if the, if the school allows that door to be cracked ever so little, it gives another school a chance to come in. But it's, it's not the norm at Buford. What is the norm is they sign, you know, 5 to 10 to 12 yeah. Power 5 guys every year. Uh, but it's not the norm to have a lot of flips on signing day. So this kind of is an outlier. Okay. Chad, I want to get your thoughts here before we take a look at these, uh, these top 10, I guess top 25 rankings before we uh, get too much further into the thick of signing day. Uh, with all of the 
transitions across college football with, you know, the, the emergence of NIL these last couple of years and the way the portal works. I mean, are we going to see more flips, you think, in future signing days because schools realize, hey, actually, the portal didn't work out how we thought. We actually do have to go heavy and try and flip this kid to get him onto our roster in the spring. Or, you know, maybe we do want to try and push the NIL space to get this guy signed. Are we going to see more flips in your mind when it comes to the future of signing day? I think so. With NIL involved, I mean, just things can change so fast. You know, I was asked by people to give, like, in a way, hard predictions. Where is this kid going to go, like, two days ago? I mean, that, that's a lifetime in recruiting, to lock yourself into saying, yeah. hey, this kid's going to Alabama or USC or whatever. So many things can happen, not just in two days, but two minutes in today's world. With NIL being a, a big part of many of these recruitments, you're going to see things change on a dime on the last day, the last week. I think you will see more flips because of that. Now, I thought kind of when with the introduction of NIL, I thought it could go one of two ways. I thought it could make things a lot crazier. But I also thought, hey, maybe there's a chance that NIL could make things a little less crazy because guys will be locking in. But it doesn't really seem like that. Sorry, I was looking at my phone, Josh. Do we have big news? <laughs> the bat phone stays ringing, Sorry. baby. The bat uh, phone stays ringing. Uh, Let's, so, let's yeah, talk this, about this. Looks like days. Jeremiah Smith is staying. I got the current confirmation. Okay. Staying with Ohio State. So, yeah, I was looking at I had a couple of different buzzes going off from different people. Uh, but Ohio State, it is for Jeremiah Smith. Put the hat on, sign the papers. He'll stay with the mm. Buckeyes. And I think the key here is rock solid with Brian Hartline. Hartline yeah. held this together. Um, he's a guy that had that relationship. He had that trust with Jeremiah Smith to go there be developed yes nil was a factor for jeremiah like anybody else but the end the end game for him is bet on yourself with brian hartline to make millions on top of millions on sundays down the road all right but chad he signs with ohio state now he'd been committed for nearly a year but there was a lot of buzz this morning what were you hearing behind the scenes when it came to jeremiah smith all morning you know, it seemed like Miami gained a little bit of traction, yeah. but honestly, like I said earlier, that it was kind of kind of eerily quiet around Jeremiah. I mean, everybody I was checking was saying they think Ohio State. They think Ohio State. You know, I, I talked to one person a couple days ago that thought maybe Florida made a really strong, you know, pitch, an NIL pitch to him with, with DJ Lagway, mm -hmm. you know, that partnership in, in Gainesville at the Swamp, you know, and people thought maybe Florida State was always that number two. But from what I was hearing today, maybe it was Miami number two, not Florida State, if there was a number two. It definitely seems like his mind was pretty set on Ohio State based on my sources that it was going to be very hard to flip him from Ohio State because of that connection and that trust in Brian Hartline. Yeah. Chad, what does this say about the brand of Ohio State? Because I'm thinking, okay, if I'm a kid from the southeast, much less from the state of Florida, where we get, you know, pretty seasonal winters, like it might be 60 or 50 on Christmas, I would imagine, but uh, you're there in Ohio in December. It's a whole different ball game. What does that just say about the brand that Ohio State has now to go into the state of Florida and grab the number one play in America and get pen to paper from Jeremiah Smith? Well, they're quite good at it. You know, they went last year and got Carnell Tate from IMG. Now, he's from Chicago. He played at IMG Academy. Brandon Ennis from yep. American Heritage in, San, in South Florida last year. Now, Jeremiah Smith this year. Uh, they'll recruit the best players. But I think, honestly, I think Heartline starts – looking for guys in, in Florida. He loves to recruit that state when it comes to skill guys and receivers. He's had some success there. And his resume speaks for itself. I, I do think it's funny you mentioned, you know, going to Ohio from South Florida, the weather difference and what you could play in potentially being snow, cold, whatnot, wind, uh, and so on. I, I was told by someone that maybe his family, the one thing they didn't like about Ohio State was maybe the weather. You know, they, they could stay at Florida State, Miami, or Florida and play in relatively sunny, somewhat warm weather throughout mm -hmm. the, the fall. Um, but for Jeremiah, I was always told, man, by multiple people, if this was his decision and his decision only, he wanted to go play at Ohio State. And I think he made that pretty clear. Yeah. And now his teammate, JoJo Trader, who is very good in his own right, he signed with the Hurricanes. Was that a factor at all? Was, was JoJo in his ear down the stretch? I don't think so. Those guys are so close, and they're great. For, I never forget, like two years ago at an Under Armour All-American camp, they're sitting side by side. They're both talking about the <laughs> camp before it starts. They're both putting on, strapping on those Ohio State gloves. So I kind of go there, tap them on the shoulder. I say, if I want to put like a little early you know, on three RPM 
on you guys? Are these gloves kind of matching up? Will you guys stay together? Uh, and they say, yeah, we love to play together, but we're not going to push each other to follow one or the other. And that they kind of made it clear, look, we love to be together. So I'm sure JoJo, you know, hinted to Jeremiah, come play at the U, stay with me, let's stay together. Um, but I don't think there was pressure like that at all. Massive, absolutely massive. Again, you want to get the last Hayes Fawcett graphic. And if you're on the Twitter sphere right now, if you're following Hayes Fawcett, like we encourage you to do earlier in the show, that last grass, that last graphic has dropped as pen has met paper for Jeremiah Smith. Make sure he's headed to make Ohio sure State. Hayes uh, Photoshop has enough ink left in it. I don't think we're done just yet. <laughs> yeah, I think there's going to be a few more graphics yet to drop today. Uh, Josh, surprise feels like the wrong word, but your your overall thoughts on Jeremiah mm -hmm. Smith ultimately sticking with Ohio State well, and fighting I, off the in-state You schools. know, I think that Florida State insiders felt really good going down the stretch about a flip. Uh, I personally, maybe just looking at it from above, I thought that Jeremiah Smith was going to stick. It kind of goes back to a conversation you and I had this morning when you're, if you're an elite recruit and you want to take the less risk route, mm -hmm. if you're a if you're an offensive lineman, you're probably going to go to Alabama or Georgia. It's the less, it's the least amount of risk to get you to the NFL. And if you're a wide receiver, you're going to Ohio State. Yeah. If I want to be an actor, I go to Juilliard or I go find somewhere they're going to develop me. If I, if I want to be and a it's chef. it's not to say that you couldn't do it another way. But right now, Chad Simmons has some scoops. So let's go to Chad How Simmons. About it? Yeah, just getting the confirmation going back to earlier. Ryan Wingo is signing right now with the University of Texas. He stayed. Uh -huh. uh, Missouri made a run. He did hear from Nebraska as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but just got confirmation from the Wingo family that right now he is putting the ink to the paper. Um, to the University of Texas. Yeah. And, now, we wow. thought Mizzou was going to have a shot to sign the best players in the state. They did land Williams Winery, one of the top defensive linemen in America, the top defensive linemen in the state of Missouri. But Ryan Wingo gets out. Now, that wasn't completely unexpected. Texas did a really, really good job of recruiting him. But there were points throughout this where Missouri was considered a likely destination. I wouldn't ever say the favorite, but a very likely destination. And then there was a lot of buzz this morning. And that's kind of what happens, JD. A lot of times, if you're a commit and you're if you're a recruit and you're committing to an out-of-state school, it might sound great in the moment. It might sound great for ten months, but when it gets down to that moment where you got to put pen to paper and you got to say bye to your parents and all your friends and you got to move five states away, it becomes real in that moment. And sure. no matter what you do throughout, it just right up to that moment, you really never know with these kids. No, Josh, I think you're 100% on the money. And it kind of goes in that same vein of the conversation we just had about Jeremiah Smith. If I want to play wide receiver and I want to play wide yeah. receiver in the NFL, I'm looking at what Adonai Mitchell just did this year, what Xavier Worthy just did this year. In Nebraska and Missouri, not to say you couldn't do it at those places, but you talk about yeah. making a choice for your future. feels like it makes the most sense. Uh, Chad, I want to get your thoughts on this with Ryan Wingo. With Two of uh, two two big time wide receivers coming off the board here and giving their signature to their future schools. Was it was it close at the end there with Ryan Wingo with the late buzz or was it kind of always Texas and it was never really too much of a sweat for the folks in Austin? Yeah, I don't think it was too close late. I think they obviously listened. I think Missouri backed off somewhat and kind of respected that commitment hmm. initially um, to Texas when he made that. I think it was much closer when he committed to Texas over Missouri at the time that happened than it was here these last couple hours on signing day. I think Texas did a good job answering those questions. And, you know, I think Wingo, out of respect, you know, listened to the last pitch last night from Missouri, gave it a little bit of thought. But from what I've been told, no real hesitation with Texas. He's pretty locked in. And what we're saying about, you know, being able to play in a proven system under Steve Sarkeesian, feel pretty good about having a quarterback there, whether it's Arch Manning or Quinn Ewers this time next year. Uh, were those the factors that ultimately got him to go to Austin, or were there other things involved as well? Yeah, I obviously think those things you just mentioned, J.D., played a factor. I mean, the offense, you know, is undeniable what Sark does and how he dials things up. So creative, uh, getting his guys the football and, and, and making his guys look good on that big stage. I think, you know, obviously the quarterback, I mean, I was told by multiple people, Arch played a role. He hung out with Arch on his official visit to Texas. We went back for a game. He was around Arch after the game some as well. And then that receiver room uh, was big also. He knows guys on there have come in as true freshmen this year uh, and played some, and he has some connections there. I think also the city of Austin, uh, just the opportunities uh, on and off the field in Austin also factored in. Awesome. Well, Chad, we appreciate you keeping us dialed in. I know the bat phone is, is going to stay vibrating throughout the course of the day, but we appreciate you dropping the well, intel. If you hear it buzzing in the next 10, 15 minutes, it's that Buford buzz because we're about – 30 minutes or so. Very close. From that Buford High School announcement. It's about to happen. Which is going to have in it.
a major impact on the top 10. I mean, we could see some things shift here or there. If we could throw up that top 10 right now, I think we got an updated one after the commitment of Jeremiah Smith. But these Buford commitments are going to make a difference because if K.J. Bolden bounces out of this Florida State class, they're hanging on right now at number three. We could see them fall out of the top five. Then we got Edric Houston potentially flipping to Alabama. We got to, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of moving pieces still, and the pivot point is going to take place at Buford High School in about uh, 25, 30 minutes. Again, that timestamp, keep an eye on it. You got to feel good if you're Ohio State, being able to hang on to Jeremiah Smith and stay in that four spot, yeah. even with the flip of uh, another Jeremiah yeah. this morning from uh, losing him over and to And like Eugene. I said, in an hour, Ohio State could find them in the top themselves in the top three just by doing nothing and having K.J. Bolden flipping from Florida State to Georgia. So we'll see what happens here. Or Florida State to Auburn. Uh, so we'll see what happens here. Now, Jeremiah Smith did stick to his commitment and sign with Ohio State. Will K.J. Bolden, will he do the same? We're going to find out. We're going to find out. Well, speaking of the the, uh, the Buckeyes, let's go take a look at them right now, Josh, because they were, as of last night, sitting there at number three, slid down to number four right before we started the show, able to land a guy like Jeremiah Smith. Obviously huge. Jeremiah McClellan there at the bottom of the screen, no longer committed to the Buckeyes, lost him this morning to Oregon. But even so, man, a still enormously solid class. When you talk about Ohio State, I feel like the, the same headlines that you think about them from previous years are still true right now. Tons of skill talent. Landed a big-time quarterback, still have a plethora of wide receivers, but also have some uh, some key pieces on the defensive side of the ball, yeah, two they, elite corners. And they locked down the top corners at Glenville High School. You know, you got Bryce West, you got Aaron Scott Jr. These are, these are the type of players that come from in-state. They stay at Ohio State. When Ohio State's on top, they're locking these guys down. And don't discount Mylon Graham either. I mean, I know they lost Jeremiah McClellan, but they signed Jeremiah Smith. They signed Mylon Graham. I mean, they have a stable of elite wide receivers. They got Air Nolan coming in. And, and I don't expect Air Nolan to make an impact year one, but I think Chad hit on something that cannot go unsaid. Air Nolan is a winner. And in so much about high school to college football is about knowing how to win ball games. And that's all Air Nolan knows how to do. And I think one of the things that sticks out to me there, Josh, too, we mentioned the defensive side of the ball. Thinking about who's coming into the conference next year right. with Oregon, with Washington, with USC, schools that like to throw the pigskin around the yard. You got to have some guys in the secondary to hold it down and land in two big time corners. That's a great step in the right direction. It getting that is done. absolutely an arms race. I really like Jalen McClain, who they land, landed out of New Jersey. I mean, they have a really good secondary. They bring back some players, but this this class that's coming in has a bunch of difference makers in it. Josh, when you look at this Ohio State class, like I said, the same headlines are usually true. Great wide receiver talent. You're going to have a great quarterback, but with the way that things have gone for Ohio State the last couple of seasons, they expect to beat Michigan, they expect to win the Big yeah. Ten, and they expect to win national championships. Do you think they took a different approach in building this class as opposed to the last couple of seasons? It's an arms race. At the end of the day, it's an arms race. You can't rebuild. You have to reload. This time of year is about reloading if you're Ohio State, and I think that's what they're doing. Do they go to the transfer portal to find a quarterback to bridge the gap to Air Nolan? I don't know. It seems like that would be a good move, but hey, We'll see what happens. I think Ohio State is recruiting at an elite level. Maybe they had a couple misses on the D line, so maybe that's in a that's an area that they address. You know, Justin Scott flips to Miami. They they weren't able to land a guy like a Dylan Stewart. He ends up at South Carolina. At one point, you know, we thought he was trending towards Ohio State. But overall, yeah, a, a an outstanding class for Ohio State. When you talk about Ohio State, we talk about you know, the quarterback position. And now we're saying, well, hey, do they go to the portal to land a guy? I know there was a lot of buzz around who they may go after in that portal market. They still got Devin Brown, who was the number one player in his own cycle. Yeah. Lincoln Keenholz, who was phenomenal we're very high school high on career. Lincoln a guy, so there's they're still options in Columbus, kind of a champagne problem. But if it you might will. be just a bridge the gap type of guy. Sure. You know, sure. like a Cam, a Cam Ward. We've heard a lot about him. And, you know, there's guys out there that you could land to get you one year to some of these younger quarterbacks. And very convenient, Josh. Uh, a lot of portal buzz happening under the cover of National Signing Day. As we're getting ready to go on the show, you see some big commitments from some uh, I think some there's a strategy big involved names. in that as well. Hey, just kind of slipping it under the table. Hey, by the way, I'm going here. Y'all enjoy signing day, but I'm going to this place. Well, I think you might see a lot more portal action after National Signing Day because if you're a head coach, we know how much depth charts affect recruits decisions if you're a head coach and you know hey i got this great group of wide receivers coming in as freshmen 
but I'm, I want this really, this really good wide receiver in the portal. Maybe you're telling him, hey, hold off. Just do me a favor. Hold off until after National Signing Day. Let's get these recruits signed, and then let's announce your commitment. So I think there's a bit of that going on. Now, not everywhere. So there's a lot of these transfer portal guys that can punch their own ticket. They're just going to announce where they're going. But I do think we're going to see an uptick in transfer portal action after National Signing Day. Josh, when it comes to this class for Ohio State, 21 commitments, yeah. or right around 20 commitments, I suppose. At this point in time, seven of those individuals from Ohio State. So roughly a third of the class from the state yeah, of Ohio. 35%. The that's, that's average, an edge. The average distance away is 438 miles, but they have built 35% of this signing class from within the state of Ohio. That's, that's very good. Well, I was about to ask you, in a place like Ohio State, where the state of Ohio, there's so much pride around the rivalry and the blue-collar edge and being from the Buckeye State, like... Is that something you're reading into at all when you're looking at this this class that Ryan Day is landing? Oh, absolutely. I, I you know, this team, the, these guys, they got to go out and beat Michigan. And yeah. this is the class that's going to be, you know, Ryan Day's, I don't want to say his tenure, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but hey, they've got to start beating Michigan. And some of these guys are on here. That's why you get the guys from Ohio, because they mm -hmm. understand the importance of that rivalry. And if 35% of your class hates Michigan, well, that's going to rub off on some of the other guys. It come out of the womb hating me. <laughs> right. like, like, I know a lot of those guys, once they step foot on campus, you kind of get indoctrinated of, hey, we don't talk about that other team, the team that wears maize and blue and all that. I'm here for that. But I think there's something to be said for just what you said, yeah. for being able to be born into the rivalry and to already it have a side picked it, out. You know, it helps in those rivalry games. We see it all the time in the state of Florida, right? Like, oh, all these guys, they played together. Whenever Miami and Florida State play or, or Florida and, and Miami, these guys all played together at one point. So they, there's a different dynamic when you can get in-state guys to represent your school. They're wearing the logo a little bit differently. And we talk about Ryan Day a lot on this show when it comes to, you know, how he's taken Ohio State and made it sort of his own operation. The way that he's recruited these last couple of years, and this class being no exception, currently in the top five, there's so much made around, well, he was born on third base from Urban Meyer and this and that. It's like, look at the recruiting rankings. Look at what he's it's, doing bringing in top hey, talent. Like, he's crushing it. But making then his they own also team. say you never want to be the coach that is the first in line after the legend. You want, to, you want there to be a little buffer. And Ryan Day has taken all that head on, the expectations, everything, and he's dealt with it the best he can. He's still recruiting at a very high level, despite all the stuff that people are saying about him, despite the fact that they lose to Michigan. They are still up there with 20 commitments in a top five class. Yeah, they're still rolling. So the good folks in Columbus, the expectations are extremely high. Tons of pressure, but pressure is privilege. And they have earned that pressure by nature of what they've been here the last few years under Ryan Day. Now let's go back to Buford, Josh, yeah. because Edric Houston is currently committed to Ohio State. And we're going to see where he ends up signing. Uh, but when it comes to Buford, him and K.J. Bolden, any any other last thoughts before they eventually put oh, pen to paper I here? I think Ohio State, I mean, you you got, you got look at they lost Justin Scott, a five-star defensive lineman, to Miami. Last year, Mateo Uyunglele, thought, we all thought the defensive lineman from California was going to go to Ohio State. He does not. They lose him at the last minute. They lose Lightfoot, Marquise Lightfoot to Miami. They've been battling up front. And they need to secure this one. Edric Houston would be a monumental miss at this point out of Buford High School, bringing him up to Ohio State. But, hey, the pressure to stay closer to home is real, and this is kind of what these recruits are dealing with on days like today. And it's an Ohio State Bama race, it sounds like, for Edric Houston services. Uh, let's take a look at what's going on with Alabama because Alabama has a, has a path here to find their way into they that do. very top spot in the on three industry team recruiting in rankings by the end of today. The very first thing they got to do yep. is flip Edric Houston. Yep. So that is that is number one. They also have to flip Arian Hampton. They're going to have to land a running back, whether that's Jaden Ball or Kevin Riley, they're going to have to flip him. And one of the keys is for UGA, who's sitting at number one, not to sign KJ Bolden. Huge. Because I think if look, if KJ Bolden goes to Georgia, that's just the icing on the cake. Mathematically, they probably clinch that number one spot. But as it stands, and it's got to start with Edric Houston flipping, there is a mathematical path for Alabama to capture that number one spot. You know Nick Saban with the competitive juice that he has. Like, I'm sure he's not upset with the number two class, but he talks about signing day. Like, we, we want to win signing day. We want to be the number one class in the country. Josh, they have not been outside the top two more than once 
since 2011. One time since yeah. 2011 have the tie been outside the top two. And the, trenches, the trenches are so important. Last year, it was Caden Proctor flipping the night before signing day. Today, the big flip, it could be in the trenches yet again. Edric Houston to Alabama. Now, we're just waiting on it. I think we're about 15 minutes from Buford going live with their ceremony. That doesn't mean we're going to hear from Edric Houston in 15 minutes. We know, like Chad said, Buford could have a dozen players signing today. So we don't know exactly the order in which K.J. Bolden and Edric Houston. Hey, if I'm Buford High School, I'm leaving them until the end. Without question. No, yeah, we're, we're making sure we get all the retention we can out of that ceremony and making sure we keep those seats full for as long as possible. Uh, looking at this class, Josh, my first thoughts was like, hey, Bama going to Bama. Right. Like, as long as Nick Saban's running the show there and he's up into his 70s now, but every single year the coordinators change, the personnel changes. I mean, not every single year, but you hear what I'm saying. You know, yeah. Over the course of time, the constant has been Nick Saban. How does he how does he keep doing it? I mean, it's it's like the breaking bad scene where Jesse Pinkman says he can't keep getting away with it. Nick Saban keeps getting away with it regardless of what's going on in college football. He lands a top two class. I think a lot of it is he put the work in early. You know, you you have a proof of concept. At almost every level of that defense or offense, you can say, hey, they have a track record of putting guys like me into the NFL. And when it comes to making that decision, if you want to, like we talked about, if it comes down to, hey, I know I'm an elite player and I can go anywhere, well, the less risky path would be for me to go to Alabama because of their track record, because of their proof of concept, and because of the stability of Nick Saban. Now, Nick Saban, how many more years does he have? But it hasn't affected recruiting. We hear it every year. We hear it every year, negative recruiting. That's how you negative recruit Alabama, but it's still not impacting them. You know why? Because Alabama wins. And winning in recruiting is the best thing that you can do. You know, you talk about depth charts and, and, and availability at Auburn. Well, the one way to trump depth charts, look, Alabama has loaded depth charts. Why are kids still going there? Because they win. Yeah. And that is how, that's the ultimate way to recruit. You can, you can find shortcuts to a quick burst through NIL or a coaching change, but in the long run, the best way to recruit is to win ball games, and nobody does it better than Alabama. He's going to be the first coach to coach until he's 100 years old, Will Nick Saban, because <laughs> the way he's recruiting right now, the way they're winning right now, uh, zero sign of slowing down. And Josh, the way that they've done it too in putting this class together, we talked about it earlier in the show, they went out to the best coast to land yep. a few guys. Julian Sane from Carlsbad, uh, Peyton Woodyard from St. John Bosco in Bellflower, California. Xavier Brown. Brown out of modern day California. Yeah, we're <laughs> synced up, baby. Two guys out of the Trinity. Yeah, right it only took us an hour and a half to get there. there we, we were go. synced up. Yeah. Exactly. They what do you say about the brand of Bama, the country? Casey Poe, they go into Texas. They're a national brand. Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, when Peyton Woodyard, you know, that's what happens. When you, when you play great football in the South, it's kind of like you said, hey, do I want to be an actor? Am I going to go to Juilliard or am I going to go pay this guy five bucks and go to his garage and take a couple lessons from him? If you're Peyton Woodyard, you know, hey, you're going to go play. You want to challenge yourself. If you're if you think, hey, I'm the best player in California, a lot of these guys want to say, well, I'm the best player in the world, so I'm going to go play football in the South. Great. And that's what you're seeing. And Alabama has attracted that type of player. And it, it's just, it's caught, it, it, the ball gets rolling downhill. You get this momentum. And I'm not saying that Alabama doesn't put the work in. You got to put the work in every cycle. But when you get it rolling like this, you kind of get the benefit of the doubt sometimes. Elite attracts elite. And their quarterback, Julian Sayan, number one quarterback in the country. He is the definition of elite. How big was that to get your quarterback of the future in Julian Sayan uh, in the boat for the Tide? It's all. It's always the pillar of a class, you know. Julian saying, and at the time it was a discussion: Is Dylan Raiola number one? Is Julian saying number one? Julian saying comes out on top. But hey, he he. A lot of what Chad said. Julian saying carries himself really well. He's not about the games. He's about his business. It's a great fit for Alabama. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, you kind of there was that one viral video that you saw when he was on a visit at Miami, and uh, the coach was trying to negative recruit him. He didn't jump up and say anything. The camera happened to be on him. He just rolled his eyes because he knows, hey, I'm going to Alabama. I'm going to be a winner. He went classic Jim from the office there. It was one of those where the, the, the camera like zoomed in on his, on his expression, and you, he, he told you all he needed to know by not saying a word. Yeah. Uh, Chad, I want to get your thoughts on this because you're a guy who's talked to a lot of these recruits, and they come down to their decision on where they're going to the SEC. A lot of these guys that commit to Alabama – College football has changed a lot over the course of like even just the past five years. Nick Saban's in his 70s, but the way that he recruits, the elite talent he's landed, that has not changed. Why is that? What about his messaging resonates with these kids? 
I mean, just those rings in his office. I think once he gets them in that in that room and they look in there and they see all those rings lined up, I mean, look, the proof's in the pudding. He don't have to say a whole lot. You know, Nick Saban is Nick Saban, you know, regarded as the GOAT by most, you know, that watch college football or cover college football or most experts out there. I mean, uh, he's been around and, and he can still relate and, and kids trust in him. Look, the end goal is still the same. NIL is a factor. It's still new. It's evolving. But – the end goal is to play on Sundays and compete for championships and be developed. You know, those are all still factors in these kids' decisions to go along with the NIL now as the extra uh, you know, kind of piece of the puzzle. You know, but I think with Nick Saban, just his track record, I mean, uh, how he just continues to roll in new coaches. You know, he, he lose guys to be new head coaches. He finds the next guy to be great in the system. I mean, and I think it all starts at the top with Nick Saban. I mean, he's got the structure. He's got the culture. Uh, he has that environment, and that's not going to change no matter who is helping him on that staff as long as he is the head of that football program. And, Chad, I mean, you just said it a second ago, like the common denominator has been Nick Saban, and there's probably an understanding for a lot of these kids that sign with Alabama that, hey, my, my position coach, my coordinator, there's a lot of schools that might be wanting to get him to be the head coach at another yeah. school. How do, how do those conversations go with the kids understanding, like, hey, if I go to Alabama, my coach may or may not be the same guy that recruits me? It goes back to Nick Saban. They, they trust Nick Saban, not just to coach them while they're there, but also put them in good hands with their position coach or coordinators to call the right plays, put them in the right scheme defensively, and coach them up and develop them. I think it just comes down to one simple word, and that's trust. Trust Nick Saban uh, as the coach, the leader of that program. Mm. Unreal. Bama gonna Bama. And he's, and he's got Bama. a great track record of making great hires, whether they come from promotions from within or bringing in somebody from outside the Bama network. Uh, teams, players, recruits give Nick Saban the benefit of the doubt there. Unbelievable. Like I said, last signing day, I believe after the dust settled on the second signing period, it was like Bama essentially had no coordinators. Still the number one still class rolling. in the country. <laughs> Coordinator list, they are still rolling. Did not miss a beat. Did not miss a beat to the tide and uh, mm. kind of what we come to expect from them. So we're expecting to hopefully get some word here on what's going on in Buford here in the very future. it could have a big impact. Uh, run yeah, that top ten that. again. Let's take a look at it that. It could have a big impact on this top ten because, like we said, for Alabama to become the number one team in the country at the end of the day, they're going to need Edric Houston. They're going to need a couple other things, but let's first check that first box off of Edric Houston flipping from Ohio State to Alabama. Then you got Florida State. Now, the Buford boys are going to have a big impact here, too, because if K.J. Bolden flips to Georgia, one, it's probably solid. No, it, pro it definitely solidifies Georgia as the number one team mathematically, and it starts Florida State's free fall. And I say starts because it could only be the, the beginning of what could be a rough day if Armando Blunt, their other, their only five-star defensive lineman commitment. If he flips to Miami like everybody thinks, that could be two five-stars flipping out of their class on signing day, and you could see Florida State battling to hang in the top 10. Well, let's talk about that a little bit with Florida State because I think with them, so much of the, the talking points with them have been, well, they're, they're still getting there on the field, and until they get there on the field, then they're going to start seeing some results on the recruiting trail. Yeah. And, and I think they are seeing some results. I mean, Mike Norvell, one of the knocks on Mike Norvell heading into this cycle was, hey, he needs to recruit the high school level better. And they have. They have. They've been doing that. That's why they're a top three class right now. But it doesn't matter what you do for 12 months if on that one day you don't sign them. And today, you know, they're going to be tested. They're going to be tested at Buford. They're going to be tested with Armando Blunt, who's at Miami Central. And we're just going to have to see if they can hang on to not just the top five, but the top 10. And regardless of what happens today, there's still, a, you know, they got Cam Davis, one of the best backs in the country. They got Luke Cromenhawk, who they like a lot. They have Charles Lester, one of the top corners in the country. Uh, they have Landon Thomas, one of the top tight ends in the country. They are putting together a stellar class. But when it comes to stacking talent amongst the greats like Alabama and Texas and Georgia and Ohio State, there's a difference. you got to finish on signing day. And we're all such just prisoners of the moment because last year, Florida State, they were sitting there at number 21 in yep. the industry team recruiting ranks. And now we're saying, hey, they, they might fall somewhere lower in the top 10. So, I mean, it really is a testament to the way yeah. they, they've battled this point It in the is, season. but when you go 13-0, and 0, you, you think that you're going to finish strong on the recruiting. Sure. Year on the recruiting trail. I don't think it at 13 and 0 
they thought it was going to be a slight fizzle down the stretch. I mean, I thought, you, or they thought that it was going to be more, there's going to be more fireworks today. Let's sure. just say that. But well, still a very good class, yes. Well, we talk about them being tested. They've also done a fair amount of the testing when it comes to what they've done on the recruiting trail. Four-star tight end Landon Thomas yep. flipped him uh, from Georgia. Uh, Charles Lester, the four-star corner, went a battle with Coach Prime toe-to-toe there. Boy, and to that one, him. That he was did even a little trolling this morning. Charles Lester tweets out because look everybody's expecting coach prime to make some splash and i'll be honest heading into today i thought if coach prime was going to make a splash that nobody saw coming i thought maybe just maybe it'll be charles lester charles lester was expected to sign at 7 a.m at about 7 30 a.m he puts out a tweet saying i'm going to sign on friday <laughs> moments later just the florida the state sinking. seminal university account countered with a tweet saying that Charles Lester was indeed signed, sealed, and delivered. So even down to the very last minute, Charles Lester's still playing games on Twitter, but he is a officially a seminal. We'll see your tweet, and we'll raise you one of you actually signing to the school. <laughs> uh, now, how dangerous does this make Florida State, Josh? Because in the state of Florida, with just the talent hotbed that that place is, to be the school now that's doing what they're doing on the field, and then now to have some momentum on the recruiting trail, like – the way that I'm seeing this thing potentially compound on itself, if they keep recruiting in the top 10 even for Mike Novell and company, mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to be a routine visitor to that college football playoff when it, when it goes to 12. Yeah, and you also got to factor in that they're one of the uh, Portal King teams, you yep. know, whether it be Lane Kiffin, Deion Sanders, or Mike Norvell, all three coaches utilize the Portal and have found great success. So, like you said, Florida State signed a top 20 class last year, and then they went into the Portal and really made a difference. So, now, with a top 10 class supplement the Portal, portal complement the portal to to what you signed in this class yeah i think florida state it, right now you know it looked like all three teams heading into the season all three in-state teams miami florida florida state were all trying to find their footing like who's going to be the team that kind of breaks out of this lull that all three florida teams were in and it looks like florida state kind of broke through that ceiling a little bit miami with another great recruiting class coming up behind them and then you got florida and if dj lagway is that guy that we think he is i don't think the florida gators are too far behind either it's it's a, a battle to say the least when it comes to everything going on in the sunshine state chad be curious to get your thoughts on this when it comes to how florida state is perceived because we talked about where they were last year being right around in that you know top 25 range this year finding themselves very comfortably in the top 10. what is the the buzz around florida state with recruits right now i think simply put that norvell's doing what he said he was going to do you know and that's build that program back up that was his message i think from day one uh, when he got the job is just to be patient. Let me get my guys in, whether it's portal or high school recruits. Uh, and he's built on that the last couple of years to now, you know, ACC championship. You know, some think a top four should be program in the country uh, in the college football playoffs. But I think that's the biggest thing that he's shown is that he came in and said, I want to show you what we can do at Florida mm -hmm. State with me as the head coach. And I think – what he did last year, nine wins this year, you know, ACC championship, um, the proof is there. And I think kids are starting to buy in that to that and recognize that. I think that's been the business, biggest message uh, is him just showing him, like, look, be patient. Let me show you. Give me some time. And here we are now, ACC championship undefeated season. All right. So we're – well, we're in the Buford zone right now. Do you have any last-minute intel on K.J. Bolden or Edric Houston? We're in the zone for them to commit at any moment. Yeah, everything's still the same for me. Still hearing the most when talking about K.J. Bolden. I've heard nothing that's taking me away from Georgia being the team that's trending here late in the process, you know, really kind of taking control based on what I'm hearing today of his recruitment with the best chance to flip him from Florida State. And then with Edric, the same way. You know, this time mm -hmm. a day ago, thinking more about Ohio State holding on, but based on the last 24 hours and specifically today, the first half of today, I think Bama has a great shot to flip him from Ohio State. Should be an interesting yeah. hour that we're entering. The Buford zone. I like that. We're in the Buford Welcome zone. Welcome to the Buford it, it zone. Was, they said it was going to happen at 1 p.m. Eastern. It is 101 p.m. Eastern. Now, we don't expect this to be quick because Buford has a lot of talented players that are going to be signing with teams all across the country. So this could be kind of one of those long-awaiting processes to hear, to hear his 
commitment, but I'm just waiting for Chad to throw that hand up. I'm just, yeah, Once I, I see the, that hand up, we know we got action. It's well, there's like another guy. We're, we're watching a Darius Hayes, too, right now around the same, like, 115-ish oh. Eastern time. You know, he, he's going with, if he goes to Miami or stays with Florida, so he's right there in this bunch as well. Could we have three major flips in like a 15, 20, 30-minute window? It's like Randy Moss. Whenever you throw the hand up, it's like, hey, get him the ball. It doesn't matter the coverage. It doesn't matter what you think is going on. It doesn't matter the segment. We're getting the ball to our guy, Chad Simmons, throw it whenever up. that hand goes up there. So we're keeping an eye on KJ Bull and Edric Houston. Uh, Josh, this would be interesting because we got two guys from SEC country that were previously going to leave SEC country if right. we want to talk about Florida State being in the ACC and Ohio yep. State obviously in the Big Ten. That would be coming back to the SEC country should that totally you know, end up being the case with Edric Houston in Alabama and K.J. Bolden to Georgia. What does it say about the SEC being able to keep guys like that home? I mean, the NFL numbers and the way that the draft shakes out, I mean, speaks volumes in itself. Uh, is that an SEC thing? Is it program specific? I mean, what do you think about yeah, those guys if they kids, stay that way? I think kids grow up wanting to prove themselves, not just play, but I think there's a bit of that. When you're an elite recruit, you want to prove yourself, right? And if you're going to prove yourself in any league, hey, let's do it in the SEC. I mean, you see kids from California and all over the country coming to the South to play their football, and they used to come to Florida. And when the Florida teams were on, were on that's, where, that's the destination. But more recently, it's been Alabama. It's been Georgia. I mean, look at what Auburn's doing right now. A lot of that also has to do with the fact that they are an SEC power, or trying to be, and they are battling for some of these elite recruits, and they want to they want a spot in the SEC. So, yes, I do think that, they're, that the conference prestige does play into recruiting. Well, hey, we just prefaced it a second ago. Saw out of the peripheral vision, the hand goes up, oh, so we get the, the ball to our I'm guy. Sorry. Chad Simmons, what's the latest, brother? Well, this one happened a little bit sooner than we thought. Jaden Baugh has signed with the University of Florida, or committed to the University of Florida. Uh, this was a Bama-Florida battle late. I heard at one time Bama had the edge maybe as Monday evening. Uh, he was leaning towards going to Tuscaloosa, the school he just took a visit to over the weekend uh, after thinking about things on Tuesday. Uh, went with the Gators, um, Jabbar Jalut, the running back coach, did a great job there recruiting him. One time Arkansas commit. Think about Jaden Ba. He's been recruited to play running back, linebacker. He's a versatile athlete from the Atlanta area, Columbia High School. Uh, the Gators went hard after him and landed a good one today. That's big time right there for Billy Napier being able to pick up Jaden Ba. Anytime you win a, a battle on the recruiting trail, over Alabama and Nick Saban like that, that means a little something now. He's going to join, uh, presumably, DJ Lagway and the rest of that class over there in Gainesville. Um, what was the deciding factor here? Was it, was it relational? Was it the, the ability to, to play in an up-and-coming spot like Florida and kind of you know, be a – you got to push Florida back to where they expect them to be? What, what was the deciding factor, ultimately, for Jaden Baugh signing with the Gators? Yeah, I know he likes Coach DeLuc a lot, the running backs coach and old head high school coach. I covered his kids in high school back in Louisiana, back in New Orleans days, you know, a decade ago. And uh, he's a guy that can relate to these young men, ball connected with him. Uh, he also spoke really highly of Billy Napier. I talked about talked to Ball last night about his decision upcoming today to Florida, and he mentioned Napier, his vision, uh, his detail as a head coach, uh, and what he kind of sees as the vision for the program. I think all those things were factors uh, for Ball in this decision. Again, he went back and forth. Bama was right there as well, uh, and at one time, I would have named them the favorite uh, based on what I was being told from a source, but uh, Florida kind of gained that ground yesterday, took control last night, and got him in this class today. Mm -hmm. Second running back committed in this class. They landed Kanan Daniels a couple months ago, and he's out of the state of Mississippi. Jaden Ball, though, man, that is quite a turn of events. Florida landing him over Alabama. Now, that decommitment, that was one of the big storylines just 48 hours out. Arkansas loses Jaden Ball. Looks like he's going to go to Alabama. Signs with Florida. We love to see it. Signing day excitement. A lot of excitement. I think a lot of more excitement right now in Gainesville. Uh, we'll have to wait till the uh, the final rankings come out. But hey, just perusing the website here, it looks like Florida is sitting in that seven spot where they came into today at number eight yeah. in the on three. They team moved up a spot so, up with that spot. one, and we'll see what happens. Now they got to hold on to LJ McCray to remain in the top ten. But hey, there's a couple more pieces out there that the Gators could move up with. I mean, we we talked about Zay Mincy. There's a chance. Uh, he could join his teammate L.J. McCray on that commit list. He's going to make that decision January 6th. But he's one of the few top 100 prospects that remains uncommitted. And the Gators got a shot at him sitting at number seven. Maybe they march back towards a top five class. They were really sitting at number three or four for much of this cycle. 
Yeah, and I think that's a great place for us to kind of jump into the conversation with the Gators because I understand the way that it went on the field was less than ideal for yeah. the folks in Gainesville, but I keep being told college football is a game of talent acquisition. And then I keep seeing Billy Napier do good things on the talent acquisition side of things, and most recently landing a guy like Jaden Bond having a top 10 class as it stands right now, even without the proof of concept on the field at this point. Just your overall feel in this class right now, Josh, uh, as it stands at the time of us being live. Well, they're hanging on. Uh, they still have to hold on to linebacker at Darius Hayes, who Chad just said he's set to make his decision here any minute. So that'll be a big one. And that kind of could, you know, if they if they are able to hold on to a Darius Hayes here, this is a phenomenal class. Even without him, I mean, it's not going to make or break this class. You still got a lot of weapons. You love Mylon Graham. He's coming in a legacy recruit. You guys, some of the older viewers might remember Ernest Graham. He was a running back at Florida. Or at Florida. And his son, Miles Graham, is one of the best linebackers in America. And he's coming. He's the number five ranked linebacker, number 61 overall in the country. So not just DJ Lagway here to talk about. They really put together a good class. And if LJ McCray can stick, this is an elite class because he is the number one defensive lineman and he is he's been committed for for some time now. It would be a huge miss, but still hanging there. Still, still hanging. hanging there. So we'll see what happens. Swinging big are the Gators. And like we talked about already different points in this show, DJ Lagway, the five star plus quarterback taking his talents to Gainesville. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that as soon as he uh, has pen meet paper. Uh, We're but, expecting him around, I think, 4.30. So I don't okay. know if we'll actually be okay. on air when DJ Lagway makes it official, but... We're sweating it out. Yeah, I mean, another reason to subscribe. I mean, I, I don't know exactly. Here, that's a great place for us to kind of jump to Chad here and get, and get a gauge for this. Uh, Chad, DJ Lagway, been a guy who has, it seemed like from the outside looking in, been fairly solid with uh, his Florida commitment. I know other schools are trying to throw their hat in the ring here. I know Mike Elko got, a, got an in-home in there from a and uh, Where do things stand as of right now with, with a DJ Lagway? Is it still Florida feeling pretty good about where they sit? Yeah, I think so, based on what I've heard, and obviously following Sam Spiegelman's lead, too. I mean, I, I've talked to people also, but he's got a great pulse of that recruitment, uh, being out there in Texas and very familiar with, with Lagway and his people. But uh, one source told me last night that they don't, Florida feels confident, you know, holding on to Lagway. Just the relationship, you know, obviously the chance to play, the NIL factor, the face of the program. Uh, they have a lot of things going in their favor. Uh, I think USC has been the hotter school uh, when talk about who could potentially flip uh, mm -hmm. with Malachi Nelson going into the portal, things opening up out there at USC under Lincoln Riley. Uh, he's always been high on Riley, his offensive scheme and what he's done with quarterbacks uh, in the past. But still, based on what I've heard, I think mm -hmm. Florida is still in a good position to hang on to DJ Lagway. Mm. When it comes to Florida, I know we're talking so much around them trying to keep who they have in-house. Uh, is there anyone that Florida's maybe going after pretty heavily on the offensive side of things? They're maybe trying to bring over to Gainesville. They don't yet have committed at this point. You know, I think they'll be probably more than likely the portal, you know, going yep. in there looking for guys to a place that, you know, running back, receiver guys, uh, offensive weapons. I mean, they did a good job offensively getting a guy like um, Amir Jackson. Uh, he's a guy that uh, – that Auburn tried to flip, you know, different schools were involved with. Um, and, um, and, and that was a big get for them on the offensive mm -hmm. side. What happened with Florida and Jordan Seaton? It seemed like for a while there, they were considered maybe the favorite, them in Alabama. Did they kind of slip down the stretch with Jordan Seaton? With Seaton, I don't know if they really, you know, fell off a little bit, but I, I just think he started identifying what was most important to him and what he's looking for in his, his recruitment, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, was it development? Was it playing early? Which one weighed out more? I think obviously development, you know, Bama speaks for itself there, um, you know, with their player development from offensive tackles. I mean, could he be that next Caden Proctor step right in and play right away? Uh, or uh, do you have to sit behind Caden Proctor or battle mm -hmm. guys ahead of him and then go for a better way to play right away at Colorado or somewhere somewhere else? Sorry, my phone's going off. You're great, man. Hey, we're uh, we're checking the oh, news wow. here on Twitter we as well. We got a Hayes Fawcett bomb. Hey, I, can I raise my hand? Please, Hayes Fawcett please, please. is announcing on, that five-star edge, Edrick Houston, is sticking to Ohio State. Massive. Absolutely That's massive. a huge win for Ohio State. They needed this on the defensive line after losing Justin Scott, a five-star D lineman, to Miami. It looked like Edrick Houston was trending out of their commitment list. They're able to hold on. Chat, how big is this for the, for the Buckeyes? 
That was big. I mean, if he's put that pen to the paper, you know, that that's huge. I mean, obviously, like we said, things change extremely fast in recruiting. You know, I'm sure Ohio State got the word that maybe he was trending towards Alabama. How can they counter that? Uh, what can they do to get him back? And he, he had a deep call with them yesterday mm -hmm. uh, into last night. And they answered his questions about Larry Johnson. Could he retire? Could he move on? What's the plan on the D-line? There's guys leaving in the portal. He had questions for Ohio State. And that's what led him to open the door to Alabama and Clemson. Uh, this would be huge. If they can kind of weather that storm and get Edrick, who I was told was basically 99% Alabama this morning, uh, that would be huge for Ohio State. He was 99% to Alabama. Wow. And, I, you know, I, I was making phone calls last night. It sounded like Edrick Houston was very much up in the air. I spoke to somebody that was with him last night that got the vibe that, hey, he called me and said, Josh, I was with Edrick last night. I think he's flipping to Alabama. And that was kind of the buzz all morning. But Ohio State, like I said, huge win. They needed a five-star caliber defensive lineman in this class. Well, they maybe needed more than one. But they get Edrick Houston when it looks like it was all but finished to Alabama. And, J.D., you know what also this does? It probably mathematically eliminates Alabama from taking over that number one spot. Yeah, if you're a Buckeye fan, you tuned into this show and saw Jeremiah McClellan flipping away from you to the Ducks. And then since you've been watching, you got Jeremiah Smith. Sticking with Ohio State and Edrick Houston now, 99% going one, but all you need is just that 1% chance, that 1% chance that Edrick <laughs> yes. Houston ends up landing with Ohio State. Again, as long as you get the last Hayes Fawcett graphic, it's all you need on signing day with Edrick Houston. Sounds like he's going to be a Buckeye. Uh, Larry Johnson, obviously a massive factor in this when it comes to landing top elite talent on the defensive line. Edrick Houston obviously being that in the five-star edge category. Uh, what does this mean for Ohio State as they continue to build towards being that team? We say it all the time, but like beating Michigan is the goal yeah. at Ohio State, and that's an that's a area where they've yeah, been we talked great about at recently. It. I think this really round, line, that rounds out that class. You would have liked to finish with a Justin Scott in addition to Edrick Houston. You know, if you're you're recruiting at that elite level, you stack five stars on top of five stars. But hey, this was a fierce battle, and it wasn't like you were battling just anybody. You were battling Alabama in the South for a prospect at Buford High School, and all the buzz is against you heading into the moment, but you're able to hold them. This is a huge win. Uh, you, you, you celebrated the commitment, and you celebrate the signing just as much because it's one thing to get them committed. It's a whole nother to get them signed, and that's just what Ohio State did. Some bookends for the folks in Columbus. And I yep. think you said that perfectly, Josh. When it comes to what Ohio State wants to compete for, we just said it. You want to be able to beat Michigan. That's the first part, win the Big Ten, and then win national championships. That third part of the equation, you probably have to beat teams like an Alabama, like a Georgia, and so beating them on the recruiting trail and hanging on to Edric Houston on signing day, I mean, you, you cannot overstate the impact of what that could be long-term yeah, This for the is Buckeyes. definitely a reload move, not a rebuild move. Landing mm -hmm. a five-star defensive lineman from Buford High School is how you reload if you're Ohio State. Absolutely massive. Absolutely massive. So where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's one domino going down with Edric Houston, I'm just waiting on, on the K.J. Bolden news as to what he's yep. going to be doing. I and know that there's a one lot other, of buzz. One other five-star is official. Okay. It looks like Ryan Wingo has sent in his – LOI, and he is officially signed Done. with Texas. So Done deal. Take that off our board. There we go. Okay, so, so some, uh, some very big pieces on the on three uh, team recruiting rankings and the on three player rankings starting to sort of take shape here with uh, Edric Houston, Ryan Wingo. The next domino, like I said, we're watching here is what's going to happen with KJ Bolden. Now, Chad, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this one because with all the smoke around Alabama for Edric Houston, Kind of feels like there was a similar vibe around K.J. Bolden and all the smoke towards Georgia. Does Edric Houston sticking with Ohio yeah. State make you feel any differently around where things stand with K.J. Bolden or just two totally separate situations? No, nah, totally separate. I mean, obviously things change fast. You know, you go back to a couple of days ago, I'm putting, or yesterday, that Ohio State has a great shot to hang on to Edric Houston. It changes overnight to this morning going Bama's way, and then just like that, back to Ohio State. Uh, <laughs> but I, I've heard that, and I just I was talking to someone that's on the ground there at Buford. KJ is about three or four minutes away, I'm told, uh, okay, from great. making his announcement. But everything I still hear there uh, with KJ, nothing's changed. But the same could be said about Edrick, too. And that's how fast and how quickly things change in this recruiting game, you know. And uh, he, I was just told Edrick was on the phone a couple of times, like right before we got onto the stage to make that announcement. He was on the phone with people. And that's probably when he made that final decision uh, to go with Ohio State. Uh, so KJ is right there. Um, 
I'm told he's he's ready to roll here here in just in a few minutes. But based on those two two totally different recruitments, two different decisions, again, based on what I'm hearing, I still like where George is at with KJ Bolden. Mm. And we're not the only ones watching this whole Buford thing because yeah. right now on X, KJ Bolden and Edric Houston, their names are trending in the United States <laughs> right now. So that tells you how many people are paying attention to what's happening at this moment in Buford. Only college football. Only in yeah. college football do you have high school students' names trending on the day where they're going to put pen to paper. <laughs> also worth noting, both those dudes committed. So we're not waiting for like them to announce right. where they're going. I mean, we are waiting for that, but like they, they've been committed yeah, now waiting. for a period of time, and we're going to see where they end up going. Uh, Josh, your thoughts on where things stand with K.J. Bolden, because like we just asked Chad, sounds like different situations. you got to think if, if my teammate makes the jump and says, okay, actually, I am going to stick with my commitment. Mm. Similar vibe in the bit in the, in the air. Are you, are you leaning the same way? It as certainly feels like if you took the temperature outside right now, it certainly feels like KJ Bolden is flipping. I mm -hmm. mean, all signs, all insiders, all all points of information. And hey, maybe it was a big shock that he committed to FSU. I mean, everybody did have him either going to Georgia or Auburn at the moment. So maybe at the time he did make a rash decision that a lot of people were scratching their heads at. And now, when it comes to putting pen to paper. It's hard to, you know, deviate off what people think you're supposed to do, which is stay close to home. Go play for Georgia. You're the number one safety in Georgia. You're the number one safety in America. You're supposed to go to Georgia. So he's, you know, he's dealing with it right now. And I think that right, I don't I don't think that heading into this, KJ knew where he was going. I think this is really just coming down to the moment. Just happening in real time, man. So obviously in we'll real give, time. You, give you the the intel as soon as we get something definitive there. But with K.J. Bold, man, if you're going to land him at a place like Georgia, it really is just the rich getting richer. He joins that elite secondary class. Uh, the number one safety in the country will be taking his talents to Athens to join a, a defense that's already been elite with Glenn Schumann and Will Muschamp and Kirby Smart running the show. Uh, just the overall impact if he does end up deciding he's taking his talents to Athens. I think, you know, let's talk about from Florida State's angle too, right? This is a massive blow. It doesn't, it doesn't break the class by any means. But if you're Florida State and you think that you're about to start stacking talent, you know, hey, we got one of the best DB class. We have the best DB class in America. Well, you take KJ Bolden out of that, and it's a, it's a very good DB class. But I don't think it's competing for the number one DB class in America, the number ten ranked player overall. He's something special, and we're going to find out here momentarily if he sticks with the Florida State Seminoles or flips to the Georgia Bulldogs. Also, I mean, Auburn, I, I, it, it seems like everybody's counting Auburn out right. at this point. But Auburn, I do think, had a big, if he ends up flipping, you know, just the fact that they talked to him so much and it maybe helped loosen him up off that commitment to Florida State. So we'll see what happens here. A lot of moving pieces, man. A lot of moving pieces. Obviously, once we get the definitive commitment from a KJ Bolden, we will give you the top 10 class rankings as they stand uh, post KJ Bolden, but Ohio State keeping Edric Houston and the, the news on, on KJ Bolden here. Hopefully we're gonna Oof. get that soon for you. Again, peripheral vision here. We're keeping an eye on the Chad Simmons hand being thrown up, keeping an eye on the notifications for a one Hayes Fawcett. So make sure you're one following Hayes Fawcett, follow on three recruits, the Twitter account and this channel, make sure you're subscribed. Then also make sure you're dialed in with Chad Simmons so you can stay up to know with everything National Signing Day. All right, so we kind of have all those boxes checked. Uh, Josh, where were we? We were talking a little bit about the, the Florida Gators. Yeah, we're, look, we're, look. we're talking Florida Gators. Let's and go back there. They were swinging big. You know, they had some decommitments down the stretch, namely Xavier Phil saying, but look, Florida was battling. They wanted to get the best recruits in America. And at the time in the summer, there was nobody hotter than Florida. They had a rough season. They had some attrition, but still top 10 class fighting to get back into the top five which is possible they got to hold on to a Darius Hayes who could be making a decision here very very soon it's down to Miami or Florida he's one of the top linebacker commits in that Florida Gator class and he's going to be making a decision soon but hey you got to love that the fact that they went out despite them not making a bowl game and they're still going to finish with the top 10 class I was going to say I mean if I'm a Florida Gator fan Josh What's a class ranking that you think is something that, that I should be happy with? Look, if you're not about? making a bowl game, it's, it's, it's realistic to think that you're probably battling for a top 15 class. So Chad has some intel. 
How about it? Chad Simmons with some intel. We'll throw it Drop his it way on right us, Chad. Now. I'll read it. KJ Bolden's tweet himself. I'm staying home to make my home state great. Go dogs. Wow. KJ Bolden. KJ Bolden. There it is. To the University of Georgia. So Woo. I got one out of two, right? Houston goes. I was, I was thinking Bama. He goes to Ohio State. Uh, but obviously, Georgia, huge win here getting him away from Florida State. Chad. Talk about that DB class that has the number one corner and the number one safety now signed and committed to them. Yeah, I mean, Ellis right now is already there practicing with yeah. the team. Ellis Robinson, the fourth. I mean, he's an elite guy, a guy that Georgia actually – they, they coveted. They, they love his body type, his mental makeup, his athleticism. Uh, same can be said about K.J., and this is one Georgia just never gave up. Gave up. They kept going in home when they could. Kept making the calls when they could. Kept getting, you know, him on campus when they could. Kept getting in touch with the mom, the dad, KJ, his people. What, what do you need? What can we answer? What can we show you? The defensive breakdown, the the, the roster. They answer so many questions over the last few weeks, last couple of months with KJ. They never went away, and I think that was a huge win, a huge part, just Georgia being consistent and laying out their plan, just very simple, black and white. You can come here, you can stay home, and you can do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that hit home with KJ Bolden. Chad, was it closer between Georgia and Auburn? or Georgia and Florida State down the stretch? I think down the stretch, man, I think, honestly, he was going away from Florida State based yeah, on – obviously, sense. KJ can answer them questions himself now, but mm -hmm. I think based on putting the pieces together, uh, over the last week, week and a half to two weeks, I was starting to hear he was going away from Florida State. And even some people took at they, – they watched the video interview he did, the post-visit interview coming out of FSU. People came to me saying, man, what's it mean? KJ's not looking us in the eyes about Florida State, not talking with the same kind of energy about Florida State, not really giving true answers about his commitment. And yeah. you can read that different ways, but maybe he was telling them himself. He just wasn't all in with Florida State any longer. But I think this came down to really Auburn versus Georgia late. So there was rumors, there was reports down the street that K.J. Bolden was going to flip. Out of his Florida State visit three days ago, K.J. Bolden tweeted this, y'all reporters be killing me. I guess you got to do what you got to do to get a story, crying emoji. Well, I guess the reporters were there right. There we go. There we go. Well, there's Did smoke, the reporters fire. know it before K.J. Bolden knew it? There's a chance. I mean, I think there's one thing to do when you look at so. the writing on the wall. I mean, it sounds like – I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I'll, I'll ask you first, Chad, and I want to hear your thoughts too, Josh. Just the access they had to K.J. Bolden. When we sat down with him in the spring, yeah. he had been to Georgia like double digits. You couldn't times. even count how many times he'd, he'd been there. We told him how many times. It was in yeah. the teens. We told him how many times he had been. If he's not in the state of Georgia, does Georgia still land K.J. Bolden? Probably not. You know, he's, he's an in-state kid from day one. So he's been there so many times. They offered him early. But now, look, FSU was his dream school. FSU was the first school to offer him a scholarship. So they were ahead of Georgia, if you want to rewind, you know, four years ago to where it all started. But Georgia was right there quickly after with an offer early on. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, he, he grew up, you know, with Georgia right in front of his eyes, winning back-to-back -back championships, knowing players on that team, an easy 40-minute drive from Buford to Athens. And, you know, that helped, I think, probably more than people think because there was probably a few visits we don't even know about that he made to Athens at different times to meet with Kirby Smart or yeah. Must Champ or guys mm. like that, even Fran Brown when he was there, uh, about the opportunity he has at Georgia. So I think location played a factor. What Was it the final factor? No, but it only helped Georgia in the end. Big time gift for the dogs, so, keeping him home. Absolutely massive. Will this be the biggest flip of the day? The only – if what would be a bigger flip than KJ Bolden right now? Would Jordan Seaton potentially be? Hmm. If Jordan Seaton were to flip, would that be Chad? What do you think? Would that be the biggest flip of the day, or is this going to be the I, biggest flip? I still flip probably of the day? lean KJ. You know, over just uh, I, I think this KJ is a little bit more maybe of a surprise. You know, with Jordan is kind of there's so many unknowns out there, almost kind of an expected. You know, something to happen kind of crazy down yeah. the stretch with Jordan. Not saying it wouldn't be huge because it would be. He's an elite offensive tackle, a guy that can anchor the offensive line for the next three or four years for somebody. Uh, but I, I would lean lean towards KJ being just the the polarizing recruit that he is mm -hmm. nationwide for the past four years. Yeah, let me see. Uh, Jordan Seaton currently is not trending on X, but, okay. Give but him some time. KJ Bolton still is trending. <laughs> Give him some time. And also, you know who is not trending right now on X as well uh, is Coach Prime. 
And the last couple of years, we've seen Deion Sanders on signing day make a big move. So just because it happens, not happened yet. If we're, if we're <laughs> trusting, you know, the track record here, feels like a matter of time before we get a, a coach prime bomb. Yeah. Uh, going back to KJ Bull, though, how he fits at Georgia, Josh, it just takes one good year to be able to achieve all you want to at Georgia and play in, at the, you know, highest level which is the nfl obviously they, they uh, also had a lot of dbs hit the portal a lot you of dbs that. at the portal yeah they did yep. some former five-star dbs that were on the roster hit the portal so they're going to be depending on some of these guys especially at the safety position i think it's worth noting they landed him without their defensive back coach and fran brown sticking yeah, around. he went true. to syracuse yeah. so landing i mean that just speaks to the georgia brand does it not well that that makes me uh kind of go back a couple weeks before do i have this right chad before kj bolden visited uh, Florida State. He went up to Syracuse, correct? Yes. Did he go to Syracuse, then come back and take that visit to yeah, Auburn on Monday? Yeah, but my question but is, yeah. was the Syracuse visit kind of like a remote visit to Georgia with Fran Brown being there? Wow. Yeah, I mean, it didn't hurt, you know. I think from what I was told, that whole thing was obviously just, just fun and games for, for KJ, but going in support of King Joseph Edwards, you know, and kind of getting that, you know, him with Fran Brown, Nick Williams, kind of being there as support, a good friend, a former Buford player as well uh, with him. But, but yeah, it didn't hurt. Fran obviously took a job, but he knows he helped he, – Kirby Smart helped him get that job. Right. So he wasn't going to go up there and bash Georgia. He's going to speak positive about Georgia. And Syracuse um, wasn't in a position to flip K.J. Bolden either. They were definitely not a contender for K.J. Bolden. I can say that with confidence. <laughs> Absolutely yes. massive for the dogs to get him. Hey, let's take a look at the, the top ten where they stand right yeah, now. Again, the timestamp, the timestamp, the timestamp. Make sure you're keeping an eye on that. Georgia slamming the door. Saying, Look hey, that. we're the big dogs. We got a still. whole new top Number five here. one in the country as of 1225 Central Time, so 125 Eastern. Bama at two. Ohio State back up to number three, keeping Edric. Houston, Texas at four. Oregon at five. Josh, within that top five, anything that sticks out to you specifically? Well, Oregon with the big flip of Jeremiah McClellan. We didn't really see that one coming. If you were to tell me that there was a big flip from Oregon today, I don't know if my first guess would have been McClellan. So that could be a bonus here on this day, but we'll see what happens with Oregon. But ha seeing them in the top five, they've been on a march up the, up the list, and so has Texas. Texas has come from deep in the, in the rankings. I remember talking to Jerry Hamilton of Inside Texas and On3 National. He was, we were having a conversation back in September when Texas was sitting at number 20 overall that they had a path to a top five class. And guess what? They've followed that path to perfection, and they are currently sitting at number four overall. Well, Josh, we're keeping a close eye on Texas because they just had Arian Hampton, the athlete, flip oh, from Texas got action. to Alabama. This is absolutely massive. Aaron Hampton, mm -hmm. again, flipping to the Crimson Tide. Wide receiver, whatever, whatever you want to call him. He's an athlete. Put him on there. It's a big-time get for the Tide. Uh, Chad, one that we kind of saw coming, surprise level on Aaron Hampton making this flip. You know, not that surprised, to be honest with you, the way it's picked up. But, again, I mean, this stuff changes so fast, but all the dots were pointing towards him going to Alabama uh, the last – what, 12 to 15, 18 hours or so. Um, and there had been some back and forth of him in Texas, but everything was pointing towards him ending up in Tuscaloosa. Massive, Whew. massive gift for, for, uh, Seeing, for wait, the This Crimson is the Tide. flip hour. This is the flip we hour, We are baby. in the flip hour. Merry Flipsmiths. You had the Buford zone, which has now led ourselves into the flip hour. The flip hour. Which is kind of, if you're tracking with the timeline, where we stand here on a national signing day. Because we're still tracking a Darius Hayes, right? A Darius Hayes. Kevin Riley's coming up soon. Potential oh, yeah. flip watch guy in about 30 minutes or so. Uh, Chad, um, we mentioned Kevin Riley. He's the four-star running back committed to Miami that Alabama's in on. Now, we thought Alabama had a good shot at landing Jaden Ball. Do they turn the heat up now for Kevin Riley? Or does that make him even more important, I should say? They were hoping to get both. Right. I was told that they were trying to get both equally as important to them in this class. Obviously, it may go a little bit deeper with a guy like Kevin Riley being right there in their backyard at Tuscaloosa Central. Uh, he lives in Tuscaloosa, attended three games this year. Um, they lost into Miami early. They turned some heat up here late um, and are in a good place, it seems like, uh, to potentially get some good news here. Uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, mm. I like where Alabama's at with their connection with Coach Gillespie, you know, the offensive scheme, and the opportunity to play and be different in that scheme. You have big backs like Richard Young, Justice Haynes there, 
yeah. Riley's different. More of that that scat back guy that can catch ball in the backfield, return some kicks, and be used in a different way. So I think a lot of things about Alabama appeal to him. Why are we in this situation? Kevin Riley's from Tuscaloosa. Why is Alabama trying to flip him on signing day? Yeah, I don't know if Bama pushed as hard for him early as a school like Miami. Miami got him down there one time and just being, again, he's from, think about that, he's from Tuscaloosa. Yeah. He goes to Miami. The palm trees for the <laughs> yeah, first time, point. the ocean, the, the, everything. You know, the 305, you yeah. know, he's there. You know, instead of the 205, he's in the 305. Totally different. Totally you different. Know? Different and world. I think, I think that, you know, he felt the love. He liked the surroundings. He saw the opportunity. Um, and just that, that hit home for him. I think, you know, for all these guys, I don't care if you're the number one player or number 1,000 player, you want to feel wanted. You want to feel like you're needed there. You want to feel appreciated as a recruit. And Miami did a great job early. Uh, Bama stayed consistent contact, and I think over the last couple of months have slowly kind of ticked it up a notch in his recruitment, and, and I think that could help them win today. Okay, we got a hand up. Give the ball to my man, Josh Newberg. Josh, what's going on, brother? Four-star linebacker Adarius Hayes has flipped his commitment from Florida to Miami on three, is reporting this as we speak. Massive get. Chad. Massive get. What do we take here, Take us Chad? behind the scenes. How was Flo what, Miami able to take one of Florida's best linebacker commitments? I think just a great balance. Look, Adarius is a different kind of young man he wants his space he's to himself he's not all about you know the spotlight all the time and I think Miami did an excellent job of just just finding that balance you know from going back to the spring communication here you know if you want to hop on a FaceTime with Mario uh, Derek Nicholson uh, they did that throughout the spring and summer they got him to the Georgia Tech game uh, during the season that took it up a notch. They knew he would come down on his own, give them a look. Then they started working to get him for an OV. They wanted to make that lat. They knew he was not going to flip or decommit from Florida anytime early. So they targeted that last weekend before signing day, which was this past weekend, to get him to Miami. They got him down early on Friday, spent the mm -hmm. weekend there, quietly left. They checked all the boxes. He wanted to learn about his scheme, the fit in the scheme. He already had that connection with linebackers coach Derek Nicholson. He saw Crystal Ball's vision for the, the team, the program, the plan moving forward from a balance of portal players to high school recruits. And I think he left that visit. I think going into that visit, he was probably 50-50 from what I was told. When he mm -hmm. left that visit, from what I've heard, he was about 80-20 Miami. And whatever they did the, the last three or four days, they put him to 100% Miami. So I think it was a kind of a slow game, going back to communication in the spring, getting him on campus for the Tech game, and then closing the deal over the weekend. I mean, can we be honest about the state of Florida? Like, it is the squid games when it comes to recruiting there. Between Miami, Georgia, I mean, not Georgia, Georgia trying to get your players as well, but Miami, Florida, Florida State, all just going head to head. It feels like for all of the same guys and having a flip here with Adarius Hayes from the Gators to the U, I mean, how how intense are those recruiting battles in the Sunshine State, Josh? J.D., they are intense. There is so much more involved than just recruiting. There's ego. There's bragging rights. It's all about your program's prestige on signing day, on how many kids you can flip from the other program. And right now, I'm eager to see, when we see this new top ten. Oh, yeah. There's a good chance. Like I said, I said it at the open. There's a good chance that at the end of the day, Miami ends up being a higher rate class than both Florida and Florida State. Now, when we talk about this, we're talking about a Florida team that has been consistently in the top three the entire cycle. We're talking about a Florida State team that has been right around number five for the last couple months. You're talking about a Miami team that was outside the top 10, outside the top 15 for much of the fall season. And now Miami, I, I want to see it. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there's a good chance that they could be inside the top five by the end of the day. And they started at top, in the top six, the international signing day at the top six. Yeah, that and is. all last week, they were kind of right at 10, mm -hmm. 8, 9. They were bouncing around right, out, right at the end of the top 10. Now they are making a surge as Florida State and Florida fall. Unbelievable the way Miami has just throttled here. And we knew Mario Cristobal would do something like this when he got the job in Coral mm -hmm. Gables, but to see it come to fruition and not just be able to attract top talent, but to see some of that top talent hit the field a season ago between Francis Malagoa and Ruben Bain and the seasons they had as true freshmen, like 
Josh, Miami feels like a sleeping giant to me. And Mario Cristobal's got that thing headed oh, the right direction. But we've been saying that for the last 20 years. And they absolutely are because look at the bed of talent that they're sitting on. Nobody else in the country can say that. As a matter of fact, every single team in the country comes to Miami's backyard to recruit. I, it, it, it is a hotbed. There's no reason for Miami to kind of you know, not compete for a national title year in and year out. And we'll see if Mario Cristobal can do it. There's been others that have tried. I mean, how close is this to being a Mario Cristobal roster? Because I know it's it's been a lot through the portal, and mm -hmm. then they had a top 10 class a season ago. Right now, they're pushing for a top five Much class. Much closer. I Much mean, closer. How, you think a year away? You think it'll be his roster this upcoming season, just not matured yet? How close are they? I think you could say that this is his roster now with the way that he's rebuilt the trenches, whether it be on the offensive or defense. Last year, it was a lot of offensive line. You had Francis Malagoa. You had Samson Okunlola. You had Jalen Rivers. This year, though, it's more about the defensive line, and I think that's what they needed. They kind of rounded out. I mean, they had Reuben Bain last year, who's an, one of the best defenders in the country. But now, landing Justin Scott, landing Adarius Hayes, this, is, this core group of players is Mario's, and I think moving forward, this is more his team than it was at any other point. And Josh, as good as you know, Clemson has been over the past couple of years, as good as Florida State was this past season, like the ACC is extremely winnable. So to have that young nucleus yeah. of talent, if they can get the right quarterback in there, they're going to be in real good shape, obviously, yeah. the way they're trending right now. Uh, let's take a good look at the top 10 as it stands and again, the timestamp is where you got to be locked in. So as of right now, the top 10, we still got Georgia at number one, Alabama holding strong at two, Ohio State at three, no surprise there, Texas at four, and there they are at number five, the Miami Hurricanes. So they did. So Miami has now officially, at least for the time being, jumped Florida and Florida State. I don't even see Florida in the top 10. I believe they're at 12 as of right now, Okay, Josh. so they fell out of the top 10. Wow, that was a little quicker than I thought. But Florida State sitting there at 7, this might not be it for them. Like I said, tonight in six hours from now at 6 p.m. Eastern, we are expecting Armando Blunt, five-star defensive lineman from Miami Central to flip to Miami. That will be another five. That will be their only other five-star in the class tumbling out. So Florida State, we'll see if they can hold on to a top 10 class, but right now it's all about Miami sitting there at number five, a top five class for the Canes. What a day on signing day to kind of turn the momentum of everything. It had been trending in this direction because you had the commitment of Jordan Lyle just 48 hours ago. He flips from Ohio State to Miami, but boy, this is a huge signing day for the Canes. How about Miami just bumping up in front of Oregon, Oregon dropping back to six out of the top five. Like you said, Florida State at seven there. Uh, Notre Dame at 10. Hey, Auburn at nine. Auburn just standing strong in that top mm. 10 after six and six yeah. year. Uh, anything surprising to you as it stands right now with this top Probably 10 The biggest right now, thing Josh? is just Florida coming out, but I, I forgot. You take a Darius Hayes out of that, you know, that that's a big blow. So not only Miami, take, hey, this is what we talked about. This is why rivalry recruiting is so big. Not only does Miami gain a recruit, but they take one from their rival. That's Absolutely big. massive. Absolutely massive. We'll get a good look here at the top 25 here as well as we get rolling on throughout the rest of National Signing Day. But that top 10, again, pay attention to the timestamps. That was at 1235 <laughs> Central Time, so 135 Eastern Man. for y'all watching. But uh, keep an eye on that. Josh, how big a deal is it to win the state of Florida? If Miami holds on and ends up being the top class in the Sunshine State, what does that mean for them? Well, it's bigger to win the, the state of Florida on the field. I mean, this year, Florida State beat Miami and Florida. You know how big of a deal it is in the state of Florida? They make rings for that. <laughs> they make state championship rings. So definitely winning the state of Florida in recruiting matters because it relates to what's going to happen on the field, hopefully in the future for the Canes. We'll see what happens, see if they can get over that hump. But a class like this back to back it with what they signed last year in the trenches and I, I it's outstanding let's take a look at what they have as well on top of that trench warfare uh they got some good playmakers too josh a yep. couple of big time wide receivers you mentioned josiah trader four-star wide receiver a teammate of jeremiah Smith. jojo trader one of the most electric players if it wasn't for his teammate jeremiah smith <laughs> we'd be talking about jojo trader being the best wide receiver in the state of florida instead he has he has to share the field with jeremiah smith but that just made them both better i love the attitude of jojo trader the fact that he's not willing to follow jeremiah smith anywhere he goes remember jo jojo trader also had an offer and took a visit to ohio state but they couldn't lure him out of florida so huge get for them i I mean, I love what Miami has in this class. I think now can they hold on to Kevin Riley? Mm. I mean, you got a top five class. It's not going to break your class if you lose Kevin Riley to Alabama. But 
Hey, make a statement. You just took one from Florida. You've been beaten up on Florida State. Go take one from and make sure Alabama doesn't take one of yours. How are they able to be so aggressive on the flip side of things with Miami? I mean, being able to, to make the flips. They have Justin Scott, a guy we've talked about many times throughout the course of this show. Mario Cristobal yeah. being aggressive on, on the front yeah, of the Yeah, they flipped Nye Carr, the wide receiver, formerly committed to Georgia. Yeah. Uh, it starts at the top. It starts with the mentality of your head coach, and it starts, you know, Jerry Hamilton always says this, they got to recruit through the whistle. Hmm. And I think that's what you're seeing Mario Cristobal do. It starts at the top. When your head man is aggressive and he's holding everybody accountable, you get results like these. When your head man isn't completely engulfed in recruiting and you're, you're not eating it, living it, breathing it, it's tough to recruit against the best. I mean, you can still put together good classes, but to put together a class like this, it starts at the top with Mario Cristobal. When it comes to the expanded college football playoff, we talk about the ACC and Miami being in position to maybe compete for that here in the not-too-distant future. When you get to that 12-team dance, it could be a thing where those trench players that Miami acquired through this cycle and through the previous cycle as well, that could be the difference maker in a first-round matchup in the college football playoff, Josh. Absolutely, and you're not seeing a ton of attrition there either. You know, when we talk about the transfer portal, you're seeing Miami, they're not losing a ton of guys in the trenches. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's going to have attrition, but you got to look at where it's coming from. And for Miami, they're still in building mode. You know, they're still stacking those classes and getting to where they need to be, but it starts and stops in the trenches, and I love what Mario's doing. He's keeping a good thing going. So going back to that top 10 here really quickly, you got Miami at five. You also have Oklahoma sitting there in the eighth spot. The Sooners, Josh, speaking of trench warfare, the way they've just been attacking this cycle and Brent Venable's second full class in Norman. Talk about the, the trench players. They, they built a pretty tremendous class of, uh, of players that compete in the line of scrimmage there as well. David Stone, the five-star plus defensive lineman from IMG. He's he, a tone yeah, setter. He is definitely the pillar of that class. David Stone set the tone, like you said. Now, arguably the number one defensive line class in America if they land williams winnery mm -hmm. now williams winnery that's the one big blow to this oklahoma d line class but they get nigel smith love him they are building something special up front brent venables needs to do this they they've taken it they've taken their d line recruiting up a notch mm -hmm. and i think when you when you look at oklahoma the biggest the biggest sig significance in this class is what they're building on that D-line, and it all starts and stops with David Stone. That was a big recruitment. I mean, remember Miami. They were heavily involved yep. in that one as well. So you're seeing kind of the same teams battling for the same recruits. It's just a matter of where they all fill out. And I think it's so massive for Oklahoma to be able to win on the defensive line because Brent Venables, what we know about him from his time at Clemson as a D.C., to play on the defensive side of the football, especially on the D line for Brett Venables. Mm -hmm. yeah. you got to be able to do a lot of things. Yeah. you got to be it's... able to peel out and cover running backs, rush the passer, stop the run. Like There's so much ass to do. So to land a class like this, I think it says a lot. Really versatile player that they landed in Danny Okoye. I know he's an edge, but he can get out. You know, He can cover a man out of the backfield. He's quick off the ball. Love what they got in Danny Okoye. Then they also land Jaden Jackson out of IMG Academy, and he's a versatile defender. He can, he can play on the inside, could play on the outside. Love what this D line class is shaping up to be in Oklahoma gonna have to be good when they go to the SEC I mean and there that, that's it is kind of the, the I big, mean the big look thing. at this look at this all three players on the D-line inside the top 150 you got Jaden Jackson just outside the top 300 high quality defenders coming to this defensive line at Oklahoma it gotta is gotta be grown man that. football grown man football being played in Norman because without a doubt grown man football being, being played in the SEC uh, how about Taylor Tatum as well one of the top running backs in the country committed to Oklahoma. Absolutely. They won him over they USC. They go into the state of Texas. Versatile back. Versatile they go back. into the state of Texas where they have a lot of success and they land a versatile back that's going to do it all over USC. Huge win. Taylor Tatum was unbelievable big win for Oklahoma. Massive gift for Oklahoma. So as we keep on moving here throughout National Signing Day, Chad Simmons is out on the bat. I'm going to get his thoughts here Yeah, but he just came back in, so you never know. What I was wanted to kind of just give him a little hint because he's off camera here. I just want to say, hey, we're going to go to Chad here in a minute. That's kind of our, our verbal <laughs> okay. cue for those some inside baseball. Uh, whenever Chad gets set up, we'll talk about this. But Oklahoma, man, I mean, I think the brand that they have moving to the SEC you have to think that plays a factor for some of these kids. You maybe take a second look at what's going on in Norman. Absolutely. I think both Texas and Oklahoma played into the fact that, hey, hey, guys, we're going to the SEC. Yeah. And one of the things that hurt was the fact that uh, th they weren't supposed to go to the SEC this quickly. So they were being a little bit negatively recruited against in the past two years. But this year, when the move is happening, they are now signing recruits that will only play in the SEC at Oklahoma. Yeah. 
without question. And Chad, I want to get your thoughts on this as it pertains to just the overall image of an Oklahoma. When you talk to kids about going and playing in Norman and playing for Brent Venables, how much does the SEC branding come up for, for recruits? Yeah, I mean, obviously, SEC is huge. I think, obviously, Venables is, uh, is the leader there. His, his, his energy, I think his warmth, you know, the, the kind of person he is. I had one mm -hmm. guy talk about how he goes to church mm -hmm. on Sundays, resonates with him and his family, uh, how they trust him, how he's really the same guy on the field, off the field. But I think the SEC, obviously, is huge, man. To go into that brand, that conference, to play those teams in those markets uh, is very appealing and only going to help Oklahoma recruit that much better. And the kind of jump they had this past season. I mean, there was a lot of talk around them being six and seven his first year on the job, and then bam, big pop year, 10 wins before they head into the Southeastern Conference. So now there's not only this excitement around moving to the NFL junior in the SEC, but also the momentum of being able to have this thing headed the right direction. Have to think that plays a factor as well for some of these kids, Chad? Oh, it does. Not to cut you off, but breaking news here with Amaris Williams now it. officially flipping to oh. Auburn University, something that we've kind of forecasted for a little while now since that OV a week and a half ago did not take a visit anywhere this past weekend. Ohio State had some buzz late trying to get back in that race. They were one time viewed as Florida's biggest competition, but that OV, I think, to Auburn kind of sealed the deal for them. Mm. They kept him home that next weekend, uh, gave him a lot to think about with Auburn and their presentation on and off the field, and ended up flipping him, the four star D lineman from Clinton, North Carolina from the Florida Gators. Mm. And Ohio State was also heavily involved there. At one point, it looked like Ohio State was maybe the favorite. When do you think this turned in Auburn's favor? When they got him on campus, you know, I think I agree with you, Josh. I mean, basically Florida held Ohio State off a couple of times. He went to mm -hmm. a couple of games uh, this season in Columbus. And coming off each of those visits, the word was uh, it was only a matter of time until Williams flipped to Ohio State. Uh, he played the long game. He took his recruitment all the way until signing day. Uh, he stayed with Florida. Um, and he, he was a guy that seemed to be, you know, maybe influenced by, by visits. You know, he took the mm -hmm. first visit to Florida, committed on the spot. So, I mean, he kind of got caught up. We thought the same thing might happen with Ohio State. Uh, Auburn got in communication. Jeremy Garrett did a great job there of connecting with Williams. They got him on campus for that OV, that Monday, Tuesday OV. When he left that visit, the buzz was pretty strong that Auburn had immediately become that team to beat, even above Florida, the school he was committed to. Oof. Big time get there for Auburn. Like Auburn, we said, Hugh Freeze was going to cause chaos. We knew he it, was right? going to find a way to cause chaos today. If it wasn't flipping KJ Bolden, it was flipping Amaris Williams. And that's a big one because, like I said, at one point, it seemed imminent that he was going to flip to Ohio State. He woke up and chose chaos. There, there's no way around it for, for Hugh Freeze. And that was one of the big things we said when he took the job at Auburn yeah. was, yes, he's got experience in the SEC. Yes, he's beat Nick Saban before. But the talent acquisition side of things. Yeah. And we've seen it in a very short period of time from the portal and then now on the recruiting show with the big flip there with Amaris Williams. <sighs> So, so, so much action happening in this hour. And, and Amaris Williams, we look at, we already previewed Auburn's uh, top rated commitments. All four of their top rated commitments came via flip. Now you put Amaris Williams in there as well. And the top quarter of this class is made up of all flips. Is there some more targets on the board here for Auburn and they're going to try and maybe flip before this whole thing is said and anyone else you're watching? I wouldn't count Auburn out. Uh, we were watching K.J. Bolden. We were watching Amaris Williams. Oh, L.J. McCray. He's the, the L.J. McCray. That's the one to watch mm -hmm. if you're Auburn, and that's the big one. He's the five-star defensive lineman. I don't want – I mean, geez, it seems like Auburn's picking on Florida. They flipped Jamonte Waller. Now they flip Amaris Williams, and they're the biggest threat to flip L.J. McCray as well. A lot going on on the Plains. A lot going on on the Plains, and I promise you, as soon as there is more news when it comes to the Tigers and what they're doing, as well as anything else on National Signing Day, we will have it for you right here. Well, hey, Josh, why don't we get to the good folks that are actually bringing us Absolutely. National Signing Day today. Let's do it. That is our friends at Prize Picks. They are bringing you National Signing Day today for us here at On3, and there's the college football playoff coming up. Yeah. So I want to make sure we get our Prize Picks picks in for the Rose Bowl. Let's, let's, let's start with the... Uh, some quarterback rush totals that we okay. not just like, we love them. Rush. So the rush totals for a one Jalen Milrow, he is at 32 and a half rush yards. Y'all, we love that. In a game like this, you got to have your best player take over. 
let's be clear, Jalen Middle is the best player on the field when it comes to this Rose Bowl game. So he's going to have to run for more than 32 and a half rush yards there. We will take the more. We will feel just great about doing that. What are your thoughts on that, Josh? I love going more on this one. Jalen Milrow, he can get it vertical, but when he gets it vertical, that only opens up the rushing lane. So let's go more. I like the design quarterback run. Maybe a little Mm -hmm. bit of ad lib for him there to get him past that 32 and a half rush yard total. Love that. In addition to that, we're going to add on a square of J.J. McCarthy's rush total. He's at 16 and a half total rush yards. We also like the more there. If you've watched Alabama this season, they've had a little bit of trouble defending the mobile quarterback. Jaden Daniels got to work against them. Peyton Thorne in that game against Auburn in the Iron Bowl, he had some success running the football. So similar thought with Jalen Milrow, designed quarterback runs in this spot. We'll take the more for both J.J. McCarthy on his rush yard total, as well as Jalen Milrow. What do you say to that? Yeah, we know J.J. McCarthy is going to have to throw the ball for them to win, but He's also going to have to run the ball, and that's a pretty low total. Let's go more. Right? You can kind of bump into six and a half rush yards if you're J.J. McCarthy. So on top of those two, we're going to make it a flex play and add in a free square from Price Picks if Kevin Durant scores just one point, just messes around and gets one point on Christmas Day, we're good to go there. So two out of three of these squares hit. We're feeling good. We're making some back from our entry. So redeem code NSD to get 100% deposit match up to 100 bucks with prize picks when you create an account. So create an account, download the, the prize picks app, redeem code NSD. I'm doing it. A hundred percent deposit doing match up to hundred bucks. Josh doing these it right are, these now. Are winners. You should get on it right now as well. So we appreciate prize picks taking care of us and bringing y'all our national signing day show for us here at on three. All right, let's jump right back into the madness that has happened. Again, the timestamps at the bottom there updated at 1250 central. Oh boy. Here's what we got, Josh. Miami still at five. Notre Dame at 10, Oklahoma at 9, Auburn at 8, Florida State at 7, Oregon at 6. We're going in uh, in ascending order here. How about that? Uh, <laughs> M- Miami at 5, Texas at 4, Ohio State at 3, and Bama at Georgia, 2-1 uh, mm. and one respectively. Yeah. Anything stand out to you there, Josh? Texas and Miami, big moves. You see Florida State, they're sliding. And you see Florida, they started, I believe, at number 4 in the country. They are now, we can't even see them inside the top 10 right now. Uh, The back end, you had Auburn, I believe, at 10 when the day started. They have now moved up to 8 with the flip of Amaris Williams. A lot of action going on here, boys. A lot going on. How about Ohio State? There was so much buzz around what they could lose going into the day. That was kind of like the the storyline if you were a Buckeye fan was just hoping, praying, whatever you could do to find a way to keep Jeremiah Smith and Edric Houston. They kept both of them. Yeah, it, it, you, you saw that it sounded like Edric Houston was trending away. Jeremiah Smith has been up in the air. It was probably a 50-50 coin flip heading into the day for, for most fans. To lock both of them down and be holding down the number three spot right now is a successful day for Ohio State. Uh, Texas at number four, like I said, their march to the top five has been uh, just patient methodical Mm. but never wavering always moving up the charts so now they are sitting there at number four it's unbelievable to see this the way it's shaping up and also miami just surging up the charts they broke into the top 10 just about two weeks ago and now after a couple flips on signing day they are sitting at number five overall Oregon booted out of the top five. They were just in there. They're now at six. Florida State slides from three to seven today. Auburn, like I said, moved up a slight bit. Oklahoma and Notre Dame round out your top ten. Yeah, you mentioned Texas there. Just like a good friend, consistent the whole way through. Then when you need them the most on National Signing Day, they show up for you. I mean, it was almost, it was not, I don't want to say it was almost a joke when me and uh, Jerry were doing Texas's path to a top five class when they were sitting at number 21 or 22. It, it, it seemed pretty far out. It's kind of the moment. It feels like the Steve Sarkeesian effect. Like it's it's a place that I would imagine if you're a high school baller, you want to have an excuse to get to the 40 acres. I mean, Austin's incredible. It's a brand that speaks for itself. You have to imagine the NIL yeah. opportunities are, are plentiful there. And they're heading into the and they're SEC. Winning. And they're winning, Josh. Yeah, it's an exciting time. Team. They have um, a lot of talent sitting, waiting in the wings, a lot of young talent on that roster. And it's an exciting time as they head into the SEC. I continue to be impressed with Auburn. Entered the day. At number 10, again, up to number 8 right now. Hard to ignore what Hugh Freeze is doing over there. So good times rolling on the planes as well as in Austin, as well as everybody else in that top 10 right now. Now let's take a look at what's going on just outside the top 10, 11 through 25 here, Josh. You got Nebraska staying steady at 21 there. Uh, you got LSU on the outside looking in that top 10 and sitting there at 11. Wow. Like you mentioned, Florida down to 15. Just overall thoughts on what we see right now with this 11 through 25 on these recruiting rankings. I think LSU in Tennessee would really like to finish up with the top five class. Now, Cohen Eccles, a big-time offensive lineman that decommitted 
Uh, Chad, are you able to speak on Cohen Eccles? He decommitted from Texas A&M, and it looked like he was going to sign or commit to LSU. But is Auburn also a threat there? Yeah, I mean, again, that's more, I think Sam has that lead there better than I do. But based on, you know, what I've known, Auburn's very much been involved with LSU uh, as well. Two SEC schools uh, have been oh, mentioned pretty the RPM, consistent. Yeah. You know. So on the RPM, we got Auburn at 96%, LSU at 1.2%. But LSU was able to get them on campus recently. So I could still see this thing swinging either way. Um, so we'll see. LSU, Tennessee. Clemson sitting out there at 11, 12, and 13 in the top 25, followed by Texas A&M, Florida, Penn State, Michigan, USC, South Carolina, Ole Miss, Nebraska in there at 21, Texas Tech, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Kentucky at 25. Hey, how about Missouri? Coach Drinking Company pushing it right now on the recruiting trail with the top 25 class. Also have a top 15 portal class at last check. So they're, uh, they're up in their dude factor quite a bit over there in Columbia. Now you mentioned Tennessee and you mentioned LSU. Josh, doesn't it just sound different if I'm a college football fan to say, hey, we signed a top 10 class as opposed mm -hmm. to saying, hey, we signed a top 11, top 12 class? Doesn't it just feel better to say top 10 as yeah. opposed to the other word? Definitely. The other phrases, if you're a rather? program like a Tennessee, if you're an LSU, if you're a Florida State, you're a Florida, nothing less than a top 10 class is really acceptable. I mean, there's obvious reasons why things happen, but and there's only 10 spots in that top mm -hmm. 10, so not everybody's going to get in there. But if you're one of those type of programs and you see yourself slide and are not inside the top 10 yeah you always want your team to be inside that top 10 a couple of big brands too between penn state michigan and usc with 16 17 18 there yeah brands that at least with usc who historically has been you know right around that top 10 michigan another kind of take michigan some doesn't OKGs, really yeah. our kind yeah. of guys if you will uh penn state's got a pretty high level of talent at this point in time um any surprises there with with that you know 16 through 20 some again just big brands south carolina started off my biggest surprise class. is usc and maybe the fact that they never turned it on hmm. like you know they landed carlin jones who i thought was going to end up at ohio state after his decommitment from nebraska the four-star defensive lineman ended up at USC, but it always felt like, okay, USC is about to get started. USC is about to get started. And here they are sitting at 18. We never really saw them get started. Yeah. And Texas A&M at 14 too, is I think a bit surprising to, to me as well. Not so much Not because so much of, of the, the firing of Jimbo yeah. Fisher, but just the fact that we never really, you know, saw them make, just like you said, they're, they're that push to be in the top 10. We didn't see that quite as much as maybe we yeah. thought we would from a program <clears> over there in college station. So that's where we stand right now with that top 10 and top 25 graphics for you. Again, the timestamps, the timestamps, the timestamps, they will tell you the story. So as we're moving on here throughout the I hope somebody's Sunday. archived the first one that we did <laughs> and then puts all the red lines through it at the end of the day. Yes, on yes. like where everybody ended up. That'd be funny to see. There's gonna, yeah, I think once we get the dust all settled on this National Sunday Day, we will uh, have a pretty good gauge for where things stand. Uh, you know what? Andy Staples... Did a phenomenal segment with you actually talking about just yeah. overall NIL as it pertains to the recruiting world right now and National Signing Day being the day to talk about it. Uh, great conversation between the two of y'all. Before we get to that, though, just want to get your thoughts overall. When it comes to a lot of these top guys, what percent of these kids have an NIL component baked into their recruitment? Well, I think it's a little misleading. I think everybody that we've talked about on this show has NIL baked into their recruitment. Mm -hmm. But everybody we talked at this show is not everybody. There's going to be 2,500, 3,000 kids signing today, putting their, their signature on that NLI. And not a lot of those prospects will have NIL involved in their recruitment. So there's a bit of a, you know, it's not exactly as it seems or what you hear on the streets sure. or what you hear on Twitter. But the prospects that we're talking about, yeah. They're heavily involved in the NIL game. It is the new frontier of college football. And like I said, Josh Newberg and Andy Staples sat down and had a great conversation about it. Without further ado, here's that conversation. Let's bring on the great Andy Staples, college football expert here at On3 to talk a little NIL here on National Signing Day. And Andy, I'm going to just get right to it. Are high schoolers commanding bigger NIL dollars now than they did before? No. No, actually, it's gone the other way. But where It feels like more of the money is going to transfers now. And I think it's probably for a couple of reasons. First of all, the transfers, they're more proven. They're easier to evaluate because coaches are watching them play against other college players. So they have a better idea of, of the competition level they're facing and how they might react. Also, they know 
how they react in the college environment. Also, pending a, a court ruling here in a couple of weeks, if you've transferred once as an undergraduate, you can't leave again without sitting out a year. So you can't hold that program hostage, whereas a guy coming in out of high school, if he has a big freshman year, he can just say, hey, look, I'm going to need more money or I'm gone. Or as we've heard a couple times in midseason, I'm going to need more money or I'm going to redshirt this season and then I'm gone. So I think they found that the transfer guys are a little more reliable investments as opposed to the high school guys. That doesn't mean they're not paying some of the high school guys or, or coming up with big deals for the high school guys, but the numbers have gone down considerably. So wait, are you telling, because I read message boards and, and <laughs> when I read message boards, it says every recruit out of high school is getting paid. So are you sitting here telling me that not every high school recruit is signing an NIL deal? No, most of, how many guys are going to sign today, Josh? What about, about 2,500, 3,000? Yeah, about uh, 3,000. Yeah, most of them aren't. Most of them are getting tuition, room, and board. But yes, there are some guys that are signing deals. And at the top end, there's some pretty good ones. But I think if you, you, you're going to hear like seven figure numbers, and I think a lot of this got screwed. The only contract we've actually seen is the Jade Rashada contract at Florida, which was bogus. The, the numbers on that were so out of whack that the person who had to, committed to bankroll it saw the numbers like, I'm not doing that. That's not what we agreed to. And so nothing like that is actually happening it, there probably are some deals that approach seven figures and i think the top quarterbacks in the marketplace are probably commanding something to that effect especially mm -hmm. if you're going to a school that is desperate for a recruiting pop i think we know what, what we're talking about here you know uh dylan Riel is going to nebraska dj lagway is going to florida the, these are two schools that need that victory georgia yeah. which had dylan Riel before doesn't necessarily need that victory. They get recruiting victories all the time. So you have that. Uh, talking to some folks who run collectives, uh, offensive tackles, good defensive linemen, lockdown corners. Those are the ones that command the biggest deals. I had heard that, that there was one school out there that was trying to put together something close to high six figures, low seven figures annually for Jordan Seaton, the number one offensive mm -hmm. tackle in the class. Uh, but he didn't end up going to that school. And that brings up another, because like Colorado, I don't think has to pay as much because the platform Deion Sanders can give you causes you to potentially get more, you know, corporate NIL dollars once you get to school. But one thing that, that someone who, who worked at a collective said to me that I thought was really interesting was out of high school, the players are more likely to pick the school they actually want to go to versus the school that just gives them the biggest bag. Hmm. So uh, as we head to National Signing Day, do you think teams are actively having conversations about how to allocate the funds for high schools versus transfers? Oh, absolutely. I think that's a, that is probably a, a, a never-ending conversation. I think they're just adjusting that every day. And they'll look at what they'll probably do is they'll get this group signed. They'll get through this transfer portal window and they'll say, okay, how did we allocate this? How, how do we feel about this? Do we want to get to, to change it up for next year? Do we want to get certain positions out of high school? Because the thing is, like, if you're coming to a year when you're going to have to sign more defensive linemen or you're going to need a, need a big time quarterback, you're going to have to allocate more money to that high school NIL budget than you are to the transfer one. But if you're planning on having that, and let's say you just signed a bunch of good defensive linemen and you feel good about that, and it's going to be a, a thinner year on that side of the ball, then you might be able to move more toward the transfer group and say, okay, we need, you know, we need a safety right now. Let's pay more to get one of the top ones than mm -hmm. we would otherwise. Yeah, you kind of hit on it earlier, but what positions at the high school level command the most yeah. money? And are you hearing any range, any range of like, hey, this quarterback could earn this much? Well, it is quarterback is number one. And then Obviously. defensive lineman, offensive tackle corner. It is exactly like the NFL draft. As, for, for those of you who wondered how long it would take for NIL <laughs> to become like the NFL draft or like NFL free agency, it took about six minutes. It is, it is exactly like that. The positions of need are the exact same. And, you know, so if you're a running backer, a linebacker, good luck to you. 
But if you're an edge rusher, if you're an offensive tackle, if you're a quarterback, who boy. Yeah, the, the numbers, the, the, the top number I have heard this year for a quarterback that is a that, that's going to be a high school recruit is five year of uh, five million dollars over four years. And that was a that was an ask. That wasn't necessarily a get, right. but it did sound like that was something in the neighborhood of what that person could command. Whew. Well, Andy, happy signing day to you. Thank you for dropping by and pre- you're giving us your presence on such a special day here at On3. Oh, it is the biggest day. I This is this is what I came here for. By the way, my show tonight, we've got a bunch of coaches on. We're going to be talking about all the wild stuff that you guys have been covering all day. And we'll try to make some sense of it come tonight. All right. Thanks a lot, Andy. Thanks, Josh. While we were away, National Signing Day recruiting, it does not stop. We had running back Kevin Riley flipping his commitment from Miami to the Crimson Tide of Alabama to break it all down. Chad Simmons, director of recruiting for On3. Chad, kind of saw this one coming a little bit, kind of had a gauge for this. At least we did. I'm sure you probably had a much better gauge than the public. Uh, Why did this happen? I think it was all about that official visit. You know, Bama getting him on campus. He'd been there for games, you know, Texas, LSU. He knew all about the history and tradition in Tuscaloosa, what Nick Saban does there. But I think it came down to that OV over the weekend. They convinced him to get on campus. They laid out the plan. I think something that really hit home for him, just talking to Riley, was him being with Coach Gillespie, drawing up the plays, how he would be used, and they compared him to a Jameer Gibbs type role, just being that versatile guy that could flex out of the backfield, go catch passes, return kicks, and and be kind of a complement to that bigger, more physical back uh, that Bama's known to have, guys like a Richard Young or a Justice Haynes. I think just the communication picked up. Uh, He felt obviously good about staying home, and obviously it means a lot to him to stay home, being from Tuscaloosa, to stay home and play for the University of Alabama. Oh, just when we thought that we knew the top 10, this is probably <laughs> going to throw another wrinkle into our top 10 rankings. But yeah, what a, you know, this was probably more imminent than a surprise. Kevin Riley from Tuscaloosa staying home. He's going to play for Alabama. They didn't have a running back commitment in this class yet. So Alabama gets their running back commitment. Now they didn't get two because they also wanted Jaden Ball. Jaden Ball decommitted from Arkansas about 48 hours ago, committed to the Florida Gators today. So Alabama goes one for two on the running back targets today. We'll see if they have any other surprises left up their sleeve. But Kevin Riley, you know, we talk so much about Miami and how they're flipping everybody and they're having a great signing day. This is recruiting, folks. Decommitments, flips, they happen. So we see them today. It's not an indictment on your program. It doesn't mean that things are falling apart. It's just kind of the way that it goes. On a day where Miami Hurricanes are flipping everybody, moving all the way up into the top four, they lose Kevin Riley to Alabama. And if Kevin Riley is anything at all like a Jameer Gibbs, who they're comping him to and saying, hey, we want to use your skill set the same way we used him, that is a massive, massive impact on that offense. We know Alabama and what they do schematically. It changes year to year. But for the most part, yeah. the attitude of a Nick Saban coach football team, they want to be physical. They want to run the football. And they got it back to the Chad's with Kevin Riley. point earlier today, he said that, you know, Daniel Hill was a guy that they were looking at a lot. So it kind of looks to me, the way this has gone on, it looks like they faded on Daniel Hill to turn the heat up on Kevin Riley. And they got their guy. There we go. So more madness from National Signing Day. As we knew it would be this way, like nobody's surprised we got madness, but even so, when you have a guy of Kevin Riley's caliber flip from Miami to Alabama, it's going to cause some waves. going to have some things to talk about, obviously, on the national uh, college football landscape with a player of his four-star abilities. Uh, Josh, we talked about Miami so much a second ago. Any, you know, Does this put any sort of dent on what they've done today with the way that they've, you know, put together this kind of top 10 class right now? It's hard to say that this puts a dent on it, especially the running back position. I mean, J.D., you cover the transfer portal. You cover college football. How important is a running back position to a roster? Huge. It's huge. I mean, it you is, but you it. can also find them. Sure. Absolutely true. That's what I meant Absolutely by this. True. I don't yeah. think that... I'm over here this, saying huge. <laughs> right. No, no, no. But what I mean is, I don't think this diminishes what Miami's done today. Yeah, it looks like they're going to drop to number eight currently right now, but still a top 10 class, uh, still fighting for more, still more on the board. And hey, flips happen, especially when Alabama wants your running back that is from Tuscaloosa. 
That's tough. What are you going to do? It felt felt like that, (laughs) especially if you're just kind of, like you said, putting together the equation of, okay, guys in Tuscaloosa, Alabama's right there. They have a strong track record of running back play and putting them where they want to be when it comes to the NFL. Like, you're just holding your breath probably the entire time if you're in Coral Gables hoping and And praying he sticks. I guess what I was trying to convey earlier was if you're going to – if you're going to look at what happened today and you're going to say Miami flipped players at the defensive line and they flip players at linebacker and they, they had big commitments on the O-line. Like if you're going to lose somebody, the one position where you can afford to maybe lose somebody is running back. If you're Miami hmm. trying to build the way that they're building. I mean, Hey, you all always need as many offensive weapons as you can find, but I don't think this is going to break Miami's class by any means. Sort of just a uh, uh, national signing day gives, national signing day takes. Hey, that's it. So Evan here we go Flo. now. The top 10, you had Miami at five <laughs> it's earlier. It's changed up. They Look shuffled at the deck a bit. Miami down to eight. Again, the, the mm-hmm. constant year has been Georgia, Bama, Ohio State within that top three. Oregon back up to five now. Yeah, and it looks like Auburn jumped up a spot to seven. Auburn's having themselves a day very quietly, man. Very, very quietly just kind of climb in a couple spots here a couple spots there all the way up to seven i believe they started right around nine or ten to the to, uh, to start the the day josh but knowing what we know with what's going to go down at 6 p.m eastern armando blunt at miami central high school five-star defensive lineman committed to florida state is expected to flip his commitment tonight to miami so just take a look at this now because it definitely won't look like this if that happens how about notre dame sitting there at 10 notre dame a spot where Brian Kelly kind of, in not so many words, said, hey, there's some things here that are keeping me from getting us to where we want yeah. to be in, in the postseason. Yeah. And right now, Marcus Freeman's saying, okay, that's fine, but we're going to go ahead and have a top 10 class at this point right now. Marcus Freeman doing what he needs to do, whether it be on the recruiting trail, nailing down this top 10 class, or in the transfer portal, Marcus Freeman is recruiting. That was what he was brought there to do. Well, not brought in, but, you know, boosted yeah, up the level to do. Absolutely. And he is doing that. That's exactly what you want to see Marcus Freeman doing, landing top 10 recruiting classes and supplementing the transfer portal. So Florida State now, just ahead of Miami right. being in the number six spot. They currently have the number one class in the state of Florida, that is. Uh, so the Knowles Hanging staying on. in contention. Hanging on. Trying to find their way into that top five. Uh, let's talk about what else we have on the board still. Kevin Riley making that flip again from Miami to Alabama. A name that we have mentioned different times throughout this show. Five-star offensive tackle. Five-star plus offensive tackle. Jordan Seaton committed to Colorado. But again, there's still sort of this mm. thought that it may not totally be over with with him with Jordan Seaton. I mean, it's getting kind of late in the day. Where's the signature? Getting late early. Getting late early, <laughs> it is, as some would say. No, I would still have a little bit of patience. You know, Coach Prime, maybe there's, maybe they're shooting to do this in prime time. Whoa. I don't know. How about that? It's, Let's talk to Chad. Chad Simmons. Yep. What is the latest on Jordan Seaton? Is he? Do, do you think that we'll see a signature from Seaton today? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned like prime time. I was told from the beginning their plan was to have like a big extravagant celebration dinner at like a fancy restaurant type thing for Jordan to sign. So maybe it is a a, a nighttime after dark signing uh, <laughs> for Jordan Seaton uh, with or with somebody else, you know, Colorado or a different program. But uh, I, I would lean towards him not signing today based on what I'm hearing. But look, we don't – it's a lot of unknowns about Jordan Seaton. Again, it goes back to – the, the timeline, does he sign today, tomorrow, or Friday? And does he stay mm-hmm. with Colorado? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still think uh, there's communication out there with other programs, and that decision still being finalized. But you're hearing buzz around the Maryland Terrapins when it comes to Jordan Seaton. Was that something that you expected to hear today? Uh, you know, maybe today, yes, you ask it that way as in today, but maybe if you would ask me here that maybe a couple of days ago, no, but it started coming out maybe yesterday that Maryland was at least engaged to some extent, you know, uh, you haven't heard about them the same as, at least on my end, as Tennessee, yeah. you know, as Florida, you know, as Ohio State, as Oregon, as Alabama, uh, they haven't been mentioned in, in the same regard, you know, as the other schools. Uh, to the people I talked to about Jordan Seaton's recruitment. So um, to see them kind of sneak into this late and become maybe, if not the school, a top two or three school at the very end, uh, says a lot about what Lox- Loxley's doing there in College Park. Yeah. Chad, mm-hmm. as, as this thing goes on further and further, let's just kind of play the hypothetical game, which is always fun to do on National Signing Day with all the hypotheticals on the table. If he doesn't sign today, is there a school that you think that would favor the most 
as the, the Jordan Seton sweepstakes, in theory, would continue? Yeah, I think there's two. I think still it's Maryland and Tennessee. Hmm. You know, I think if he doesn't sign today, it just doesn't look good for Colorado. Whether they have an excuse or a reason behind that, maybe so. Maybe there's a valid reason hmm. that they wanted to sign on a different day, on Thursday or Friday. Um, maybe that was their plan all along, just not, you know, let known to the public, you know. So, uh, but I do think if, the, if he does not sign today, I think you have to look at, at Maryland and Tennessee as the two. I, I want to bring up somebody that we have not talked about on today's show, and that is Edge Solomon Williams out of the Tampa Bay area. One time it looked like Texas A&M was a heavy leader for him. Texas was involved. Alabama was involved. What are we hearing on Solomon Williams right now? You know, a lot of indecisiveness is kind of, that's the word that was given to me about. Wait, he could be another that delays his decision? It's possible. You know, he's one of multiple guys at his high school at Tampa, Carrollwood Day, that are set to announce around 4 o'clock. You have Anthony Carey, uh, who's down to basically Mm -hmm. Texas A&M and Georgia Tech, a four-star running back. And you have four-star Isaiah Williams, a Florida commit, who Texas a and is making a run out late as well to flip from the Gators. And then you have Solomon, the four-star edge, pretty much down to Alabama and Texas A&M. He's coming off that OV to, out to A&M mm-hmm. this past weekend with his teammates. The buzz was around the, the Aggies. It was heavy around the Aggies until about Monday, uh, midday. Things started to become a little bit more cloudy, I would say, in his recruitment from – Alabama to Texas A&M based on checking with a source just less than an hour ago he was still undecided had not told either school yes or no Mm. that he's signing with them or not signing with them so I think there's still some unanswered questions for Solomon Um, I guess one could be does he follow through and sign today or if he doesn't know could he wait till tomorrow Mm. Chad you hear so much about like roster management that's kind of the big word with the transfer portal but when it comes to national signing day my gears start turning when I hear a kid's not signing on signing day and saying, okay, well, the portal's still open. Does that mean that kid is potentially at risk of losing his spot? Like if an offer's here today, will it be there next week or will schools become impatient with these kids and say, hey, offer's good today, sign today, great. If not, you know, we may or may not have a spot for you. Yeah, J.D., I think with the guys we're talking about today, they have to feel pretty good about their spots being re- retained there uh, for the throughout the early signing period. I mean, I think all these guys we're talking about, Jordan Seaton or L.J. McCray or Solomon Williams, guys that may or may not sign today, uh, I think could all um, have their spot, whether it's Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday to sign. Yeah, it's one of those things that obviously I want to tell you today, I, you know, K.J. Bolden, I think he could sign – uh, the very last minute on this on the second signing period. Yeah, we're it'd, talking it'd about just guys fine. with leverage right yep. now. These the the players that are holding out right now are guys with options. The they are players like an L.J. McCray. When if he wanted to sign in February, every team involved with him is going to hold a spot for him. Mm-hmm. So we got to see what happens there. Chat. What is the chances that we see an L.J. McCray defer to sign till either tomorrow or Friday? Does it seem like it's trending that way right now? Yeah, I think it's pretty high. You know, I think, you know, based on what I've, you know, been checking in with sources throughout the day, and I checked with one just less than 30 minutes ago, and it seems like, you know, he was there at Mainland High School this morning to support his other teammates that did sign, right. uh, but chose not to. Um, and he's just, just not ready, just, just not there yet. You know, whether he's 90% Florida, is he split 50-50 with them or Auburn or Florida State? Um, but I was told that at least three different schools uh, have been in communication, and I assume those to be Florida, Florida State, and Auburn. I think Miami's on the outside looking in. Uh, but right now, based on what I was told just here recently, tomorrow, Thursday, is the earliest that McCray will sign. And with Zay Mincy on that same timeline, I know Zay's not going to announce until January 6th at the All-Star game, but – he was planning on making a silent signing today with his teammates. Yeah, I was told earlier this morning that tomorrow is the plan for Zay Mincy to sign. There's not really any hesitation there based on what I was told. The plan is tomorrow. I mean, maybe at this point, maybe they do something together tomorrow themselves. You know, LJ McCray, Zay yeah. Mincy sign together at Mainland or do their own thing somewhere else. But it definitely sounds like Mincy it is all but a lock to sign tomorrow, and we'll still watch LJ McCray. Do you agree with the recruiting prediction machine where it has Florida trending to land Zay Mincy right now? 
I would disagree, you know, based on what I hear now. I, I would say, based on what I'm hearing, Florida, as of maybe an hour or two ago, based on what I was hearing, it was Alabama and Miami battling for that top spot with, with the momentum being with Alabama. Mm. I was about to say Miami has been with Miami for some time, <laughs> uh, based on what I've heard, going back to the Texas A&M game even uh, in September for Zay Mincy when he was down there. But I've heard Bama has come on strong the last few days, uh, and Bama could have the edge heading into him signing those papers tomorrow. For LJ McCray and all, and all the smoke around Auburn now trying to get in the picture, with him not signing today, is that something that if Auburn were able to close the deal, they would have gotten it done today and it, it draws out longer and it helps Florida's chances? Or where do things stand with, with that whole situation and the thought around who could be in the race there with uh, a delayed signing? Yeah, I don't think the fans in general really understand just how much McCray likes Auburn, just the kind of connection he has with Jeremy Garrett. I think when he committed... I don't think enough people took Auburn seriously enough as a contender at that point. So when he committed to Florida, people thought, okay, Florida beat Florida State. Florida beat Auburn as well. And Florida was very much in that. I'm sorry, Auburn was very much in that with Florida State, if not ahead of Florida State when he committed. And that hasn't changed. You know, when I've talked to LJ, I was there at LJ McCray's game the night before, or the weekend that he committed. I was there on Thursday night. He committed on Saturday. I talked to him on Friday morning, some on, some off the record. And he mentioned the relationship he had with Jeremy Garrett was his favorite, the deepest, the one he trusted the most, just the way they vibed together. And that could go a long way. I've always said from day one, McCray is a people's person. It's about relationships for him. It's about who he feels the best around um, and who he trusts the most. And I think that's why Auburn is still a major factor until he signs with somebody else. Chad, one more guy currently committed to Florida, probably the guy committed to Florida, DJ Lagway. Sounds like there's rumblings of other schools still trying to, at the 11th hour, get in the picture. What's the latest there? You know, at one time it seemed like USC, you know, was the major competition for Florida. It's kind of shifted, according to Sam Spiegelman, to Texas A&M. I've, I've talked to Legway, Legway a few times throughout the process, and he's always mentioned A&M. I think that's the school he's visited the most by far uh, out there in College Station. Obviously, there's a coaching change. It's not the same staff he visited with Jimbo Fisher and company when they were there. Uh, but I think Elko, they've come in, they did an in-home visit with him. Uh, they've made their pitch of him being the face of the program, stay home uh, like Georgia did with K.J. Bolden, be a guy that stays home, represent your home state program. It seems like Florida still has the advantage here, but you cannot sleep on Texas A&M. Yeah, Golly. and I think there's a very good chance that DJ, and we're not going to be on the show, he's going to commit here at 4.30 Eastern. Or sign, sign. Rather, sure. He's going to make his signing at 4.30 Eastern. So I'm expecting him to stay put. But you got to wonder if the mass exodus from the Florida class, starting with Xavier Philsame, Amaris Williams, these guys have been kind of bouncing out. I wonder if that will have any impact on DJ Lagway. But throughout this whole thing, he has stood strong in his commitment, and I, I think we see him sign with the Gators today. Yeah, that would be absolutely massive if they were able to get pen to paper there for the good folks in Gainesville. Chad, obviously, we'll be checking back in with you before we finish up here on our National Signing Day show here at On3 with all the, the madness that it still feels like is yet to ensue. We, we've had a couple <laughs> of big breaks here, Josh, with the flips and with Jeremiah Smith sticking yeah, in, we Houston flip sticking. Hour. We had the Buford buzz. We had, you had the, the, the flipsmiths of sorts that we had here on this show. Uh, let's go back to our, our portion where we're talking about some of these teams. Yeah. Texas has made some noise throughout the course of the day. <laughs> Keeping Ryan Wingo, finding their way back up into that top five. Uh, what sticks out to you about this class right now for Texas and the way they've just ascended today on National Signing Day? Well, they've done a great job in the trenches, but I think let's hit on Ryan Wingo real quick. You signed an Arch Manning last year. Yep. You say, where's our elite wide receiver at? Like, where is he? Is it going to be Micah Hudson? He's the number one wide receiver in the state. Mm -hmm. Nope. Micah Hudson went to Texas Tech. And, you know, in the end, they end up getting Ryan Wingo, which was huge. And in the beginning, I didn't think that they had a real shot. It looked like he was trending to Missouri or Oregon or Georgia mm -hmm. or various other places. In Texas was kind of on the outside looking in, to, to put it nicely. 
But in the end, you know, they stay on him. They end up getting him on campus a couple times. That was where the momentum really shifted, and they land Ryan Wingo, and today they sign Ryan Wingo. But where they did their most damage was definitely in the trenches. I think Texas's class right now sitting at, what are we sitting at, inside the top five? They've made that march from the, from the low 20s all the way up to number four right now. Steve Sarkeesian putting together back-to-back -back classes. Actually, I think this is their third top five class in a row. Maybe having some strength to go inside the top three, but we'll see, have to see how that shakes out here in a little bit. But here, you look at what they're doing in the trenches, and it starts and stops with our boy Colin Simmons. We had a great time with him at the On3 NIL event here in Nashville, and then they land Brandon Baker. See, it's even, right? They're not just loading up on the D-line. They're not just loading up on the O-line. They go to California and land Brandon Baker. They get Daniel Cruz, more of an interior guy. Brandon Baker, more of a true tackle. They go to Florida. They get DeAndre Robinson. They get an edge in Zena Umizulu. Really a well-rounded class in the trenches, and I think this is what they needed. But they do, they do dot it with some great skill players, especially when you look at Jared Gibson, another yeah. running back out of Florida. Last year it was Cedric Baxter. This year they go in the state and they land Jared Gibson. So I'm, I love Texas's class this cycle. How about that pronunciation by you? I just was just winging oh, it. Zulu. Yeah, I, like I figured that. you I had like to go lot. for it. There's no there's no pausing. You just got to go for it. All right. gas, no brakes, as some it. would say in Austin. Uh, when it comes <laughs> to this class, though, Josh, you hit it right on the head, man. A third of this class is either a lineman or an edge on the offensive or defensive side of the football. Uh, they're going to have those big boys, and it's important because they're going to the SEC. But even with all the talk around the Southeastern Conference, the way that it feels to me is like this is who Texas wanted to be even before they got to the SEC. Like yeah. this past year, they had a top five run-stopping defense, multiple guys on the D-line, and Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy that were all American caliber players. Like this is who Texas is regardless of the conference they're in. It just so happens they're heading to the SEC where it's required and, to play big boy football. And like I said, they, Texas and Oklahoma were being negatively recruited on the recruitment recruiting trail by team saying, yeah, they're not going to Texas for a couple years. You're going to play in the Big 12 for half your career at Texas. And then it gets sped up. And now Texas and Oklahoma are going in the prospects that signed in this class will only play college football at Texas in the SEC. That's, that's a big difference. Josh, I got to ask you this, man, because there's so, like you said, so much negative recruiting about when they would get to the SEC and also about how they would fare when they got to the SEC, saying, well, they're not built like us here in the South. They're not built like the Georgias or the Bamas. And then they go to Tuscaloosa yeah. and by double digits beat Nick Saban and company. That was big to get over the hump, I think. That was like Huge. their introduction. That was their welcome to the SEC moment right there, and I think it paid off on the recruiting trail. I mean, you see, you know, you go and you flip Xavier Filsame from the Florida Gators. That's a future SEC opponent. I think, actually, they're playing on the field next season. Yep, absolutely. So Xavier Filsame could have been lined up. He's a player from the state of Texas. He's the number two safety in America, and he was going to leave the state to go play for Florida. You end up flipping him, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they are an SEC program now. Feels like there's no more excuse right now if you're a kid in the state of Texas to why you wouldn't at least consider, because there used to be the SEC stigma, no more of that. It used right. to be, can they hang with Alabama and Georgia? No more of that by nature of what they did on the field. Now they're in the college football playoff. Like, is this a sign of the times right now with a class like this? Just the way that it's built, like you said, in the trenches, proof of concept from the year before. Is this a sign of the times for where Texas is at and where they're moving headed forward? You hope so if you're a Texas fan. I mean, it, recruiting has never really been the, the weakness of the Texas program. Mm -hmm. They've always recruited well. But, yeah, you want to see this happening now. They're going out. They're winning some big battles. They're just not taking in-state guys to take in-state guys. They are, they are truly battling for the best of the best and getting aggressive while doing it. Chad, I want to get your thoughts on this because last cycle, Texas was phenomenal. I believe they had a top three class in the country when the dust settled on signing day. Today, they're right inside the top five. Are we still seeing the Arch Manning effect in this class even though he committed last cycle? Maybe, may, maybe a little bit, but I, I think it's more of the Sark effect, man, just mm. what they're doing, you know, as a program. You know, I think obviously Arch, I think in some way maybe had an impact on a guy like Ryan Wingo, but I mm -hmm. haven't heard Arch's name, you know, mentioned a ton, you know, by guys, but they, they know he's there um, and he plans to be there. Um, and he's a good quarterback, but in, for me, looking from the you know outside in and talking to recruits, you know, I think it's all about Sark and kind of what he's doing and that staff and you know Austin, the NIL game they use and uh, just what Texas is doing from the top down. Yeah, they're definitely headed one direction. Like I said, all gas, no brakes is how they're feeling in Austin <laughs> right now, and uh, it's not just a fun catchphrase anymore on a T-shirt. That is the real deal, both on the field 
and on the recruiting trail. Good times rolling on the 40 acres right now. So let's go from one shade of orange, burnt orange, to a different shade of orange. Out there in Knoxville, talking about the Vols a little bit right now, Josh. Tennessee crept up a little bit, started the day at 13. Right now they're sitting at 12 in the 2024 class rankings. Yeah. Overall thoughts on where Josh Heupel and company <clears throat> stand right now? Well, a really solid class, right? It needs a couple pieces. It needs a Jordan Seton or it needs a, to boost them into the top 10. But even without that, you got to love what they land at wide receiver and Mike Matthews. Mm. He's probably the crown jewel of this class. You got Jordan Ross, another outstanding edge prospect from the state of Alabama. Uh, Braylon Staley, you know, they had to play a little defense down the stretch for him as well as Boo Carter. Boo Carter had a great relationship throughout this cycle with Jordan Seton. And when Jordan Seaton committed to Colorado, I mean, him and Boo Carter were in communication that day on social media saying, hey, let's link up, let's play together, let's do this, we're going to be teammates. It looked like a lot of people thought that Jordan Seaton was going to be a volunteer. It didn't necessarily work out that way. When he commits to Colorado, hey, is Boo Carter, who's from Chattanooga, Tennessee, going to flip to Colorado? Tennessee had to fend that one off. They get an elite athlete coming to, come to Knoxville. Uh, Jake Merklinger, we had a yeah. chance to sit down with him at the NIL event here in Nashville, Tennessee, and he was a really great prospect to talk to, really fun, wants to come in and compete. You know, they got Nico there. So it's not like any quarterback that signs with Tennessee is just given the keys to the offense. Yep. you got to earn it. And Jake feels, I, I think Jake's going to go in there. He's out of Savannah, Georgia, and he's going to go fight for that job. He doesn't care about whose name or how many stars he got. Well, let's get crazy and say that the Jordan Seaton sweepstakes does end up going a little bit further along. And oh let's, just, let's just say that Jordan Seaton ends up being a volunteer. Oh, boy. Is this a top 10 class? This is a top 10 class, uh, whether in the rankings or just on paper or in my mind. In my mind, it's a top 10 class. You pair him with Bennett Warren, who they landed over Michigan. He's six seven and a half, three hundred and thirty 330 pounds. Jordan Seaton, 6'5", 290. I mean, you're really adding some quality offensive tackle prospects to that list. And uh, Bennett Warren, he's a top 150 player. Jordan Seaton, we know he's a top 20 player. So a lot of talent on that commit list already, but could take it to the next level if you can add a Jordan Seaton. I think we can't overlook just how Josh Heupel has built this thing since he got there. It hasn't been this super slow revamp. Eventually, right. we'll find our way. Like Tennessee competed with Henry Hooker playing quarterback last year. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a, a small step back without Henry Hooker and Jalen Hyatt on the field. But now you got the number one player in America from the 2023 cycle set to take over the offense for you this upcoming season. Oh, by the way, you had Mike Matthews, who's a five-star right. wide receiver. Like, they got, they got some pieces here. That's some real yeah. juice, does Tennessee. And Mike Matthews, great competitor. He's out of Lilburn, Georgia. He goes six foot, 180 pounds. He's the number six ranked wide receiver in the country, 22 overall. He was a massive win for Tennessee. And Mike Matthews, he committed actually with us here at On3. Great dude. That was a lot of fun, him and his mom. We really enjoyed doing that with them. But Mike Matthews, again, never wavered, right? He's completely bought into this Tennessee program. He'll enroll there. I think he was at bowl practices over the weekend. So Mike Matthews is going to be ready to go in 2024 for the Volunteers. And a guy who you have to just be licking your lips, seeing what they do in that offense, throwing the ball around the yard, spreading you all the way out to the tick marks, get your one-on-one -on -one coverage. Mike Matthews, you go win one-on-one, -on -one, and we are in some real good shape. Also a guy that at one point in time was being recruited to play on the other side of the ball from other schools. So like just athleticism, through his ears is Mike yeah. Matthews. Yeah, and actually I had a chance to talk to Mike Matthews this week leading up to signing day just to kind of see what he was thinking, wanted to pick his brain and see where is Mike Matthews when it comes to this recruiting process. It was a really fun interview. Let's see if we can get that going. As the 2024 recruiting cycle comes to an end and we hit National Signing Day, we wanted to go back and talk to a couple of the prospects that we covered throughout this cycle five-star wide receiver Mike Matthews. Now, Mike, in a year where we're seeing all these decommitments and flips, how come you never wavered from your commitment to Tennessee? Um, you know, I was really the type to really take my time throughout my process and make it like a thorough pick. So I wasn't planning on like just picking somebody and then going somewhere else. I wanted to make my decision final. So that's what I did. Yeah. Now, you committed to Tennessee on July 19th. And like you said, it was a very well thought out recruitment. You went on a lot of visits. But when did you know, like, when did you know in your head it was going to be Tennessee? Um, I probably realized it probably like my, my OV at Tennessee. That really set it off. And then just, just the environment, just, to, just the entire 
just tied the thing together. It was just, it was just, it was just really crazy to me, and I really enjoyed it. Well, your OV to Tennessee was in June. So how hard was it to keep that secret from from really June until the end of July? Uh, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't really that hard. You know, everybody got their own opinions. They say he's going here, he's going there. But I mean, I just I just shrug my shoulders. But I don't know yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tennessee's got a really talented commitment class. And uh, who are some of the guys that you've grown close with throughout the process? Uh, I've been, I grew close with Boo Carter, Idris Farouk, uh, my boy Marco. And it's, it's like Jake Merkinler. It's just a lot of people. Everybody's cool with everybody at this point. What is it about the, this class? What is it that you guys kind of connect with? I think we all, we all give them like a big chance. You know, we all got something to prove not only for us, but also for like our family in Tennessee. I feel like we all understand that and we all willing to do what it takes. All right. So do you know who's going to be your roommate when you get there to Knoxville? Uh, Not yet, but I mean, either way, I'm sure I'll be fine. Like I said, like everybody in our class is cool with each other. So mm-hmm. it'll be fine. All right. So what are you looking forward to most about on this journey when you begin at Tennessee? Uh, I would probably say just, just to see my development and how how fast I adjust to, you know, the different schemes. You know, high school football and college football is two different things. So it's going to be a big change. So probably, probably that. All right. Yeah, it is going to be a big change. So what will you miss most about living back at home? Uh, definitely my family, for sure. My family and friends. Because, you know, I'm big on family, friends, and loyalty. And I got some great people around me. Yeah. What is it that your mom cooks that you're going to miss the most? Definitely, I'll probably say definitely her salmon. Her salmon is definitely, her salmon go crazy. I ain't gonna lie. All right, well, maybe she'll have to pack you some and put it in the freezer. You can warm it up yeah. on, uh, on days when you're missing home. You know? I need a little Tupperware, man. <laughs> uh, do you have your major picked out yet? Uh, no, I haven't picked yet, but it's going to be, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't picked yet. I haven't chosen. All right, take your time. All right, last question. What's something about the recruiting process that you wish you knew heading into this that you know now? Um, I would probably say, hmm, probably like how you can uh go on business and stuff like that. Because you know, back then I wasn't really like I wasn't really like big. I was just like new to everything because I never really like. I don't know. I never really took football to that level because I was like also mm-hmm. playing basketball. So like, I didn't really know about how like you could, you know, talk to coaches all the time. You could go on visits. You could go to any game like you, if you can go to it. So I didn't know none of that. But once I figured that out, yeah. All right, Mike. Well, one last thing. What's your message for Tennessee fans as you head to Knoxville? You got a message for them? Uh, shoot. Go Vols. I know it been it been kind of rough. I mean, you know, we building, and then we had a couple. Our past two years been pretty good, but we mm-hmm. still building up. Third year, fourth year, from go even more crazy. All right, well, you know, Tennessee Vol fans, they are excited to get you on campus, and it's only a matter of days. Five star wide receiver Mike Matthews, thank you for joining us today on the Inside Scoop, and also, congrats on your decision and your next step. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Vol fans, get fired up, man. That's a big-time wide receiver headed your way to Knoxville. A great conversation between Mike Matthews and Josh Newberg. Josh, I'm sure the Vol fans would love to be in the college football playoff this time they next would. year. We gave you our Rose Bowl picks. What do you say we get into some Sugar Bowl picks as Price Picks is bringing us National Signing Day? Let's Sound go. Good? Sound good let's to do you? it. Let's get let's, after it, baby. Let's go. So we talked about some rush totals in the Rose Bowl. Let's go out to New Orleans, talk about the Sugar Bowl. I like some receiving totals here, Josh. Roma Dunze, his number is 99 and a half receiving yards. That's a lot of yards. Yeah. But in a game like this, man, I think you dance with the one that brung you, Washington. They are a deep ball kind of football team. Like Michael Penix Jr., he's going to get back there. They're going to sling it around the yard. I like the more there. Am I crazy yeah. for liking the more there, Josh? No, I'm, a, I'm from Tampa, so Michael Penix is my guy, and he is going to be slinging the pill. Go more. Go more. We take the more there. We, take we love the more. it. We'll take the more with Roma Dunes on 99 and a half receiving yards. Staying in that vein of receiving yards. We've got the, the wide receiver position kind of taken mm-hmm. care of. Let's show the RB some love, man. A guy who we're <laughs> talking about this time last season, CJ Baxter, true freshman running five back star. in Texas. Five-star guy. Absolute baller. 
His number for receiving yards, Josh, 13 and a half. You can, you can sleepwalk your way to 13 and a half receiving yards. We'll take the more there. Maybe a little screen pass Just to get you, screen. get you one over One screen is going to get us more. One we'll screen, that's all that. it's going to take. We will take the more on both of those. And I like it because Cedric Baxter, true freshman, he has something to prove. You know, during bowl season, hey, not everybody has something to prove, but Cedric Baxter, I think he's going to go out. I like right. the more. Playing with a little bit of edge there. So I like the more on Roma Dunze, nine and a half receiving yards. Like the more on CJ Baxter, 13 and a half receiving yards. So we're going to take those two. We're going to flex play them with another free square from prize picks. Kevin Durant, half a point. What? Obviously, we're taking the more there. If he scores one point on That's Christmas it. Day, that square hits again is the equivalent of a free square. So if two out of those three squares hit, we get some money back, a little return on investment. Yeah. It's a good way to live. So use code NSD, 100% deposit match. Up to 100 bucks whenever you sign up with Price Picks. Again, that's code NSD for National Signing Day. Use that code, get your deposit matched, have a good time, and let's uh, let's get after it with these plays here. Josh, what do you say? Let's do it. Love it. Again, appreciate Price Picks bringing y'all National Signing Day today for us here at On Three. So there's a lot to unpack here with this day so far, Josh. A couple of schools we haven't talked about yet. How about Oregon? Woo. They were yeah. the story of last National Signing Day, and they're still making noise today, they are, finding they, themselves they in the top ten. They started the day. They had the big flip of Jeremiah That's McClellan right. out of the state of Missouri. And one of the, one of the themes of Oregon's recruiting is their national reach. I mean, you look at their top commitments, and they are – well, you know, they don't have a great home-based territory. You expect them to go land and aid in Breland in California. But – Oregon, if they're having success, they're going to Arizona. They're landing in Elijah Rushing. They're going into the state of Missouri to land in a, uh, Jeremiah McClellan. They're, they are all over the country landing top prospects. And that's just one of the characteristics of what Dan Lanning brings to this team. I mean, Dan Lanning, he comes from the SEC as SEC roots. The only way he knows how to recruit is like an SEC program. And that's why you see Dan Lanning involved in a lot of these conversations down the stretch for a lot of these top prospects from any part of the country. I mean, there was a moment where we thought that Jordan Seaton had a great shot at landing out in Eugene. He went out there for a visit. He told me it was his dream school. Dan Lanning and making it happen out there in Oregon, currently sitting with the number five class in America, 24 commitments in this class the average distance away is about double the average distance for their commitments than we read with ohio state 959.9 miles away is the distance for the average commitment to oregon i mean josh what does that say about a staff like this because we talked about kj bolden and there's a pretty good feel for them maybe not landing him if he wasn't in the backyard and having that kind of access. We're getting a lot of these guys on the screen right here. Aaron yeah. Flowers from Texas. I mean, you see Arizona, Missouri, Washington, D.C. Like, there's so many different parts of the country represented. What does that say about the staff and the brand of Oregon to be able to go nationwide like this? It says that Oregon's reach through the years that they've done through branding has worked. Because some of these guys were, I mean, for Jordan Seaton, right? to grow up an Oregon fan. He's originally from Washington, D.C., playing his high school ball in Florida, but he tells me that his dream school was Oregon. And a lot of these recruits that we talked to kind of came up the same way. There's just a lot of love for the Ducks. It's unreal the way that they're able to just be absolute dogs in the recruiting trail. Like you said, Dan Lanning, he knows one speed, probably in life, but definitely in recruiting, and that is full throttle when it comes to getting after on love the recruiting it. trail. And two signing days in a row now, Josh, where they have kind of started the buzz, started the commotion with flipping Jeremiah McClellan this morning yeah. and flipping Austin Novosad last year from Baylor at quarterback. And you don't flip a Jeremiah McClellan without really recruiting through the whistle because Jeremiah McClellan, he's a five-star, he's a four-star wide receiver. What was it borderline? He's a borderline five-star wide receiver that's committed to Ohio State. What else do you need? You know, so to get him off of that commitment, you have to work really hard, and that's what we're seeing Dan Lanning and that coaching staff do at Oregon. And the way they're doing it, too, with the way they built this clash and uh, the guys they have in the trenches, guys liking Elijah Rushing, uh, the, the kind Aiden of players. Breland. The kind Aiden of, Breland mm -hmm. is a big athletic body that you normally see in the SEC. Aiden Breland goes 6'4 and a half, 300 pounds. He's the number seven ranked defensive lineman in America and a top 50 player coming in at number 46 overall. He should be playing ball at Georgia. Yeah. or Alabama, but instead, Dan Lanning is in Eugene, and he'll be at Oregon. In a class like this, like I was saying with Aiden Breeland and Elijah Rushing, guys like that on your team at this point, when you go to the Big Ten, you have to play the Michigans. We have to play the Ohio States, who signed a guy like Edric Houston. Like They're going to be, in my opinion, well, sort of ready-made yeah. for that Big Ten no, kind of football. You're 100% right. Look, he plays at Modern Day High School. Yep. His teammate, Brandon Baker, 
number two offensive tackle in America, signs with Texas. Yep. His running back, Frazier, signs with Georgia. Yep. So you're seeing guys of his caliber go to the SEC and away from the West Coast. Aiden Breeland was a huge pickup for the Ducks, one of the biggest difference makers in this class, along with a guy like an Elijah Rushing or a Jeremiah McClellan. Yeah, they got the juice today. There's no way around it. Oregon continue to push this class forward. Uh, when it comes to how they've been able to flip these guys, I mean, or Oregon being able to, uh, like we said, starting the show with Jeremiah McClellan, being able to flip yeah. him, how difficult is it to flip someone? It's one thing to do it when they're just right next door when you can kind of yeah. you know, go visit them whenever. You know, to flip you, them from a distance. You asked me about how is – how is Miami able to get some of these big flips? Well, it's the same formula. It starts and stops with the head man. Mario Cristobal was a very aggressive recruiter in his time at Oregon, and Dan Lanning has sort of either taken the torch and ran with it or even taken it to another level with the way he's recruiting at Oregon. So I think that culture of aggressive recruiting and flips it by any means has always kind of been there with Oregon, but Dan Lanning is really taking that baton and running with it. You got to think, too, with the move to the Big Ten, they're going to be playing some games now yep. in a lot of the backyards of these kids they're going to visit. It's no longer a, hey, come to Eugene, and yeah. your family can come see you play. Maybe every couple of seasons, maybe we'll have a one-off game that's near your neck of the woods. It's like, hey, if you're a kid in the state of Ohio, we're going to play at Ohio State at some point. We're going to hey, play let's against just apply a Michigan. Let's to this class. Maybe yeah. with Jeremiah McClellan. He's out of, the, out of Missouri, St. Louis area. Hey, now that's a footprint of the Big Ten. Yep. And you're going to be able to tell Jeremiah McClellan's family a couple times a year, you're going to be able to hop in your car and go to one of Jeremiah's games, not just fly out to Eugene. Yeah, I don't think they're anywhere near done. Chad, would love to get your thoughts on this before we move on here. Uh, for Oregon, just the brand that they have right now, kind of the same song, second verse we've asked you all day long. Like, what is the buzz around Oregon for a lot of these kids that maybe aren't necessarily super close geographically to the Ducks? I think they've always had the brand, I mean, like, at least for a while now, with the Nike brand, yeah. um, you know, obviously the Duck. They're famous up there, obviously, for that Nike logo, for that brand. They've had that. Kids, the, the uniforms, the flash, the kids are drawn to stuff like that. But I think Lanning's kind of like that missing piece from the coaching standpoint, the other side of things where him and his staff, you know, Lanning, Tosh Lapoy, Junior Adams, I mean, the staff is put together, Coach Lachlan at running backs. I mean, it's just a strong staff that understands how to recruit. Lanning brought that mentality from, like what you guys said, the SEC. He's been at Alabama. He's been at Georgia. Uh, he's been down in the SEC country. He knows where it starts. You mentioned like Aiden Breland, where it starts in the trenches. If they want to compete for a national title and go up against guys like Bama or Georgia in the playoffs, they got to have guys up front on the offensive line, defensive line. You can't have this all flash and skill and speed mm -hmm. on the perimeter. I think just that the toughness and the mentality that Lanning brings was kind of like that missing ingredient uh, to kind of combine with that flash you know that Oregon already had uh, that guys grew up watching with those 10 different uniforms on 10 different Saturdays not a bad <laughs> way to watch it's it's a way to build a brand and when you're talking about impressionable young men it's a viable way to do it I mean Nike brand holds a, 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 a lot of weight and Oregon has built their brand on top of it of course winning football helps winning football helps build that brand and shines it up but They've been doing this for years now, and a lot of these recruits have, have been born into the era of these crazy Nike Oregon uniforms, not just coming up through it like you and I. Yeah, the schools like an Oregon, and honestly, schools like a Colorado, where brand power probably means a little bit more than it did maybe a couple of years ago. We're starting to see them really make some hay on the recruiting trail. Now, Coach Prime, we've talked about him a couple times throughout this show. We're still waiting on that signature Coach Prime, Deion Sanders kind of signing moment that we've gotten the last couple of years with Travis Hunter last year via the portal, the, the year before landing him to Jackson State. Uh, last year ultimately ended up landing Cormani McLean, though it wasn't on signing day. Uh, let's take a look at Colorado right now. Currently the number 36 ranked yep. class. But it's just, hey, we know how they work, man. It's just, uh, it could just be one guy here, one guy there. And if there's any ambiguity, Colorado seems to be one of those teams that always ends up being in the hunt. You know, and it's also a small class. Sure. That's a big reason why they're sitting at number 36 overall is because they only have nine commitments. They've already taken 17 transfers, so almost double the rate. So you kind of see a strategy here. Mm -hmm. You can tell that Coach Sanders, Coach Prime is looking for immediate help, but he knows 
you got to get some good high school players coming behind him, and I think they do. I love what they landed in Draylon Miller. He's a top 100 prospect out of the state of Texas. He was committed to Texas A&M. Uh, decommitted about six weeks ago, took some visits. It looked like his first stop to Colorado was maybe just a, a courtesy visit, but they get him back again, and Draylon Miller commits to Colorado. I think that's a huge get. He's electric at 5'11", 200 pounds, one of the most electric players in the country, along with Cam Michael. Now, I want to talk to Chad a little about Cam Michael because he's at Statesboro, Georgia. He goes six foot 180, and guess what? He's a two-way player. Uh, what do you see, Chad, for Cam Michael's future at Colorado? How do you see him fitting in there? Yeah, you mentioned two-way player. They mentioned that to him, obviously, with Travis Hunter. Travis being from Georgia also, two-way guy, probably the best two-way guy in the country. Uh, and they definitely played that to Cam Michael. I think, you know, Cam was first set on playing defensive back early in his high school career, then moved to offense as a senior. And kind of became where he wanted to play offense first, defense second. So I think that's the plan going into Colorado. He'll start out at wide receiver, uh, maybe play some DB <clears throat> in situations or how he grows and matures physically, if he can handle that responsibility uh, both ways in major college football. But I think, you know, at one time, Tennessee was trending strong. Georgia came on late. Uh, but Colorado beat both SEC pr programs, one in-state and one pretty close to home in Tennessee. For Cam Michael, great athlete with speed, explosion, uh, can play either side. I think he's more of a natural, though, on the offensive side. is the ball catcher, uh, big play ability. can be a guy on special teams, kick returns as well. So I think he'll go out to Colorado, have a chance to make a play you know, pretty early in Boulder. Yeah, and I think Colorado did a good job. I wouldn't say great job at the high school level, but they did a good job filling in the trenches. You got Omar White out of Valdosta, Georgia, 6'2", 305. Amontre Bradford, who's cousins with Cam Michael over there at Statesboro, mm. Georgia. He's an edge rusher. He goes 6'5", 230, coming off that edge. And then the big one. You got Jordan Seaton, the big trench monster out of IMG Academy, 6'5", 295 pounds, the number one offensive tackle in the on three industry rankings and the number nine player in the country. But the big question here is, Chad, will Jordan Seaton sign today? What do you tell Colorado fans? Can I call a friend and yeah. ask him first, you know? Um, call, actually, call Jordan. Yeah, Why don't you ask yeah, yeah, there we go. I might not get an answer if I call him. We'll see. Um, but no, I mean, look, there's, the day is still relatively young. Yeah. I, I guess we still have the second half of the day. Uh, we'll see what happens. You know, I've heard of no plan either way to sign or, or not to sign today. It seems like I started hearing yesterday he could sign later this week. So mm -hmm. I kind of lean towards that. It's kind of playing out that way the first part of today. Um, so right now we're kind of in wait and see mode if he signs today, and if so, with Colorado or another program. Mm, it's kind of crazy to me that we're here. You know, I thought when Jordan Seaton committed to Colorado, like it wasn't what I expected, but when he committed, I understood it, right? Hmm. Jordan Seaton loves the marketing. He loves to, uh, he, he just, he loves everything surrounding the hype. And when he committed to Colorado and he did the press run and you see him on TV, you're like, oh, this makes a whole lot of sense. I see why Jordan Seaton wants to go to Colorado. I see the fit. And now here we are. Who do you think is the biggest competition? If he doesn't sign with Colorado, who is who are the teams that we can point to and say, hey, they got a real shot? Yeah, the ones that just keep coming up are the ones like Maryland and Tennessee. I think Tennessee, obviously, we thought was in a much better spot when he committed to Colorado mm -hmm. than Maryland, but Maryland's been the hot name attached to Jordan Seaton the last 24 Wild. to 36 hours. You know, Obviously, he's a DMV kid. Uh, he's got family up there. Um, so we know that, that, that maybe location in the end plays a role if he goes to Maryland. We'll see. But I agree with you, Josh. I mean, I think I do like the fit with him at Colorado with Prime and that big stage and celebrities there. And, and Jordan likes that kind of atmosphere. So it would be very interesting going away from that to a place like College Park, Maryland. Yeah, it would. So we got to see. I, I'm, I'm intrigued here. I, I think if this thing goes beyond today, whew, I think we're back. I think the recruitment for Jordan Seaton's alive and well if he doesn't sign with Colorado today. It's going to get interesting very, very quickly if we 
are sitting here tomorrow and still without pen to paper for hey, a one Jordan Seaton. Let's stay live until Jordan Seaton. Yeah, that would be something. Yeah, everybody subscribe to make sure that you don't miss this full however. If long it goes to stream. Friday, somebody <laughs> send pizza. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that would be that would be tremendous. Uh, regardless, send pizza. Uh, when it comes to Colorado, though, Chad, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. The brand around Deion Sanders and Coach Prime was so strong during that three game stretch to start the season. And then it felt like the way that the, the season sort of ended and the way that they kind of fell off, for lack of a better phrase, uh, is, this, is the branding of Coach Prime still as strong as it was early on in the season? I mean, did that impression last with recruits or is it kind of more anxiety around committing to a place like Colorado? No, I think that the brand's still strong. You know, Dion's still Dion. Obviously, they right. got off to a better start, and they were everybody's on the hype train of Dion. You know, after that first three or four games in the season, and uh, obviously that faded some throughout the season with tough losses here and there down the stretch. But uh, I think you see with what he's doing in the portal and with the high school kids that the prime coach prime is still there. He's still the guy that kids want to play for, want to be around, and want to help build their brand with. And I think that's part of it. So I don't think Dion's brand has faded at all. Maybe the team struggled down the stretch, but Dion's still Dion. Dion's still Dion. Yeah, that is 100% the case, and he is built for modern college football. Uh, Chad, we're kind of wrapping up here on, I guess, the first part of our national signing day um, for, for this early signing period. What else is there when it comes to the, the scoop that we should be keeping an eye out for? Obviously, they can, they can follow you on Twitter. That's first. And make sure you get a membership for all things on 3 on on3.com. Um, but w what are some things that maybe you're uh, – keeping a pulse of as we move on throughout the rest of the day and even beyond today for guys that haven't signed. Yeah, I mean, obviously we've talked about seat and so we can leave that there, but I think obviously DJ Lagway is when we're hearing things that seem to lead us towards that he'll stay with Florida. Uh, that'd be somewhat of a surprise if he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Obviously schools can reach out and try, but all signs point towards Florida being the school for DJ Lagway in the end. Uh, I think you look for Armando um, Blunt tonight. Uh, around 6 o'clock, does he stay with Florida State or like what we think happens, flip to Miami? You have guys like L.J. McCray. Um, does he sign tomorrow? Does he sign Florida uh, Friday? And does he stay with Florida or go elsewhere to Auburn or Florida State or Miami? Well, what about Zay Mincy? Uh, we won't know that until January, but could it leak out who he signs with right. uh, tomorrow in the coming <laughs> days? I think there's plenty of storylines still out there. Solomon Williams, the, the Tampa crew, Isaiah Williams, he stayed with Florida, flipped to A&M, Anthony Carey, Georgia Tech, Texas A&M. Uh, there's still some big names out there that will sign at some point today that have decisions coming up. We talked about him, Ryan Williams, a guy who's reclassified and was getting his name chanted at an Auburn basketball game. I mean, Hugh Freeze and company made a, a habit of flipping some guys so far this cycle. I mean, that could kind of be the, the cherry on top as well if they're able to get that done, Josh. Hey, that, it, like we said, heading into this, one of the big storylines in the, in the five days leading up to signing day was Hugh Freeze causing chaos. And even when he doesn't land a guy like a K.J. Bolden, just the presence of Auburn in some of these recruitments because they've pulled off some mighty flips. And even today with the Maris Williams, you know, they are still busy and you can't count Auburn out. I mean, hey, if L.J. McCray puts this thing to Friday, it is the dead period. There is no face-to-face -face contact. But let me tell you something about the dead period. It's the furthest thing from dead. You're still allowed electronic communication. You're allowed to talk to people on the phone. Recruits can talk to coaches on the phone. It's still everything that you need to do to recruit is still there except for the face-to-face -face contact during the dead period. A lot of action still going on. So we're kind of putting a bow here on this uh, National Signing Day show for us. Josh, a lot of chaos going on throughout the day. You see the top yeah. 10 there. Timestamp, okay. very important. Georgia slamming the door, putting their foot down. They are the number one class talk about in our the big country. Winners for the day Let's go big up. winners. Who made a splash here, brother? Oh, I mean, there's so many teams that made a splash. If I had to pick one, well, let me not pick one. I think the big <laughs> winners today were Texas, Oregon, Miami, and I got to give Ohio State. I mean, I know they didn't land anybody today, but signing Jeremiah Smith and signing Edrick Houston is almost as good as landing a five-star on National Signing Day. So I think, you know, a lot of the teams obviously in the top 10 were big winners overall. But when we talk about big winners today, I'm going Texas, Oregon, Miami. I mean, I'm 100% with you. All those schools, and like you said, with Ohio State, how much did we hear coming into today? 
hey, Edric Houston, there's buzz around Alabama. Hey, Jeremiah Smith, the Florida schools are pushing strong. And so for Ohio State to flex the muscles, say, no, 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 you're not taking what's ours. You're not taking our commits. I don't care where, you know, what conference you're from or, or you know, what kind of uh, pitch you're making here. We're keeping our guys our guys. I know Jeremiah McClellan to start the show wasn't ideal for the folks in Columbus, but for that to be the, you know, the biggest flip for them when Edric Houston and Jeremiah Smith were still waiting to get signatures from them at that point in time to start the day and to get those signatures, yeah. absolutely massive for the Buckeyes. Absolutely and, massive. You know, hey, like Chad said, there's still some heavyweights out there that could impact even our big winners. Hey, look, if Auburn is able to flip LJ McCray and put themselves inside the top five, probably at like number four, what an incredible run. I mean, even if it stops right now, Auburn's had an incredible run this cycle. But to think that they could add somebody like an LJ McCray still, I mean, you've got to be ecstatic if you're an Auburn fan. So I don't know how I didn't put Auburn in my winners for today, but... Can't, everybody's not a winner. Not everybody's a winner, but there's still a lot of these teams making moves. And like you said, Auburn, one of those teams we expect to keep pushing hard. And as you said, recruit through the whistle. Hey, we appreciate y'all locking in with us here on the On3 Recruits channel. This has been our On3 National Signing Day show. Again, make sure you subscribe to this channel to stay up with all things recruiting all year long. Again, follow Chad Simmons. Going to keep you in the know for all things Intel on recruiting as well all year long. So follow him there. We appreciate him. Josh, this has been a blast, man. College football Christmas. Chad, appreciate you holding it down in there for all things Intel. Uh, for all of us here at On3, we're going to keep this party rolling, and we will see y'all next time.